Counsel will call the next witness. Mr. Robert C. Mardian, will you please come to the witness table? Mr. Mardian, will you stand and raise your right hand? Do you swear that the evidence that you shall give to the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Will you please state your name and your residence for the record? My name is Robert C. Mardian. My address is 2323 North Central Avenue, Phoenix, Arizona. Now, I observe that you are accompanied by counsel. Will counsel please identify himself for the purposes of the record? My name is David Bress. I'm a lawyer in Washington, D.C. Mr. Chairman, Mr. James Hamilton, Assistant Chief Counsel, will ask the questions of this witness. Mr. Bress, I understand that you have a brief statement that you want to make before you begin. Yes, Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mardian has conferred on two occasions with the United States Attorney's Office in May 1973 before his appearance before the grand jury on May 7th. In those conferences and grand jury appearance, Mr. Mardian at no time asserted any constitutional privilege he might have, and he asserts none today. He did, however, on my advice, assert the attorney-client privilege insofar as questions related to conversations he had with Mr. Liddy on June 21, 1972. But as to all other attorney-client communications with other persons, no privilege was asserted because we were satisfied that such other persons had waived the privilege. Accordingly, by prearrangement with the United States Attorney's Office, when questions were propounded before the grand jury relating to his communications with Mr. Liddy, all counsel proceeded to Judge Sirica's court on the same day and argued the matter. After taking it under advisement, the court ordered the questions to be answered, and this was done. Later, Mr. Mardian spent two days conferring with the staff of this committee on June 1 and July 14, 1973. All questions were fully answered, and he now stands ready to answer any further questions after he makes a short introductory statement, a copy of which has been furnished to the staff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could I ask a question to make sure I fully understand the burden of counsel's statement? Is it insisted that there is an existing extant attorney-client privilege between the witness and Mr. Liddy on the occasion described that is advanced today? No, sir. I have made the point that the attorney-client privilege was asserted, but that we feel bound by the determination on that question by Judge Sirica on May the 7th, the day when he appeared before the grand jury, and we will comply with that ruling so that no privilege on the attorney-client basis is being asserted today in any form. Thank you. Thank you. I was born in Pasadena, California, October 23, 1923. I graduated from law school in 1949. From that time to 1969, except for my involvement in my family business in Phoenix, Arizona, I was engaged exclusively in the practice of law, either in private practice or as general counsel from 1962 to 1969 for a financial institution. In 1969, I was appointed general counsel for the United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, which title I held until September 1970. During the period commencing January 1970 until November 1970, I was also the executive director of the Cabinet Committee on Education, which was charged with the responsibility of implementing the administration's school desegregation policies, principally in the southern states. From November 1970 until May of 1972, I was assistant attorney general 
Internal Security Division, Department of Justice. Commencing May 1, 1972, until the election, I was employed at the committee to re-elect the President. On November 10, 1972, we moved from Washington, D.C., and we have since that time resided in Phoenix, Arizona, where I have been engaged in business with my three brothers. Almost from the beginning of my tenure at the Justice Department, there were rumors in the press and other public media that the Attorney General, John Mitchell, would leave the Department of Justice sometime in 1971 to head the 1972 presidential campaign. There were also rumors, starting in the fall of 1971, that I would be leaving the Justice Department to assist Mr. Mitchell in the campaign effort. I do not recall discussing with Mr. Mitchell his intentions regarding the campaign until the fall of 1971. As best as I can recall, he told me that it, it had not been finally decided whether or not he would be heading the campaign effort. I cannot recall discussing my possible involvement in the campaign with him until sometime in January 1972. I had agreed with my wife prior to that time to leave the administration at the end of the President's first term. In anticipation of this, we took advantage of an opportunity to sell our home in McLean, Virginia, and in January 1972, we moved into an apartment in Washington. Although I had never discussed with Mr. Mitchell my specific role in the campaign, I agreed in, 19, in February of 1972 to accept Mr. Mitchell's invitation to join the campaign organization, which I did on May 1, 1972. I was, as has been testified to, appointed originally as a campaign coordinator. But with respect to the events which are the subject of this committee's inquiry, I should point out that I had not, in my capacity as one of the political coordinators or otherwise, been consulted, advised, or favored with any information relating to the Dirty Tricks campaign, which has now come to light, much less given a hint of any proposed burglary or electronic surveillance. I was not included in the inner circles of knowledge. My help, until my help, was needed as a lawyer. And if I make no other point in this brief prefatory statement, I would like it in the record that as of the morning of January 17, 19, June 17, 1972, I was relieved of my political responsibilities to the extent possible and charged with the responsibility of acting as counsel to the committee, at least as far as the Watergate was concerned. I accepted this responsibility with the understanding that I would obtain the assistance of independent legal counsel and that I would be, be relieved of this legal responsibility when they were sufficiently acquainted with the facts to handle the matter. I should also like to make it clear that I was, was and probably still am one of the attorneys of record in the litigation pending between the Democratic National Committee and the Committee to Re-elect the President and others. It was as a lawyer and not as a political associate that those persons confided in me, and this was made clear to me not by implication but by express statement, and that it was as a lawyer and not as a political protege that I agreed to maintain the fiduciary obligation not to disclose that which was confided in me. If this be the basis of the broad brush charge of cover-up, then it is a charge that every lawyer must answer under our adversary system of criminal justice, a system that requires a lawyer to respect the confidence of his client until waived by the client, no matter how helpful it might be to the lawyer to disclose. I adhered to this principle in seeking a court ruling on the attorney-client privilege before testifying in May before the grand jury. In light of the court's ruling and the waivers resulting from the testimony of others, I feel no constraints now and can fully discuss the facts with which I am familiar without causing the public or the bar to feel that I have not fully adhered to the duty of a lawyer to respect, respect his client's confidence. I would also like to say at this point that the information that I received on the morning of June 17 and June 21 was the most shocking experience in my entire legal career. The facts thus learned thrust me into a situation which I can only compare in terms of personal anxiety 
to being caught in quicksand. Commencing the morning of June 17, 1972, information was imparted to me bit by bit, much of it contradictory, which drew me inexorably into an intolerable and at times unbearable situation of personal conscience, a situation in which I was precluded from acting according to the dictates of my personal desires or interest, a situation in which ultimately my only hope was the selfish one of not becoming implicated in the conduct of others who I felt it my duty to serve. I am not all, at all sure of the exact sequence of events for all of the times, the places, and the parties present, but I shall attempt to relate as fairly and as candidly as I can the history of the Watergate as I learned it. That concludes my statement. I'm prepared to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Martian. Now, you stated in your statement that you are now engaged in a family business. Yes, and sir. I wish you would identify what business this is for the record and state your position uh, with this business. The business is Marty and Construction Company, and I'm a vice president of Marty and Construction Company. And is that in Phoenix? Yes, sir. Now, by way of background, Mr. Marty, and did you participate in the presidential campaign of 1968? In yes, Mr. I, Nixon's behalf. Yes, sir. And what duties did you have in this campaign? I was the Western Regional Director for the campaign and had uh, the responsibility for liaison in the Western states. And how many states did that entail, Mr. Morgan? It varied. Uh, originally, it was six, and I believe later it was 12. Now, after the election, as you have testified, uh, you joined the new administration. Yes, sir. Now, you've already given us your government positions and your tenure in each, so I don't want to dwell on that. But I do want to ask you several questions about your uh, government experience. Now, while you were heading the Internal Security Division, did you have responsibility for the prosecution of the criminal case against Dr. Ellsberg? Yes, I did. And were you also given in the spring of 1972 the task of guiding the Kleindienst nomination through the Senate? Yes, sir. During your government experience, did you work closely with John Mitchell? Yes, sir. And do you still maintain a close relationship with John Mitchell? My relationship uh, was a close professional, personal relationship. I have not maintained a, I still consider him my friend, but I have not talked to Mr. Mitchell or seen Mitchell, Mr. Mitchell uh, since the inaugural. I believe I talked to him on the telephone at or about that time in connection with uh, an appointment. Now, I believe in your statement, uh, you testified that on the 1st of May, you joined the re-election committee. Is that yes, correct? Yes, sir. And did you come to the re-election committee at John Mitchell's behest? Yes, sir. Now, accepting any functions that you later received uh, in regard to the Watergate matters, could you tell us what your major duties were at the uh, committee to re-elect the president? And would you also tell us what the official titles of your positions were? Uh, when I first got there, the uh, situation was in a, I can only describe it as a state of confusion. I had no title. Uh, I had assumed, and I, I think in fairness I should say that this assumption was purely subjective on my part, that I was going to the committee to be Mr. Mitchell's deputy. Uh, when I got there, uh, the, there wasn't even an office for me. And uh, it wasn't until, I don't know when it was in the point of time uh, that uh, a memorandum was uh, sent to me indicating that I, along with four other people, would be appointed as political coordinators. 
Did you maintain the position of political coordinator during your entire stay at the committee, or did you subsequently have a change in title? Uh, I believe after, uh, it may have been after the uh, convention, I'm not sure, it may have been after Mr. McGregor came over, I was, I believe, named a special assistant or assistant to the campaign director. I'm not quite sure on the timing of that. Could you give us, in a nutshell, your duties in regard to the campaign, excluding, as I said before, those that you took on in regard to Watergate? Uh, as I've tried to indicate, uh, there were organizational problems at the committee when I got there, and uh, the title campaign coordinator was never really defined for me. Uh, I devoted most of my time and the five or six weeks before Watergate to uh, primarily uh, the political organizations in the western states, much the same as I had done in 68. Mr. Morton, you said in your statement that you had no knowledge of the plans and activities that led to the break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters on the 17th of June. Did you, prior to June 17, 1972, have knowledge of any covert intelligence plans or operations that had as their purpose the gathering of information for political purposes? None whatsoever, and I have been involved in numerous campaigns, and it's the first time I've ever heard of this type of activity in a campaign. It may have gone on, but I never was aware of it. When did you first learn of the break-in at the Democratic headquarters? On the morning of June 17th. And where were you at that time? I was at the Airporter Hotel in Inglewood, California. Would you please relate to the committee in some detail how you were first informed of the break-in and what details you were told at that time? I had made arrangements to have Mr. Mitchell meet with the uh, party people and the uh, CRP people in California. It was a large meeting scheduled, uh, the initial meeting at 11 o'clock that morning uh, with a joint meeting of the uh, various uh, county chairmen from the two organizations, the regular party organization and the CRP. Uh, we were on our way to the hotel, from one hotel to the other. Uh, we were following uh, a limousine in which Mr. Mitchell and Governor Reagan were riding. And present with me were the National Committeemen from California, uh, Mr. Magruder and Mr. LaRue. And Mr. Magruder told me in the car on the way to the airporter that he had a slight PR problem he wished to discuss with me. I suggested to Mr. Magruder that if it was a PR problem that he was better able to handle it than I was. Uh, I had arranged the meeting and I knew most of the people there and Mr. Mitchell didn't. Uh, he told me that it was a PR problem that required a lawyer. I attempted to elicit from him in the car what it was and he indicated I believe more by gesture that he could not speak in the presence of the National Committeemen from California. When we arrived at the airport or hotel, and I believe it was around 11 o'clock or sometime a few minutes before, uh, Mr. Magruder detained me and said that it was essential that he brief me on his PR problem and that Mr. Mitchell had told him to tell me to forget the meeting until I got the information he was to impart to me. I don't know for sure uh, where this briefing took place. I've heard the testimony of witnesses, and uh, it's hard to remember uh, 
what I've heard here and what occurred, but to the best of my recollection, we went to a banquet room immediately adjoining the large meeting room where the uh, political meeting was to take place. Uh, I thought that Mr. LaRue was with us. Uh, I, I heard his testimony this morning, which would indicate that possibly he wasn't. My recollection is that Mr. LaRue was present when Mr. Magruder briefed me. He told me that he had had a call. And again, uh, my recollection originally was that it was from Mr. Odell. And it's now that it was from Mr. Liddy. Mr. Odell did call me about the Watergate subsequently. That he'd had this call from Mr. Liddy and had been informed that Mr. McCord, who was a security officer for the committee, along with five Cuban Americans, maybe four, I'm not sure, had been arrested in a break-in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters. He told me that the, the people arrested had all, all had fake ID cards, which Mr. Hunt had procured uh, for them from the CIA, and that the, although they were incarcerated, the identities of the accused uh, was not known. He told me that, uh, I guess in response to my question of how and why, he told me that uh, Mr. Liddy was some kind of a nut. He should have suspected that something like this would happen. Uh, he regretted that he had not insisted on firing him uh, when he attempted to some weeks or months before. Uh, I believe I, I, there was more that he told me, and that it, uh, it's difficult to recall extemporaneously now. Oh, I, uh, I believe that came later. Uh, I've given testimony to the staff and uh, on two occasions. I may have left something out. Well, Mr. Martin, did there come a time later that afternoon when you had a further discussion with uh, Mr. Mitchell and Mr. LaRue, Mr. Magruder and Mr. LaRue, as to the details of the events surrounding the break-in. Uh, Council has just reminded me there was one other thing that uh, I was informed of at that time, and that was that this was, I'm sorry, if, uh, may I? I'd you like to answer my previous question, go ahead. In yes. other words, uh, about your first information. He also right? told me, I believe, uh, that this was not the first break-in of the Democratic National Headquarters. Did Mr. Magruder tell you the source of his information that this was not the first break-in? Mr. Liddy. Now, did there come a time later that afternoon when you had a further discussion on the events surrounding the break-in with Mr. Mitchell and Magruder and LaRue? Yes, and here again, uh, when we say Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Magruder, and Mr. LaRue, I, I can't say for sure that all parties were present at all times. I do recall uh, a discussion uh, with these gentlemen or some of them. What further facts did you learn in this discussion? I don't know when I learned it, but I learned it uh, soon after we left the airporter. Uh, as I recall, there were a series of meetings starting at 11 and uh, ending. Uh, I, my memory in this regard is based solely on the schedule, which uh, a copy of which you, your staff furnished me or the U.S. attorneys furnished me. 
Mr. Mitchell, the last event on the schedule was a press conference at 1.30, and I believe that press conference uh, must have lasted a half an hour or so, and uh, assuming we got back to the Beverly Hills Hotel uh, at uh, 2.30 or thereabouts, I would guess, maybe maybe 2.45, quarter to 3. Uh, 245. I'm, I'm not quite sure. <clears throat> I learned soon after we got back, it could have been in the car, but I, I would doubt it since the, there was a driver uh, who was a stranger, it was a hired car, hired limousine, uh, that the purpose, one of the purposes of the break-in was to fix a bug that had been previously placed in the Democratic National Headquarters that wasn't working. Uh, I don't recall uh, any more input on the break-in uh, as of that time. Well, was there a discussion that afternoon about a budget that had been approved for dirty tricks and black advance? Yes, I believe that uh, that was uh, told to me by Mr. Magruder at the airport or hotel. And, uh, in other words, when, in, during that briefing, one of the items I think he told me there, I'm not, again, I'm not certain of the sequence of events, but I, I believe that was the time. Now, Mr. Morgan, I think um, after two months we know what dirty tricks refers to, but could you just explain the term black advance? I'll attempt to the best I can. I'd, I'd never heard the expression before, and uh, I assume when they told me about it that it was for black advance men. I learned, however, that a black advance was a counter advance uh, that was carried on uh, against the opposition candidates or persons acting on their behalf. In other words, an attempt to disrupt uh, the advance schedule of the opposition. Did Mr. Magruder inform you who had approved the budget for dirty tricks in black advance? Uh, yes. And whom did he say? He told me that the, that the budget had been approved by Mr. Mitchell. And did Mr. Mitchell later that afternoon confirm that he had approved such a budget? I'd like to put it this way. Uh, it's my best recollection that I think the subject was discussed and he, he didn't deny it. Did Mr. Magruder or Mr. I, Mitchell... I'm, pardon me, but I, I'm trying to be eminently fair. I'm not positive that it was discussed, but I... I I feel that it was because I was trying to get at the facts. I didn't know the facts. I hadn't heard of black advance or, or dirty tricks, and it certainly must have come up in the discussion. And again, uh, it may have come up when Mr. Mitchell wasn't in the room. Uh, uh, I want to be fair on that point. Well, what is your best recollection as to whether Mr. Mitchell was in the room when that was discussed? That is my best recollection. I'm trying to be fair, however. Uh, uh, when you ask about meetings, and uh, I've heard all types of meetings that took place in Mr. Mitchell's office and other places. Uh, with respect to Mr. Mitchell's office, any time anybody walked in the room, uh, as I understand it, his secretary would log it, and that was a meeting. Sometimes you'd walk in to see that there was somebody else that was there and walk out and uh, you attended a meeting and I hate to characterize uh, uh, a formal meeting where he sat down and admitted uh, that he had approved a black advance budget. That's my best recollection that he was present and that I discussed it. And counsel, excuse me for interjecting this remark at this time. I, I don't know any way that any human being can testify as to a past event except by giving his best recollection. Thank you.
Mr. Morian, while in California, did you receive an assignment uh, from Mr. Mitchell uh, regarding the uh, Watergate matter? Could you be more specific? All right. Did Mr. Mitchell assign you to deal with the legal matters that might arise in connection with the break-in? Yes. And Mr. Martin, while in California, did you make several telephone calls to Mr. Liddy? I believe uh, that uh, my records show uh, that which I have turned over to the committee, and these are records of calls that I turned in to the committee to re-elect the president, that I talked to Mr. Liddy uh, on three occasions, two occa three occasions. The records show three, and there were three, but one of the ones the record shows was not a call to Mr. Liddy, as I recall. Do you remember when these calls took place? On Saturday or Sunday? Uh, the first time I talked to Lister Liddy, I believe, was on Saturday, and that was not a call from me to him, but a call from him to me, as I recall. It's possible I may have returned the call, but that's my best recollection. Did you also talk to Mr. Liddy on Sunday? I talked to Mr. Liddy on Sunday twice, as I recall. Now, can you give us the best recollection you have of the substance of these three telephone calls? Uh, the first telephone call was a, as I recall, was an urgent demand on the part of Mr. Liddy that I return to Washington. Uh, he had indicated uh, in that call, as I understand it, that Mr. Magruder was going to return. Uh, he did not want Mr. Magruder to return. He wanted me to return. Uh, he was very reluctant to, uh, not only reluctant, he refused to use the telephone to discuss anything about Watergate. Uh, he did, however, uh, make some derogatory remarks about Mr. Magruder. That's all I recall about the first telephone call. Would you go on to the second and the third, please? I had told Mr. Liddy that uh, about the plans that I heard that Mr. Magruder was going to return, I would communicate with Mr. Mitchell, and I would let him know. And the final telephone call? Well, that was, that was the first telephone call. The second telephone call, as I recall, was when I called to tell him that I was not going to return and that Mr. Magruder had left, had returned. And what was the final telephone call? Final telephone call was with respect to a call I got from Powell Moore. Powell Moore called me on Sunday. I previously testified that this con these conversations, I testified originally that they were Sunday. I was told that they were on Saturday. Uh, I wasn't sure. I have now checking the records of the calls that the these calls took place on Sunday. Powell Moore called me to tell me of an occurrence uh, the previous day. He said that uh, he wanted m me to know, for Mr. Mitchell to know, that Mr. Liddy had told him in his presence that he had received a call from Mr. Mitchell, that Mr. Mitchell had instructed him to go see Mr. Kleindienst and to have Mr. Kleindienst uh, get the Watergate burglars released from jail. Uh, he told me that he did not believe that these instructions came from Mr. Mitchell. Uh, he told Mr. Liddy that he should not contact Mr. Kleindienst, that when he realized that he was in fact going to contact Mr. Kleindienst, he went with him. That Mr. Liddy made contact with Mr. Kleindienst at the Burning Tree Country Club and that in order to advise Mr. Kleindienst that he, that he was not to pay any attention to Mr. Liddy, he said he stood behind Mr. Liddy so that Mr. Liddy could not see him but that Mr. Kleindienst could and shook his head violently as he could so that Mr. Mitchell, uh, Mr. Kleindienst would know that what he was telling him was an untruth. 
Uh, he told me that Mr. Kleindienst, in effect, had told Mr. Liddy to go to hell. And uh, as I understood, it went on playing golf. Uh, I then called Mr. Kleindienst. I think I told Mr. Mitchell about it, and Mr. Mitchell was amazed. Uh, I believe I told, I then called Mr. Kleindienst to tell him that Mr. Mitchell had given no such instructions, and uh, Mr. Kleindienst was, told me, I believe, that he was satisfied that he hadn't given any instructions, and uh, uh, in effect said, keep that, use an adjective, away from me. I then called Mr. Liddy and uh, reprimanded him. I told him that Mr. Mitchell had given no instructions and that uh, uh, he had uh, done a very, uh, committed a very embarrassing error on the part of the Attorney General. Mr. Morgan, I want to read to you a portion of Mr. Magruder's testimony that is found at page 1910 of the record. We knew that Mr. Mordian, who was there, was a closer friend of Mr. Liddy's than any one of us, and Mr. Mitchell asked Mr. Mordian to call Mr. Liddy and ask him to see the Attorney General, the current Attorney General, Mr. Kleindienst, and see if there was any possibility that Mr. McCord could be released from jail. That statement is not true. Mr. Martin, can you suggest any reason why Mr. Magruder would falsely testify as to such a phone call on your part? I honestly, I don't think uh, Mr. Magruder would intentionally falsely testify. The subject of the uh, Liddy trip to see Mr. Kleindienst was much discussed. Uh, Mr. Liddy's position, or the story that Powell Moore told, was that, uh, as I recall, that John Mitchell had called Liddy. Uh, here again, I, uh, I can't fathom the reason that that's the way it came out in his memory. I think Mr. Liddy would be the one to answer that question. Uh, and I. I can't imagine why Mr. Magruder would say that I was a friend of Liddy's, uh, or a close friend of Liddy's, whatever uh, he used to describe it. I had not seen Mr. Liddy, uh, to my knowledge, uh, except possibly in the hallway or once or twice in, from the time I was at the committee. And I certainly wouldn't be classified as a friend of his by anybody that knows me. Well, if Mr. Liddy did not act uh, pursuant to a request from you by telephone. Can you give us any help as to what prompted Mr. Liddy to make this visit to Mr. Kleindings? Uh, I can't help you on that. Uh, and uh, if you examine the what uh, was asked, it was I was asked to call Liddy to see Kleindings. Uh, Mr. Mitchell would have instructed me to call Kleindienst myself. I didn't need an intermediary for him. Mr. Kleindienst is a close friend of mine. Mr. Mordian, uh, when did you leave California to return to Washington? We left on the uh, morning of the 19th, I believe. And when you arrived <laughs> in Washington, where did you go? I went home. About what time did you arrive? I've been unable to fix that. Uh, all I can recall, my recollection, my wife's recollection, is that it was dusk, which would place it in the neighborhood of 8 o'clock or a little after. Now, after arriving at home, did you go directly to Mr. Mitchell's apartment? Yes. When I say directly, I, I'm sure I helped with the bags, and I was on the plane for five hours. I may have... <clears throat> And do you know what time you arrived at Mr. Mitchell's apartment? I have no recollection. Uh, if you suspend for just a moment, there's a boat signal. There's a boat signal on the clock, and it's 12:20 now. The chairman is temporarily away from the table. I think this might be a good time to recess, and the committee will stand in recess until two o'clock.
As James Hamilton interrupts his examination of Robert Mardian for a luncheon recess, we're going to take a short break. Public television's coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. As we go back to the hearing, Senator Irvin is about to reveal what everyone at the time thought was a resolution to the presidential tapes issue. As you will see, however, the settlement was short-lived. I am pleased to announce that Secretary Schultz has called me and asked and advised me that the President has decided to make available to the committee tapes of uh, conversations which uh, may have been had with uh, witnesses before the committee and which are relevant to the matters which the committee is authorized to investigate. Secretary Schultz has further advised me that the President will meet with me at a convenient time, meet with me in my character as the Chairman of the Committee, at a convenient time next week, and uh, arrange procedures by which uh, these tapes can uh, be made available to the Committee. I am very much gratified uh, by the this information. I think the information will enable the committee to expedite its uh, investigation, and I think it was a very wise decision on the part of the President. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, may I join in expressing my great delight at the decision of the President communicated to you by Secretary Schultz. I want to commend you as well and the members of the committee for handling this matter in a way that permitted this accord and this uh, agreement to take place. The committee, I believe, forbore from trying to create a legal confrontation that might have jeopardized the possibility of negotiating a settlement to this controversy. It would appear that the White House has uh, shown its uh, spirit of cooperation and response. I have nothing but commendation for the committee, especially for the chairman and for the president. In negotiating a rather delicate situation involving a most fundamental concept, that is the doctrine of separation of powers, in a way that avoided a confrontation and will apparently give this committee access to relevant parts of extremely important information bearing on critical features of this inquiry. Thank you. I'd like to take this occasion to add uh, to these words. I don't believe that any investigating committee in the history of the Congress has been able, as we have uh, been thus far, to, invest, to investigate uh, such high, highly controversial matters as we have been investigating with such uh, unanimity of agreement among the committee members as to the steps to be taken and with more a wonderful cooperation on the part of all the members of the committee. Council may res res resume uh, the interrogation of the witness. Mr. Mordian, when we broke for lunch, we were discussing the meeting in Mr. Mitchell's apartment on the evening of June 19th, and I would like to return to that in my questioning. Uh, who was present at that meeting, Mr. Mordian? Based upon... Uh, <coughs> 
my reconstructed recollection, uh, I would say Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Magruder, Mr. Dean, and I believe there was one PR a person from the Office of Public Information, and I'm not sure on that. Was Mr. LaRue at that meeting? Mr. LaRue. Now, is there a possibility that the PR person, the press spokesman, actually met the party at the airport and did not return to Mr. Mitchell's apartment? It's possible, because I don't have a very clear recollection of that meeting. Would you give us, to the best of your recollection, the topics that were discussed at this meeting? The only two things I recall of that meeting is that there was a, a need for a, a statement uh, from the Office of Public Information for Mr. Mitchell. I don't recall discussing it or participating in it. I don't recall what the uh, event was. Uh, I recall discussing the need for uh, obtaining the resources of a law firm because I believe it was announced that day or we were informed that night uh, that a lawsuit was going to be filed the next morning by the Democratic National Committee against the committee to reelect the president. And uh, my best recollection is that uh, there was a discussion uh, as to who uh, we should retain. And did you have the responsibility for securing lawyers for this purpose? Yes, sir. And which lawyers did you eventually uh, retain for this? I retained uh, Mr. Parkinson and Mr. O'Brien. Is that Ken Parkinson and Paul O'Brien? Yes, sir. And they're both local attorneys, is that correct? Yes. Now, at this meeting, was there any discussion uh, as to burning or otherwise destroying a gemstone file or any other sensitive file? Not in my presence. I never heard the word gemstone until uh, this investigation this year came out. I will say that I left that meeting rather early. I wasn't there very long. I made uh, numerous telephone calls that night uh, from my apartment, calling local council, people that I knew, getting recommendations for lawyers. And I, I, I know that I wouldn't have been calling late in the evening and bothering people, but I called a number of lawyers and talked to them about uh, the relative merits of different law firms and different lawyers. Well, do you remember any discussion at all of a sensitive file as opposed to the destruction of a sensitive file? No, sir. Mr. Morgan, I'd like to read uh, portions of Mr. Magruder's testimony to you and Mr. LaRue's testimony to you of yesterday and receive your comments. First, from Mr. Magruder's testimony at page 1913 and 1914. Mr. Dash, did you have a meeting on that evening, the evening of June 19th, when you came back to Washington in Mr. Mitchell's apartment? Mr. Magruder, yes. Mr. Mitchell flew back that Monday with Mr. LaRue and Mr. Mardian. We met in his apartment with Mr. Dean, Mr. Martin, and myself, and the general discussion again was, what were we going to do about the problem? It was, again, we had very little information. We did not, of course, know what type of investigation would then be had, and we talked about types of alternative solutions. One solution was recommended in which I was to, of course, destroy the gemstone file. So I called my office and Mr. Dash that solution came up as a result of that meeting, Mr. Magruder. Well, I think, yes, it was generally concluded that that file should be immediately destroyed. And now reading from Mr. LaRue's testimony of yesterday at pages 4589 and 4590, Mr. Dash, you said Mr. Magruder asked what he should do about these sensitive files, Mr. LaRue, yes, sir. Mr. Dash, uh, did he get a response to that, Mr. LaRue? As I remember, there was a response from Mr. Mitchell that it might be a good idea if Mr. Magruder had a fire. Now, previous to that testimony, um, Mr. LaRue had testified that you were at that meeting. Do these 
portions that I have read of the testimony reflect refresh your recollection as to what was discussed. I heard the testimony, and I've just read Mr. Dean's testimony, or Magruder's. Mr. Magruder's testimony, I'm sorry. No such discussion took place in my presence. I think I would have recalled such a discussion had it taken place in my presence. Well, are you aware of any testimony by Mr. LaRue and Mr. Magruder that you left the meeting before destruction of the gemstone file? I don't think anybody asked him that question, and I don't think anybody asked Mr. LaRue when I arrived. Maybe they did. I don't know. But you know of no statement by Magruder or LaRue, here or otherwise, that you were not present at this meeting when the destruction of the gemstone file took place? Well, I haven't talked to them. Mr. Mordian, did you, in the several days following June 19th, have an occasion to interview Mr. Liddy? Yes. And who else was present in this interview? Mr. Fred LaRue. Now, Mr. LaRue testified at page 4595 that this meeting was on June 20. Do you concur in that testimony? No. And I might state that there is doubt in my mind as to the date of that meeting. I originally, in response to questions put to me by the U.S. attorneys, fixed that date of that meeting as the 21st or the 22nd. They told me that the meeting took place on the 20th. We finally settled on the 20th or 21st. And I believe I told your committee that it was the 20th or 21st. In checking my records, I would have to say that the meeting took place on the morning of, and again, I could be mistaken, the morning of June the 21st. What is it in your records, Mr. Mordian, that indicates to you that the meeting took place on this day? On the worksheet, which has been turned over to your committee, I know that I got a call from Gordon Liddy. And it coincides with my earliest recollection that I did not meet with Mr. Liddy at least on the first day of my return. I'm not saying that that's absolute. I just, my earliest recollection was the 21st or 22nd. And I think I have testified that it could be the 20th or 21st. But I would have to say that it was the 21st. Is it your recollection that this meeting with Mr. Liddy took place in the morning of the 21st? This is purely surmise based upon that call. It looks to be the first call that I noted. And my recollection is he said he was leaving that day for Los Angeles. I notice in your diary that there are numerous meetings scheduled on June 21st. One at 8, one at 8.30, one at 9.30, one at 10, one at 11, and one at 12 that appears to have been canceled. Would this heavy load on the morning of the 21st suggest to you that perhaps the meeting took place on the 20th? The, that cross mark doesn't indicate a cancellation. I think you'll find that cross mark on every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which was the time I was supposed to exercise, which I didn't. I note that the meeting, there's one, for instance, with a gentleman at 8.30 and then another one at 10 o'clock. I don't think I met with that gentleman twice on that day. One appears to be a rescheduling. And the fact that I haven't noted in my book doesn't mean I kept the appointment. I'm trying to give you the best, my best recollection, and that's. How did this meeting come about, Mr. Mardian? Well, my recollection differs with that of Mr. LaRue. 
Again, Mr. LaRue could be right. My recollection was Mr. LaRue told me that Mr. Liddy wanted to talk to me. Uh, I recall whether it was Mr. LaRue that told me this or Mr. Liddy to come to my office. Mr. Liddy was reluctant to come to my office. Uh, he wanted to meet someplace else. And we met in Mr. LaRue's apartment. And I believe that more than anything else was the basis for my belief that it was Mr. Uh, Mr. LaRue that uh, arranged for the meeting and indicated uh, that we could meet in his apartment. Mr. Morning, I wondered if, in your own words, if you would in some detail tell us what occurred at this meeting and tell us what information that Mr. Liddy imparted to you. My recollection is pretty vivid. I may forget uh, some of the items that he disclosed to me, but I'll try not to. We arrived, Mr. LaRue and I arrived at his apartment. And soon thereafter, Mr. Liddy came into the room. Uh, the first thing he asked uh, Mr. LaRue was whether or not he had a radio. Mr. LaRue indicated a radio, which was in the corner of the living room. Mr. Liddy went over and turned the radio on and asked me to sit by the radio in a chair. And he sat in a couch, as I recall, uh, that was next to an end table that the radio was on. He apologized to me by saying something to the effect that it's not that I don't trust you, but this conversation can't be recorded. My inference from that was he thought I had some kind of a device on me or possibly something in the room. I don't know. And again, I'm going to have to say that I don't recall the sequence of events in which he related these things to me. But I do recall that he said that he wanted to hire me as his lawyer, as his personal attorney. I told him that I was acting as attorney for the committee and that I could not relieve myself of that responsibility to represent him. He then said it was imperative that he be able to talk to me in confidence and that uh, under no circumstances could I disclose what he told me. I told him that uh, since he was an employee of the committee and I was acting as attorney for the committee, he could talk to me as a client to a lawyer and that I would maintain uh, his confidence but that I would have to be at liberty to disclose what he told me to Mr. Mitchell. At first, I believe he demurred, and I told him that was the only basis on which I could talk to him. Uh, one of the things that he told me was that he had a message uh, from Mr. Hunt, that Mr. Hunt uh, felt that it was the committee's obligation to provide bail money to get his men out of jail. At that time, uh, these people were incarcerated in the D.C. jail. I was interested in finding out what had occurred, and I interrogated him as to the events of the evening of January 16th morning, of June 16th morning of the 17th. And he related to me uh, what had occurred about the break-in He told me that uh, they had planned, as I recall, to break into the McGovern headquarters that same night uh, about the arrest of the uh, uh, five people, Mr. McCord and the others, uh, their flight. Uh, he indicated to me that uh, there was nothing to fear because uh, the only person that could identify Mr. Liddy was Mr. McCord, and Mr. McCord uh, would not uh, divulge his identity, that the Cuban-Americans uh, were old soldiers who had worked in the CIA with Mr. Hunt since the Bay of Pigs, and that they would never under any circumstances disclose Mr. Hunt's identity uh, and that the committee 
uh, had nothing to fear in that regard. I told him that based upon what he had related to me, the events of that evening, uh, one of which included, as I recall, his uh, sitting on the shoulders of one of the men uh, at a distance, I don't recall, some 300 feet or 300 yards and shooting out a light uh, behind the Democrat uh, committee headquarters. Uh, I pointed out to him that a person that uh, he was that intimate with would certainly be able to identify him. Uh, pointed out that he had spent, uh, he told us he'd spent some time in the room with these people in their hotel room. They had eaten. Uh, that. Uh, his fingerprints would be all over the place. Uh, he kept insisting that uh, there was no chance that uh, uh, he would be identified. I tried to convince him he would be identified. His uh, best bet was to give himself up uh, rather than try to wait for them to arrest him. Uh, he discounted this possibility. Uh, he did, after some uh, discussion, indicate that uh, it was possible that he could be arrested. But I inquired of him as to the, because of the news accounts of the arrest and the apparent uh, uh, bungled effort, uh, that the possibility that someone in the group uh, had had it in mind that they would be arrested uh, to embarrass the committee to reelect the president. Uh, he discounted this completely by saying that this group had been operating together for some considerable period of time. Uh, that uh, they were all real pros, that they had uh, engaged in numerous uh, jobs. Uh, and when I asked him what kind of jobs, he said, we pulled two right under your nose. I inquired as to what he meant by that, and he said uh, that uh, they had uh, uh, invaded the office of the psychiatrist of Dr. Ellsberg and that they were the ones who got Dita Beard out of town. Uh, I expressed my strong displeasure uh, uh, with respect to, uh, I pointed out that the worst thing that happened in the hearings was that Dita Beard had disappeared. I uh, asked him, uh, because of the Ellsberg break-in, what, if anything, they'd obtained. He told me that they had obtained nothing, that uh, they had uh, searched all the files and couldn't find his record. I asked him on whose authority he was operating, and I wish to be very careful here uh, because I don't know that he used the name of the president, but the words he did use were clearly meant to imply that he was acting on the express authority of the President of the United States with the assistance of the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, I made some notes of, uh, oh, I asked him what information they had obtained. He told me that, oh, he told me that the purpose of making this entry, uh, or the that this entry was not of his doing, that neither he nor Mr. Hunt thought it was a good idea, that uh, they had obtained nothing from the bug that they had previously implanted in the place. Uh, he told me that the only thing they had ascertained from that bug was the fact that uh, somebody at the Democrat National Committee uh, was talking to somebody at the, I mean, Democrat National Committee was talking to the people or a person uh, at the committee to reelect the president. 
that although he and Mr. Hunt were against the entry, that Mr. Magruder. Would you suspend just for a minute, Mr. Witness? Anybody who wants to leave the room should do so now so we don't have disruption during the witness's testimony. Now, would the officer close the door, please, so we can have uh, quiet in the witness room? Thank you very much. You can proceed. I think I was saying that uh, he explained that neither he nor Mr. Hunt felt that any additional entries would be fruitful, but that he had they had made the entry at the insistence of Mr. Magruder. Uh, I recall uh, again inquiring as to why the stupid adventure uh, seemed to me to be the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard of. Uh, as, a, as a politician uh, uh, or as a person that had had political experience, I, I couldn't understand what they would hope to get out of the Democratic National Headquarters uh, before they even had a candidate, much less afterwards. Uh, party headquarters, at least Republican Party headquarters, are very sterile uh, during this period of time. And, uh, he, uh, he could not answer the question for me, uh, uh, other than to say that he was carrying out his orders. Mr. Morian, did Mr. Liddy mention what type of budget he was operating under? Uh, I was asked the question about the budget this morning, and uh, I responded both to you and to the chairman. And I stated that. Excuse me, I have to interrupt this. It appears that a, a hoax has been perpetrated upon the, the committee at least upon the chairman of the committee. I was called to the telephone this just before the lunch period. I was told before I went to the telephone that Secretary of the Treasury Schultz was calling and wanted to speak to me. I went to the telephone and the voice at the other end of the line informed me that it was Secretary of the Treasury Schultz. I'm not familiar enough to, with the voice of uh, the secretary to uh, be able to identify it, and so I just assume that uh, the person at the other end of the line was uh, Secretary Schultz. And he made the statement, which I reported to the committee in the news media on, on this uh, microphone, in the meantime, there had been communications between the council, White House counsel, Mr. Garment, and the staff, and uh, Mr. Garment professed uh, ignorance of any matters of that kind, and as I understand, an investigation was made, and Mr. Schultz, uh, Secretary Schultz, was uh, contacted, and Secretary Schultz uh, then uh, 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 stated that he had had no such uh, conversation. So uh, I had his office called and uh, asked that he be uh, placed on the phone. And so I was informed a few minutes ago, the reason I put it this way, because I hate to have my faith shattered in humanity. <laughs> but I was called to the phone and informed, the, uh, the, rather I was informed that Secretary Schultz was indeed on the phone. And I went to uh, the phone and had a conversation with the man who really assured me he was the real uh, Secretary <laughs> Schultz. And he informed me that he'd had no conversation with me today, that uh, whoever did it was somebody else. That the uh, only conversation he's had with me recently by telephone is, uh, was uh, uh, rather that he called me yesterday to tell me that uh, Make something about the White House, the the uh, 
witnesses from the Secret Service. So it's just an awful thing for a very trusting soul like me <laughs> to find that there are human beings, if, if you can call them such, who would perpetrate a, a hoax like this. Um, uh, uh, additional information which I received from counsel, and which counsel assures me that they re received uh, by telephone and not in person, and which they believe was received by White House counsel is to the effect that the President has a request to the committee on the decision and uh, will reach some decision about it tomorrow. So, um, notwithstanding, a month, uh, uh, early next week, uh, yes, early next week. So, uh, notwithstanding the fact that my trust in humanity has been grossly abused by someone, I'm going to assure, uh, 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 and notwithstanding the fact that some people think a telephone is the instrument of the devil anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to assume that the information which counsel received uh, at one end of a, a telephone line from somebody to the other end was indeed information conveyed to them by White House counsel, and that the recent information is correct. Mr. Chairman, it would be helpful if we could have found a secure telephone. <laughs> but in any event, I, too, would view with... Uh, great distaste, the apparent hoax that's been perpetrated on the committee, the fact that it was received here in a confidential phone number in the committee room would seem to add credence to the call on first blush, and I can fully understand the situation as it transpired. I would say for the record, however, that the thanks that I expressed and the admiration I expressed for the accommodation of both parties still stands as an advance payment on what I hope will still happen. So. And I would add that the, the uh, commendation I visited on the committee members is, uh, still stands, and I would like to expand it to include uh, both the majority and the minority staff members. And uh, I trust that nobody in the future will attempt to <laughs> deceive and mislead a trusting and unsuspicious individual like the chairman of this committee in any such fashion. <laughs> In other words, uh, the council suggests that we've had some talk about dirty tricks. I think it's a unanimous opinion this committee this was the right dirty trick. <laughs> yeah, we have no idea what this witness has said. <laughs> Mr. Martin, I believe a minute ago we were talking about what Mr. Liddy told you about the budget that he was operating under? Uh, I think I responded that uh, earlier or this morning uh, I mentioned the budget matter uh, in a conversation uh, with Mr. Mitchell present in California. It's possible uh, that that subject came up after my discussion with Mr. Liddy uh, because Mr. Liddy told me, and it may have been for the first time, that he was operating under a budget approved by Mr. Mitchell and the White House during that June 21st meeting, if it is the 21st. And just to make the record clear, Mr. Martin, uh, did Mr. Liddy also say to you that the operations that he had been involved in, such as the Ellsberg burglary and the Dita Beard incident, had the ex approval of the President and the CIA? Is that a correct paraphrase? If not, please correct me. Uh, as I have told your st you before, staff, uh, I don't recall. I can't say that he said the President of the United States, but. The words he used or the word he used were meant to imply that, and that's the impression he left with me. That they had been approved by the president. That was your impression? Yes, sir.
Now, did Mr. Liddy mention to you that he had shredded any documents? Uh, yes, in trying to demonstrate uh, to me that there was no way of tracing him, he told me he had shredded every bit of evidence that would have linked him to this operation as well as all our other operations. He told me he'd even gone home. He has a habit, he told me, or a hobby, I should say, of collecting soap from the various hotels. He had taken the soap wrappers off and saved the soap and, sh and shredded all the soap wrappers. He also told me that during this process he had shredded all of the $100 bills that he had in his possession that were new and serialized. Now, before I move on, have we exhausted the contents of this meeting to the best of your recollection? Yes, Mr. Uh, LaRue reminded me of another. I, he told us quite a bit that morning, and uh, it may seem comical now. It certainly didn't seem comical to us at the time. Uh, he did make the statement that uh, the committee could be assured that he would never talk, and if they doubted that, that uh, as Mr. LaRue testified, he would, if we would uh, just tell him what corner to stand on, he was ready to be assassinated. What did you do with this information, Mr. Martin? I went immediately. I shouldn't say as soon as I could get access to Mr. Mitchell, I disclosed uh, to him. Uh, I may not have disclosed all of this to him, but And you think it was the same day that you reported to Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Uh, Mr. My counsel advises me that despite my notes, I neglected to tell you a very important part of what another aspect of what he told me. In explaining to me that they were a purely professional outfit, he told me that uh, Mr. Hunt was the planner of the Bay of Pigs, the chief planner, as I recall, that uh, he was extremely popular. I think he said like a god in the Cuban community of Miami, uh, that uh, this was an explanation of why these Cuban Americans would follow him to death and that uh, no one would disclose anything as far as they were concerned. That they're absolutely loyal. I'd worked with him for a number of years. I've been working with them in these operations. Uh, that, uh, and I don't wish to bring anybody else into it uh, by implication, but he said that the one of his friends in the Cuban community and one of the leaders was a particular person. I am not sure, and if I use the identification, I may be identifying the wrong person, uh, because at staff meetings, I heard some of the staff members start mentioning some names, and I'm not even sure that the person was the, of the character that I described, but that he was extremely wealthy. And uh, I told Mr. Liddy that I did not think Mr. Mitchell would approve the use of committee funds to bail out the defendants, and he should so advise Mr. Hunt and that uh, it seemed to me that if Mr. Hunt had such good connections in the Miami community uh, that uh, they should look to that community uh, for the bail money. When you spoke to Mr. Mitchell, did you transmit this request for bail money to Mr. Mitchell? included amongst all of the other matters that I related. And well, specifically in regard to the bail money, what was Mr. <clears throat> Mitchell's reaction? Mr. Mitchell de told me that under no circumstances would bail money be forthcoming and for me to call Mr. Liddy and tell him. And I did so. Will you tell us the rest of your conversation with Mr. Mitchell? I don't want you to repeat everything that you uh, told Mr. Liddy, but I would like to know what Mr. Mitchell said to you. 
I, uh, I can't recall. Oh, he asked me if Mr. Liddy, I might say that uh, Mr. Mitchell appeared to be as sincerely shocked as I was when I got this information. Uh, he asked me if Mr. Uh, Liddy had disclosed any other uh, of the activities of this uh, group that had been arrested and Mr. Hunt and Mr. and himself. And I, uh, I told him that he had not he had not uh, disclosed any others to me. Did Mr. Mitchell confirm or deny that he had approved the budget for Mr. Liddy's operation? I don't think he did. I don't think he, I... he made no comment in any way as to whether or not he had approved the budget? Not at that time. That discussion took place later. A discussion on whether he had approved the budget took place later? Well, the discussion didn't start out in that vein. Uh, it took place when I confronted Mr. Magruder. I asked Mr. Magruder, in the presence of Mr. Mitchell, I believe the next day, or soon thereafter as I could, how much money he had given Mr. Liddy. In addition, I forget the general nature of the entire conversation. Uh, I asked him whether he directed Mr. Liddy to go in there. He denied it. I asked him how much money he had given Mr. Liddy. He said he had authorized Mr. Sloan to give Mr. Liddy $40,000. Uh, I asked him what he thought the $40,000 was for. It seemed to me a sizable sum of money. Mr. Mitchell expressed the same concern and wanted to know, you know, what he, how he could have spent $40,000 already because the campaign had just started. Uh, Mr. Magruder replied that Mr. Mit to Mr. Mitchell that he had authorized $250,000, and this seemed but a very small part of that sum. That's how the 250000 budget matter came up. Well, at some occasion during that week, wasn't there a discussion between Mr. Magruder and Mr. Sloan as to the actual amount that had been approved? I was not, I don't recall being present at that discussion uh, other than the it's been testified that I confronted the two of, two of them in Mr. Mitchell's presence. That may very well have occurred. I don't have a present recollection. But after talking to Mr. Magruder, I then interrogated Mr. Sloan. Mr. Sloan told me that he had been authorized by Mr. Magruder to disperse in the neighborhood of $200,000. Uh, which shocked me even further. I asked him if he was sure of the amount. He said he had not calculated the exact amount, but that it was his opinion that it was in the neighborhood of $200,000 <clears> that he'd already dispersed. Now, did Mr. Magruder immediately agree with Mr. Sloan that this was the No, amount? I then went, Mr. went to Mr. Magruder. And I asked him if he was sure that he had only authorized the disbursement of $40,000. He said, well, are you talking about total disbursements or disbursements to Mr. Liddy? And said that I had only asked him about how much money he had authorized for Liddy. He said the figure was $75,000 because he authorized $35,000 to Mr. Porter. Uh, subsequent to that, and again, I don't know the sequence of events. I can only guess as to the days that must have been in the, in the period June 23, June 24. Uh, 
Mr. Sloan came to me quite upset uh, and said that I had, he had talked to me in confidence uh, and that I had disclosed to Mr. Magruder what he told me about the $200,000. Uh, he said, in effect, I thought you were the only one I could trust and I can't even trust you. And I told him, well, with the, the discrepancy we had, I had to somehow find out where the truth lay. I talked, as I recall, to Mr. Sloan on that day, uh, and I believe this was the Saturday before he left. Now, I may have had a discussion with him privately, as he has testified in my office, and another one uh, in the presence of Mr. Mitchell, as others have testified in Mr. Mitchell's office, where a confrontation took place. But I had a rather lengthy discussion with Mr. Sloan on that occasion with respect to his possible liability uh, for violation of the election campaign law. And uh, my recollection of that conversation is uh, a little different than Mr. Sloan's. Did Mr. Sloan feel like he was being pressured into telling a false story by Mr. Magruder or anyone else? I'm not sure. Yes, he did. But I'm not sure whether it was on that occasion or when he came back from his trip. I just am not sure when we had that discussion. But he did at some time communicate to you his fear that he was being pressured. Yes. Now, did you subsequently confirm that the budget that had been allocated to Mr. Liddy was actually $250,000? To this day, uh, that matter has never been confirmed to me. I never, uh, uh, never appraised of the fact that there had been any agreement on the amount of the disbursement. I think Mr. Sloan's testimony that it was $199,000, uh, if you want my opinion, that's the figure I accepted. But he did not give me that figure on that day, or uh, he gave me that figure, I believe, after his return from his trip. He told you that he had dispersed 199000 I believe after he returned from his trip, he, he told me that he had reconciled his books and it was $199,000. And Mr. Magruder never admitted to you that that was the correct amount? No. Now, Mr. Morgan, while we're talking about money, let me ask you if you are aware that around $80,000 was passed in late June of 1972 from Mr. Stans and Mr. Sloan to Mr. LaRue. Are I was not aware of that. You were not aware of that transfer? No, sir. You played no part in that in the transfer of that money? Based upon the testimony that I've heard here, I apparently did. Well, let me read Mr. Stan's testimony to you and ask you for your comment. After speaking about the fact of the transfer, Mr. Stan's had this to say. At that time, it was understood within the committee that Robert Mordian had been brought to Washington to work on legal matters that were current at the time and I went to him for advice. His advice, after he found the description of the money, was to get the money out of the office and out of the campaign, and he suggested that I give it to Fred LaRue. Now, does that refresh your recollection? I recall the testimony. Do you, do you agree or disagree with the testimony? I disagree with the testimony. Can you suggest why Mr. Stans would so testify? Yes, I, I started to say I had this long discussion with Mr. Sloan about uh, his possible involvement in violation of campaign contributions. And uh, Mr. Sloan uh, considered me, I believe, a friend. And he came to me uh, for that advice. Uh, and amongst the things we discussed with respect to his uh, possible liability was the fact that he had failed to report 
cash on hand in the prior reporting period and that he had dispersed funds without reporting it. I might say that when he came to see me on that occasion, he was almost paralyzed with fear. He professed to not have intended to do anything wrong. Uh, I told him that he should reconstruct all of the disbursements that he had made and that if he did this and reported those disbursements and deposited the funds on hand and report before the next reporting date and report make that report that all he would be guilty of in my opinion was a technical violation of the law because a full disclosure would have been made but simply uh, one reporting date later uh, if uh, he had no knowledge of the uses for which the money was used. And I gathered that he agreed with me that that money should be put in the bank and reported. Uh, he had a sense of relief as a result of that conversation. It was the same conversation where we were discussing the discrepancy in the funds. I told him that uh, I wanted to get together with him on the following Monday. I believe this was late Saturday afternoon. And it was at that time that he told me that he and his wife had planned for some time a 10-day trip to the either Bermuda or the Bahamas, someplace similar, that his wife was, in her, I believe, pretty well along in her pregnancy that she was very overwrought over the Watergate affair. He was concerned for her health and hoped that he would not have to stay. Uh, it was I that told Mr. Sloan that if he did go, it would look very bad, especially in view of the fact that uh, we were having GAO inquiries, that there was this large discrepancy, that he was the only one that could solve it. Uh, he reiterated that uh, his wife's health was in the balance. I told him I would talk to Mr. Mitchell and let him know. I talked to Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell thought it would be very bad if he left the next day for me to try to talk him out of it, but that if he felt he had to go for his wife's health to let him go. I called Mr. Sloan that Saturday evening and I said, take your wife on her vacation, but be sure that your number is with your secretary and that you can return on 24 hours notice, and he thanked me. Now, subsequently, when he returned, and I, I presume it was shortly after his return from his trip, uh, as I recall, he had resigned prior to this time, but he hadn't, in fact, left. He'd handed in his resignation, but he was still working with Mr. Stans. And I don't, I cannot fix the date. It could have been uh, early July. He came to my office. And as I recall, there was somebody else in there, and I don't know who it was. He came in unannounced, and he said he was he had cleared out his safe or was clearing out that he had funds, cash funds, for Mr. Stans, that Mr. Stans was not there, that Mr. Stans told him to leave it with Mr. LaRue, that Mr. LaRue was not there that he had called Mr. LaRue, and Mr. LaRue said to leave it with Mr. Mardian. I told him that I did not want to be responsible for cash. I did not have a safe. The only thing I had was my desk drawer, and that if he felt that uh, that was a safe place, it was okay with me if I had no responsibility, he said Mr. LaRue would be by to pick it up soon. Uh, I left my office. I had to go someplace. I was not there, and Mr. LaRue called me from my office soon thereafter uh, and asked if Mr. Sloan had left some money for him, and I told him it was in my second left-hand, right-hand drawer. He apparently was at my desk. He said, I got it, thanks, 
Now, that's all I know about that transaction. And when, it, is, it is your testimony <clears throat> that this money was not transferred upon your legal advice? No, sir. The, the uh, funds were not to go to Mr. LaRue, but to Mr. Stans, and I think Mr. LaRue so testified this morning. I subsequently had a conversation uh, about this matter with Mr. Stans, and uh, there is a definite disagreement. Uh, Mr. Stans asked me if I recall giving him this advice. I told him I did not recall giving him this advice. This would be entirely contrary to what I did tell Mr. Sloan for sure and what I thought I'd told him. The money uh, should be deposited in the bank and reported on the next reporting date. Mr. Stans' reply to me was, somebody told, gave me that advice. And I said, well, Maury, it wasn't me. He said, well, Duke and I have discussed it. And he said, unless you can come up with something better, Duke and I have agreed that that's the way it's going to come out. And that's my only recollection. And as counsel says, the date of that call, he called me on May 1 of this year, uh, a couple days before I was to testify before the U.S. Attorney's Office. And Mr. Martin, I see that you are reading from a piece of paper. Is that a note that you made at the time of that phone call? Yes. And I wondered if we might, um, Mr. Chairman, put a copy of that in the record for clarity. Uh, the date on this is wrong. It says May 1, 72. It was May 1 of 73. I was going to ask you about that, Mr. Martin. Are you sure that's a transcription of a call that came in in May of this it's year? It's not a transcription of the call, but when he, and I don't want to, this, you can read this two ways. You can read it. Uh, well, I don't want to put any bad connotation on it as far as Mr. Stans is concerned, because Mr. Stans, as long as I've known him, is an honorable man. I just took this, I took it the way I took it, and I wrote it down as it came over. Well, if counsel, pardon me for interjecting myself at this point, I, I practiced law a long, long time, and I found out that... Uh, the recollections of honest men as to a conversation often disagree because none of us have perfect memories, or at least very few people do, if any. Mr. Chairman, may I say a word? I furnished a copy of this uh, handwritten memorandum made uh, reportedly by Mr. Martin at the time of the conclusion of that telephone conversation with Mr. Stans on May 1, 1973, and I furnished a photostatic copy of this to the staff of the committee on yesterday. But we note now that the date written on it is May 1, 1972. We would like that changed on the basis of the witness's testimony to 73. That will be all, okay. all right, and uh, we will uh, admit this, the uh copy rather than the original in the evidence and let uh, Mr. Martin retain the, the original. Mr. Martin, I'd like to move on as quickly as we can. Beside those conversations you've already mentioned... Pardon, pardon me, may I say something? And it wasn't $80,000 that Mr. Uh, uh, Sloan left with me. Uh, court, I didn't count it, didn't look at it, but uh, it wasn't any $80,000. I might ask you how you knew it wasn't 80000 if you didn't count it. Well, he told me that he, he told me what sum it was when I asked him, Mr. Sloan, and a uh, uh, figure that sticks. I, I don't have any present recollection, but somebody asked me uh, originally uh, in your staff if it was 40000 and I didn't think it was that high, but I, I uh, had it been an $80,000 figure, I certainly would have remembered uh, it being something in excess of 40. Well, let me turn to another subject, Mr. Morty. And beside those conversations you have already mentioned regarding bail money, uh, did you ever have any discussions with anyone concerning payment of monies to the defendants in the Watergate case? As to the payment of monies? To the payment of money. There were three instances where I uh, recall 
discussions concerning payment of money. The first was the one I have related, was the, the uh, conversation with Mr. Liddy. A second, on a second occasion, I was told by Mr. O'Brien, who was one of the counsel that I had hired, that Mrs. Hunt had come to him to talk to him uh, and I don't recall that there was much of a conversation. She apparently had come thinking she was going to get money from him. And uh, as I recall what Mr. O'Brien told me, and he would be the best one to discuss it, when she asked Mr. O'Brien who uh, he worked with or for, and he said, Mr. Mardian, and she said, apparently, as I recall, she had to terminate the conversation. She said she couldn't talk to him. And he asked why, and she said, my husband says he's a straight arrow and not to have anything to do with him. Uh, the third instance was an occasion in my office And my office was used by the attorneys because it did have a, an office and an ante room, and uh, that's generally where they were. And I was getting increasingly involved back into the campaign. Mr. Bittman and an associate from his office came there while Mr. Parkinson and Mr. O'Brien were there. And after exchanging pleasantries with Mr. Bittman. I had not met him before, and I had to leave. Uh, but before I left, Mr. Bittman said something about uh, his client was very upset about his attorney fees or something to that effect. Later, uh, we were having a meeting in the conference room with all of the attorneys from the two offices, and I happened to arrive at the same time that Mr. Parkinson arrived. And I said, I asked him, what was all that about? And he said, oh, nothing. Uh, he was saying it facetiously. Bittman wants $25,000 attorney fees, and he thinks, his client thinks that the committee ought to pay it. I told him I thought it was blackmail. And Mr. Parkinson, I think, concurred. We, had, we could not talk any further about it. I thought that was the end of the discussion, and we went into the meeting with the firm of attorneys. Mr. Morgan, are these the only three discussions that you recall regarding money? The only three, and I never heard of any money or money demands other than those three occasions. Mr. Morgan, I'd like to read you a portion of Mr. Dean's <coughs> testimony um, and ask you to comment on this, please. Uh, Mr. Dean was responding to a statement found in what, has been, what is now known as the Buzz Hart Memo, which read like this. It was Dean who suggested to General Walters on January 6th that CIA pay the Watergate defendants while in jail. And Mr. Dean, in commenting on this particular uh, passage, said this. I believe I have explained that, Senator, in that I reported also at one point in time to Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Mardian about the Gray Theory. That theory prompted Mr. Mardian, as I recall, to suggest that the CIA might be of some assistance in providing us support, and he also raised the question that the CIA might have a very, very proper reason to do so because of the fact that these were former CIA operatives. Uh, Mr. Mardian, do you remember uh, a conversation of this sort? I don't recall that conversation. Uh, I do recall uh, a discussion, and there may have been discussions concerning CIA involvement, and I can tell you that whatever point in time that was, uh, it was my opinion that the CIA was involved uh, 
for a number of reasons. And uh, I don't recall any money demands as such, but uh, and the only ones I recall are bail, to bail the defendants out. And I may have said uh, CIA ought to take care of its own people, or if it's a, it's a CR, CIA problem and not a committee problem. That is, would be uh, my best recollection. Mr. Morian, did you become aware in the summer of 1972 that Mr. Comback, Mr. Herb Comback, was going to be asked to raise money for the Watergate defendants? No. And did you learn uh, sometime before the election that the monies raised by Mr. Comback were insufficient and that they are was pressure from the defendants for additional funds. I never heard that Mr. Kambach was involved in that type of activity, and I know Mr. Kambach, and I'm as surprised, I'm the most surprised person in the world that Mr. Kambach would be asked to do it and would get involved in it. Mr. Mr. Martin, if you'll bear with me for a half a minute, I'd like to read you two passages from Mr. Dean's testimony. The first is found at page 2211. After my meeting with General Walters and subsequent meeting with Haldeman and Ehrlichman, I informed Mr. Mitchell that there could be no CIA assistance. To the best of my recollection, this occurred on the afternoon of June 28th in a meeting in Mr. Mitchell's office, and I believe that Mr. LaRue and Mr. Mordian were also present. There was a discussion of the need for support money in exchange for the silence for the men in jail and if the CIA could not do it, they would have to find money somewhere else. Mr. LaRue indicated that Mr. Stans had only a small amount of cash. I believe he said $70,000 or $80,000, but more would be needed. After some discussion, which I cannot recall with any specificity at this time, Mr. Mitchell asked me to get the approval of Haldeman and Ehrlichman to use Mr. Herbert Kalmbach to raise the necessary money. And now I'd like to read from page 2259 of Mr. Dean's testimony. Having explained the status of the cash at the White House, I must now return to the pressure that was being placed on the White House for the use of these funds, which I have just described for payments to the seven indicted individuals. This pressure began long before Election Day in that Paul O'Brien was receiving messages from William Bittman, Hunt's lawyer, that Hunt and others expected to have more money and attorney's fees in exchange for continued silence. The initial payments by Kalmbach had not been sufficient. O'Brien reported this frequently to Mitchell, Mardian, LaRue, and myself. Mr. Martin, can you explain the discrepancy between your recollection and Mr. Dean's recollection? Well, let me say this. I never uh, recall any uh, approach or demand or discussion with Mr. Paul O'Brien other than the one that I have uh, related. The discussion that Mr. Dean refers to, I think he says, I believe Mr. Martian was there. In going through the testimony of some of these witnesses, uh, uh, Council and I have found instances where people say, I believe he was there when I wasn't even in town. Uh, I might point out that I don't know what the date of this conversation was, but commencing on or about July 15th, I started phasing out of the Watergate so-called other than conferences at Mr. Mitchell's request, uh, with respect to advice he wanted in connection with the civil litigation, uh, I think everybody involved knew how distressed I was and how I wanted out of Watergate. And I believe as of July 13th, I had, in effect, uh, I, I know I introduced, I took Mr. Mitchell and Mr. O'Brien up. I mean, Mr. Parkinson and Mr. O'Brien to Mr. Mitchell's office and said they're taking over. And uh, I don't think anyone would have communicated that type of uh, 
demand to me, either out of compassion or friendship or what they knew, Bob Mardian was wanted out. And I didn't want to be involved in Watergate or its ramifications. But it is true, isn't it, Mr. Mardian, that you had a number of meetings with Mr. Parkinson and O'Brien from, uh, from July 13th up until October, isn't that correct? I would say yes. I don't know when you say numerous. Uh, whenever the occasion demanded, I would meet with them. Uh, we had uh, several lawsuits that uh, were then pending and others that uh, uh, were about to be filed, some by the Democratic National Committee and some by individuals uh, within the Committee to Re-elect the President. I was, of course, an attorney of record in the case, uh, and I think out of courtesy they would call me. Uh, I sat in on, on meetings concerning the civil litigation, but I never sat in on any meeting with Mr. O'Brien or Mr. Parkinson where uh, there was any discussion about payments. So Mr. Dean is just dead wrong in his testimony, is that what you're saying? Well, I don't think you can characterize it as dead wrong when you said, uh, he says, I believe. He also his... says, Mr. O'Brien reported this frequently to, to Mitchell, Marty, and LaRue and myself. That is, the need for more money. I think Mr. O'Brien would be the best one to testify as to what he reported to me and not Mr. Dean. We'll ask him. And Mr. Marty, did you ever state to John Dean that you wished to read the FBI 302 report. I'm sorry, sir. I was, my counsel was talking. Did you ever state to Mr. Dean that you wished to read FBI 302 reports regarding the Watergate investigation? It's the last thing I wanted to read. Did you read those reports? No. Did you ever suggest to Mr. Dean that the FBI was being too aggressive? No. And that Mr. Gray should slow down his investigation? Absolutely not. Marty, let me read to you from Mr. Dean's testimony at pages 2199 and 2200. It was after I showed a copy of the July 21st report to Mr. Mitchell that Mr. Mardian insisted that he be permitted to see the FBI reports. Mitchell agreed and thought that Paul O'Brien and Ken Parkinson should also see them. I recall that when Mardian, O'Brien, and Parkinson finally came to my office to look at the reports, they realized that they were not very meaningful. It was Mr. Mardian, however, who became very excited because of the scope of the investigation that Gray was conducting and the tone of the cables he was sending out of headquarters. Mardian clearly thought that Gray was being too vigorous in his investigation of the case and was quite critical of Gray's handling of the entire matter. He demanded that I tell Gray to slow down, but I never did so. Again, may I ask you to explain the differing views between Mr. Dean and yourself as to your activities regarding the FBI reports? I can't explain Mr. Dean's testimony in this particular and in some others. Uh, my attitude at that time, as I tried to demonstrate in my opening statement, the date especially that he's talking about, uh, I was, uh, I wanted nothing more to do with the Watergate. I didn't want to, uh, the last thing I would want to do would be to see an FBI report. Uh, he indicates that uh, for some reason that I was a, an active uh, participant as late as the uh, latter part of July, and I wasn't. So Mr. Dean is dead wrong, then, in his statement? On that him. score, he's dead wrong. All right. Mr. Martin, did there ever come a time when Mr. Magruder revealed to you his actual role in the Watergate affair? Mr. Magruder never re revealed to me even the amount of money involved, much uh, less his role in the affair. And I would say this as far as Mr. Magruder is concerned. I think Mr. Magruder recognized how I felt about the matter. Uh, and there was no discussion, open discussion at any time in my presence or in the presence of Mr. Mitchell or anyone else 
about his active involvement. I think that uh, after my talking to Mr. Liddy, there was no need for him to tell me. I, I knew what I believed, and uh, I just don't think Jeb wanted to get me involved any more than I was. Did Mr. Magruder indicate to you that uh, he was going to commit perjury before the grand jury? No, he did not. Did he tell you he was going to perjure himself at the trial? No, he did not. Did he tell you what facts he was going to testify to before the grand jury? I, I never knew what he was going to testify to, uh, even at the time he testified. Did I, you know what he was going to testify to at the trial? No, do, I didn't, because... Do you, do you know now? Do I know what he testified to now? Or did you know contemporaneously, let me say that, what he was testifying to at the trial? No, I didn't. Mr. Morty, and I want to read you some more testimony. I'd like to read you testimony from Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Magruder, and Mr. LaRue. Uh, first from Mr. Mi uh, Mitchell at pages 3578-3579. Uh, Senator Irvin, you were also informed by Magruder that he, Magruder, was prepared to commit perjury when it went before the grand jury in August rather than to reveal what he knew about these matters. Mr. Mitchell, that was correct, sir. Senator Irvin, yes. Well, did Mr. Mardian and Mr. LaRue ever talk to you about the Magruder proposal to commit perjury? Mr. Mitchell, they were present on an occasion or more in which Mr. Magruder stated what he was going to testify to. Now from Mr. Magruder's testimony, reading from page 2063 and 2064, uh, again, Senator Irvin is questioning. Then for fear that the trial might be, the trail might be pursued by the prosecuting attorney and the committee to reelect the president, they devised a cover-up story to the effect all of this money had been given to Liddy for him to engage in legitimate intelligence operations. Mr. Magruder. Yes, sir, that is correct. Senator Irvin. That matter was discussed by you with Mitchell, Dean, LaRue, Strawn, Mardian, and all of those, was it not? Uh, Mr. Magruder. Yes, sir. The senator again. And they all acquiesced in it and encouraged it. Mr. Magruder. Yes, sir. And finally, from the testimony yesterday of Mr. LaRue at page... Pardon 40. me. Uh, uh, could I take these one at a time? I, uh, uh, what you're reading sounds like an indictment, and uh, if I could answer the... I can't answer all three of them at the same time. I'm quite happy for you to answer them one at a time. I mean, it sounds to me like to. you're just reading all these statements people are making. And I, am re I am reading statements that have been made to get your comment on them, because they seem to indicate that you knew what Mr. Magruder was going to testify to. Well, and Mr. I Hamilton, do you propose to ask him to comment at, at one time on all three statements? That was my plan. I'm happy for him to comment in the well, Let's proceed on that way, and I'll, I'll answer I, as generally as I can. I think it would be more appropriate to let him comment on each one. He may overlook something if you bunch them all together. I'm quite happy to do that, Mr. Press. Would you like to comment on Mr. Mitchell's statement? Would you like it? Reread? Yes, I'd like it reread. Senator Irvin, you also were informed by Magruder that he, Magruder, was prepared to commit perjury when it went before the grand jury in August, rather than to reveal what he knew about these matters. Mr. Mitchell, that was correct, sir. Senator Irvin, yes? Examination just a minute so Senator Baker can make a, a statement on behalf of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize to counsel and the witness for interrupting again, but uh, I, can, I, I continue to be surprised almost daily at new developments. What I'm about to say now is not a new development, but a further comment on the previous development, the so-called hoax, the telephone call. Following that telephone call, the committee made a formal request of the Federal Bureau of Investigation for an investigation of that event. 
We've been informed that a similar request was made just prior to our request by the President and by the Attorney General. The investigation is now ongoing and will be pursued to whatever lengths it can be followed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I would suggest to counsel, and I understand the counsel is perfectly willing to accede to Mr. Martin's request that uh, Mr. Martin be permitted to comment on each of these questions, one of these matters, one at a time. I think that is uh, a very, uh, that he's entitled to do so. Thank you. Well, I will continue reading uh, from Mr. Mitchell's testimony. Uh, the next question was, Yes, well, did Mr. Mardian and Mr. LaRue ever talk to you about the Magruder proposal to commit perjury? Mr. Mitchell, they were present on an occasion or more in which Mr. Magruder stated what he was going to testify to. Well, as I understand the statement, uh, Mr. Mitchell is simply saying that I was present when he stated what he was going to testify to. Now, I was present at numerous meetings where Mr. Magruder uh, was discussing the money amount uh, to suggest that I knew he would be perjuring himself if he testified to amounts that he was telling us about. The answer would be yes, because I felt that what Mr. Sloan was telling me was the truth. But I don't think that uh, what Mr. Mitchell is saying there is that he told me he was going to perjure himself. I believe that you testified earlier that you didn't know what Mr. Magruder was going to say to the grand jury. And if I read this quote by Mr. Mitchell correctly, uh, he says that you were present on an occasion or more in which Mr. Magruder stated what he was going to testify to. Now, is Mr. Mitchell wrong? Well, Mr. Mitchell may be referring to the numerous discussions with respect to how much money Mr. Magruder uh, said he gave or authorized Mr. Sloan to give Mr. Liddy and others. <coughs> and uh, I heard a number of those stories. The figure finally got up to $95,000. Well, let me, perhaps, perhaps my question isn't totally clear. Were you present on an occasion when Mr. Magruder stated, I am going to go down to the grand jury and testify to the following facts? No. Right. Let me read then from... Counsel uh, reminds me that... Uh, that uh, you were asking that question, or I'll inquire, was that with respect to his testimony at the trial or before the grand jury? After the grand jury. The one before the last question. Uh, this is res in respect to grand jury testimony. No, the, the next to last question, the question relating to Mr. Mitchell's testimony. Uh, the, the question that I just asked was relating to testimony before the grand jury. The prior one with respect to what Mr. Mitchell's testimony was. That related to the grand jury. I might say, uh, I don't think I talked to a single witness who was about to testify who came to me that I didn't advise that they would have to tell the truth. Now, if people made statements in front of me contrary to the truth, uh, I think they would be honest enough if asked uh, to state that that's the only advice any of them ever got from me. Well, in that regard, Mr. Morty, and let me read you Mr. Magruder's testimony. Uh, the question was, then for fear that the trail might be pursued by the prosecuting attorney in the co committee to re-elect the president, they devised a cover-up story to the effect all of this money had been given to Liddy for him to engage in legitimate intelligence operations. Mr. Magruder, yes, sir, that is correct. Senator Irvin, that matter was discussed by you with Mitchell, Dean, LaRue, Strawn, Mardian, 
and all of those, was it not? Uh, Mr. Magruder, yes, sir, Senator Irvin, and they all acquiesced in it and encouraged it. Mr. Magruder, yes, sir. I uh, recall that testimony, and I recall those answers to the questions asked by the chairman, but I think if you go back and take the testimony of Mr. Magruder, his direct testimony, uh, where he was asked as to who was involved, he enumerated a number of people and then added, and Mr. Mardian to some extent. Uh, subsequently, when that question was asked, uh, Mr. Mardian was no longer to some extent, but involved with all of them. And I think I would have liked to have asked Mr. Magruder what he meant by to some extent. Can you suggest what Mr. Magruder meant by some extent? I think he probably uh, was aware of the fact that I, after talking to Mr. Liddy, knew of his involvement, and uh, I would be less than honest if I didn't say that if Mr. Magruder went up there and testified uh, that he was not involved, that uh, he would be perjuring himself. If you want my personal opinion, I thought he was going to go up there and take the Fifth Amendment. Well, did you know after he testified what he testified to? I knew he was No, I didn't. I knew he wasn't indicted, so he must not have taken the Fifth, and he must not have testified as to the truth. So then you had some indication that Mr. Magruder had committed perjury. Uh, talking about the grand jury? Yes. Yes, I think I knew an awful lot, and I suspected an awful lot. I, to this day, don't know what the answer is, but as a lawyer, I uh, felt, and it's the only solace I have, that all persons are entitled to the presumption of innocence. They have a right not for a lawyer not to make that judgment, but for a court to make that judgment. And uh, I may have had very strong feelings about the guilt or innocence of a lot of people, and I have them now. But as a lawyer, I could not substitute my judgment for theirs. And I did what I felt I had to do in the premises. Mr. Morton, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, skip the portion of Mr. LaRue's testimony and, and move on to another area, if that is uh, satisfactory with you. Uh, my next question is, did, did you ever suggest to Mr. Magruder that he erase certain entries in his diary relating to uh, a meeting in Mr. Mitchell's office on February 4th where bugging plans were discussed, as we now know from testimony before this committee. No. In that regard, let me read you a section from Mr. Magruder's executive session before this committee. Uh, Mr. Dash was doing the questioning, and this was the question. Was it that time Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Mardian suggested you could erase the references in the diary? Mr. Magruder, that is right. Mr. Dash, did Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Magruder, I said you can't erase the diary because it would show somebody said the FBI could look at the diary. Now, could I have your comment on Magruder's testimony in this regard? I just answered that I was not, that discussion never took place in my presence. Mr. Mordian, I take it, it is, it's fair to say that after your conversation with Mr. Liddy, you had a good indication that at least Mr. Magruder had been involved in some regard in the Watergate break-in. Is that correct? Are you asking for my opinion as to what I believe? I'm asking for your opinion. Yes, yes I had the opinion that uh, he was deeply involved. And you were aware, were you not, in the summer of 1972 that Mr. Mitchell and Mr. McGregor were making statements proclaiming the complete non-involvement of anyone still connected with the uh, committee, making public statements, public press releases. Yes, I was aware of that. Did you make any attempt to alter or prevent these statements? <clears throat> the very first statement that Mr. Mr. Mitchell put out, I altered. Uh, that was in California. 
was presented to me. I felt that it shouldn't go out in that fashion, that Mr. Mitchell could not make those flat statements. I changed it by interlineation. Uh, Mr. Took it. it was brought to me by Cliff Miller. And he said Mr. Mitchell wanted me to approve it before it went out. I made those changes. I took it to Mr. Mitchell. He agreed with all of them. I then saw the statement as it came out, and the changes had not been made. With respect to Mr. McGregor, I tried to see Mr. McGregor on numerous occasions concerning statements that were going out by the committee. And I recall one instance, and I was unsuccessful in that regard, uh, until uh, the convention. He had made some very flat statements at the convention. I insisted on seeing him on that occasion. He saw me in his suite, and uh, when I walked in, he appeared as if he was ready to walk out, and he said, I'm a, in an awful hurry, Bob, and I don't have much time. And I said, you better take time for this. I said, you're making statements uh, concerning the possible involvement of people in the campaign that I, to be, I believe to be untrue. There are people inv involved in the campaign that have a tremendous exposure, Clark, and you better watch out what state, watch what statements you make, and you better let me brief you on it. He got very upset. He said, when I took the job, I was assured that nobody involved, there was nobody involved in the Watergate, still in the campaign. I'm relying on that, and I don't want to hear about it. Uh, I advised Mr. Mitchell that he should terminate Mr. Magruder. If you want to know the advice I gave, I advised him he should terminate Mr. Porter. I thought he agreed with me. He then told me that he couldn't do it. Subsequently, I advised Mr. Mitchell that there ought to be a memorandum written of all the facts as we knew them, at least put in the file to protect him. He instructed me to do so. Mr. O'Brien was to prepare the memorandum. Subsequently, I was told to forget the memorandum. They didn't want one. Now, I can't recall all of the exculpatory things I tried to do to protect uh, myself and some of the people involved, but uh, there were numerous of them. Well, did you make a report to anyone else beside Mr. Mitchell and this abbreviated report to Mr. McGregor about what you knew? No. You mean the Liddy conversation? Yes. And the other facts you learned. No. Specifically, Mr. Mardian, uh, did you have a talk with the President? No, sir. Did you have a talk with Mr. Haldeman? No, sir. Mr. Ehrlichman? No, sir. Mr. Colson? Uh, about this subject? Uh, Mr. Hamilton, I was precluded, I felt, by the oath I took as a lawyer never to disclose uh, communication made to me by Mr. Liddy. Uh, he disclosed to me when I was trying to investigate one crime, the commission of other felonies. And uh, I think I would have been remiss in my profession after giving him my promise to what? disclose to others the commission of other crimes. Mr. Morton, I wonder if you would explain that a little further. You have, you have testified that you did not undertake an attorney-client relationship with Mr. Liddy. Uh, rather, you represented the committee to re-elect the president. No, I assured him that the attorney-client relationship would pertain as to that conversation uh, since he was an employee of the committee and I was the attorney for the committee. The committee can only exist in its employees, people. I told him I could not act as his personal attorney. This is the same privilege that Judge Sirica has now ruled uh, was not applicable because Liddy already had contacted certain lawyers when he talked to you. Is that correct? Uh, I believe the argument before Judge Sirica was not that the attorney-client relationship did not prevail by reason of any lack of bona fides on my part. The argument was made before Judge Sirica that I had been acting in good faith. They argued that Mr. Liddy had not been acting in good faith uh, when he approached me and that he was merely trying to use the client privilege and to use me. 
And uh, I think the, the transcript of that proceeding will show that there was never any suggestion that I was acting in bad faith. And I think on more than one occasion, they pointed out that my activities were in good faith. It was the activities of Mr. Liddy that were in question. And I still have doubts. I've taken the advice of my counsel. Mr. Liddy was not a party to that proceeding. And uh, yet, uh, the man, regardless of what you think of him, has been held in contempt for refusing to testify. And yet, here I am, under court order, required to testify as to what he told me uh, when he was willing to go to jail not to talk. And, uh, it's an anomaly, and it's not one that I feel comfortable with. Mr. Martin, you are aware as a lawyer that the attorney, as a general matter, that the attorney-client privilege does not cover communications relating to the continuing commission of a crime such as a conspiracy to obstruct justice, are you not? Well, I don't think that I... I presume in the vacuum that's a correct uh, question, but I don't think that's relevant to my discussion with Mr. Liddy. Let me ask you just two more questions. Uh, first of all, were you an adherent to what we might call the Mitchell principle that the re-election of the president was more important than almost anything else and certainly outweighed the revealing of the true facts on the Watergate matter and the White House horrors. Would you adhere to that principle? You want my personal opinion? Yes, that's what I'm asking. I don't know whether it's in hindsight. Uh, I, as I say, uh, I did not uh, feel that I could continue uh, because of my own feelings. I've never practiced criminal law, and I don't know what criminal lawyers go, to, go through in carrying the burdens of their clients, but I, I, I couldn't practice criminal law. Uh, I think maybe a good criminal lawyer could have represented the committee with aplomb. I couldn't. And uh, uh, I wanted out, and I expressed it on, on at least three, three occasions I quit and was induced to stay on the committee. And I was told uh, that on July 11th that a new role would be found for me. A new role was found for me. And I was divorced from the Watergate activity from and after that date, except when uh, people wanted to consult with me about specific aspects of the civil litigation. And I would point out that uh, I uh, saw Mr. Mitchell uh, on numerous occasions, as the chart will disclose. But I would point out again, they were not all meetings. Uh, the ones that show up there as of 5.30, 6 o'clock, uh, that was my ride home. It was not a meeting. Uh, Mr. Mitchell had a driver in a car, and he went right past my apartment, and his secretary would call uh, at the time he was about to leave and say, Mr. Mitchell's ready to leave. More often than not, he wasn't ready to leave, and I would wait for him. And uh, from the chart, I see those are meetings. Uh, I was present uh, either in his office or immediately outside his office. He didn't have an anteroom that was near his office. But uh, from the middle of July on, uh, I had uh, taken on other duties. Pardon me. Are you through, Mr. Morgan? Yes. I think my question was whether you considered that the re-election of the president outweighed all other considerations. What your personal opinion was? Certainly didn't outweigh all other considerations. That, uh, my, my final question, Mr. Morgan. Um, a number of people have testified in a, in ways that appear to implicate you in certain aspects of the cover-up. I've read from Mr. Mitchell's testimony, Mr. <coughs> Stans, Mr. Magruder, Mr. Dean, and Mr. LaRue. And to believe you fully, Mr. Marty, and we must at least partially, I believe, disbelieve these men. 
including Mr. Mitchell, whom I understand was once and perhaps still is your close friend. And my question is, why should we believe you and not believe them? Pardon me. The only answer I can give is that I've tried to testify as to the best of my recollection and ability and belief. I want to thank you for your attention during my lengthy questioning. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Martin, we've heard testimony now from all five participants in the meeting at Mr. Mitchell's apartment on June uh, 19. It seems that Mr. LaRue and Mr. Magruder recall a conversation about the destruction of documents, and that you and uh, Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Dean recall no such conversation. Do you recall whether or not you all arrived approximately at the same time on that occasion? No. Uh, we keep referring to meetings, uh, and I, I don't mean to say that Mr. Mitchell is an unstructured person, but uh, people come and go in his office and in his uh, when he's working. And uh, my recollection is that uh, I don't, most of the people were there, I guess, when I got there. I know that they were all there when I left. So I, I couldn't really say whether it occurred or didn't. Was this at his apartment or, or his office? It was in his apartment. On this occasion. Did you uh, go there directly from the airport? No, I didn't. Uh, when you arrived, you recall who was uh, present? I, I can't recall anybody coming after me. In fact, uh, I was sure that Mr. LaRue wasn't even there. Uh, that was my best recollection, but here, listening to the testimony, uh, uh, listening to Mr. LaRue, I have to assume he was there, and I've so testified. What was the, the subject matter? What was your understanding as to what was going to be discussed and what, in fact, was discussed? I didn't know. Uh, my best recollection is, and that's why I thought there was a person from the Office of Public Information present, that there was something that occurred that day that required a reply from Mr. Mitchell. Uh, the other thing that had occurred was an announcement that the Democratic National Committee had filed or was filing suit the next morning for a million and a half dollars, as I believe. And uh, I received the next morning uh, service of that complaint. All right, Mr. Marty, on, on June the 21st, as I understand it, you received a, a briefing from Liddy in the presence of Mr. LaRue as, yes, to, what, as to what happened. You've talked about this uh, attorney-client privilege situation that you had with Mr. Liddy. Did you also envision yourself in that same kind of relationship with, with the committee as a whole or, or other members of the committee? Yes, I was representing the committee. What period of time did that cover in, in your mind? Well, as I say, I'm probably still attorney of record in that proceeding. I attempted and did uh, to the maximum extent possible shift all the burden to the other two for law firms as of around July 15th. As a matter of fact, you, you requested that you not be interviewed by the FBI, I believe, for that very reason, did you not? Or? That's not true. I, uh, the FBI interviewed me, and I offered to answer any questions that they would put to me that regarding my conduct, my activities, I merely said that I could not answer questions uh, which re related to communications made to me, and they asked me numerous questions about my conduct. But you did assert, the point I was making is that you did assert that privilege at, at that early date. With did respect it? to communications made to me. Correct. And, and approximately when was this, if you recall? Well, soon after the Watergate break-in, I, I, I don't know. They came to talk to me. I asserted the privileges to communications, but offered to answer all other questions, and I did. Right, we've heard testimony about, as counsel preceding me pointed out, in, in June to September, some of these other witnesses talking about activities going on that have been characterized by various people and various witnesses as uh, cover-up activities, comings and goings, meetings, uh, and you've mentioned the fact that, that what might appear as a meeting might not in fact be a meeting. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? How were the logs kept uh, in Mr. Mitchell's office you or other to, offices there? You have to understand Mr. Mitchell's office. When you enter uh, the Mudge Rose firm, you enter going south 
you proceed south, then you proceed east, and then you proceed north as far as you can go in the building. And Mr. Mitchell's office is the last one, so that the reception room is not conducive to Mr. Mitchell's office, although he has a very nice office. Uh, he had a secretary, a young lady, who uh, he had two secretaries. They changed while he was there. Uh, during this Watergate business and before that, he had a new young lady who was very competent, as competent as she could be, <coughs> uh, who tried to keep records as they were kept at the Justice Department. And many times uh, she would have to leave her desk and if I came out of the room, she would say, what time did you go in? Or who else is in there with you? What time did they go in? One time I can recall calling her and she says, aren't you in with Mr. Mitchell? And that occurred on more than one occasion because Mr. LaRue and I look somewhat alike to some people uh, because our, our build and lack of hair and the glasses we wear. Uh, but, and she would ask me sometimes, uh, uh, the identity of people, and I wouldn't know, and she'd ask somebody else. But what I'm really trying to say is they weren't really meetings. If you walked down to Mr. Mitchell's office and you stood there, he didn't want, there was no place to sit, he'd wave you in. You sit in the chair while he finished his business with somebody. Uh, I can remember one occasion, uh, I must be up there for somewhere for an hour and a half or two hours, I had five minutes with him, because I had to wait through one discussion he had and uh, when I started to talk to him, uh, another gentleman came in and said it was urgent, and he took about 30 minutes of his time, and I still sat there. I presume, according to the record, that it was a meeting of us, we three people. Uh, there were three people that came in, and three different subject matters were discussed. Another thing that occurs to me is that your name is, is used almost interchangeably with Mr. LaRue. Uh, LaRue seldom mentioned without mentioning Marty, and Marty, Marty and Sep seldom mentioned without mentioning LaRue. Uh, can you explain this? Did you travel as a pair all the time, or uh, were you engaged in the same uh, roles uh, at the time, or what? No. Uh, uh, starting, I would guess, in the early August, I had an entirely different role, uh, different duties. Uh, I didn't see him that much. He was a good friend. He is a good friend of mine. People would call me Fred, and I stopped even people that didn't know us, uh, people at the committee. There were about 400 of them there, and quite a few would call me Fred, and quite a few would call him Bob. What was your assignment as you, when you came back from, from California and became involved in, in what was going on around you? Was it uh, an investigatory type assignment, or was it merely to hire other attorneys, to get other attorneys on board, or a combination of the two? To do whatever was necessary to make an appropriate response to the uh, complaint that was filed. We had a complaint. We had motion for expedited recovery. Uh, we had uh, uh, to answer that complaint. Uh, uh, we had cross actions on file, motions to dismiss. Uh, we filed a an action for abuse of process based upon a statement by one of the principals of the Democratic Party that the purpose of the suit was not to recover damages but to uh, uh, get at the uh, facts of Watergate. In other words, he was using the statement was to the effect they were using the process of the court not for a legal purpose but for a political purpose. At least that's what we urged. There was a libel action filed. Uh, on behalf of Mr. Stans uh, because of the assertion that uh, he was responsible for laundering committee funds in Mexico. Uh, was it more civilly oriented then than, than criminally as yes. opposed to defending a criminal case that yes. might arise? Had you ever had any previous criminal experience uh, yourself as a criminal lawyer? No. With regard to, to the situation as you found it, you were talking about Mr. Liddy and dealing with him and of course, he was evidently telling various stories to various people. I think we, we know that now from, from the testimony. Mr. McCord says he told him that, that Mitchell, when he was trying to get McCord involved, did in fact get him involved, that Mitchell had approved the, the operation. Uh, according to Dean, uh, he told him that uh, Magruder had pushed him and didn't mention Mitchell. And from your testimony, he didn't mention Mitchell to you. Uh, 
Uh, had you ever had any previous experience with Mr. Liddy? Didn't, didn't you almost hire him yourself one time? Yes, until I interviewed him. Tell us about that. Uh, he applied uh, for an attorney position in the Department of Justice. He came very highly recommended. His background, uh, his resume uh, are splendid from the point of view of experience. And uh, our personnel officer had done everything but put him on the payroll. I interviewed him. Uh, his resume, uh, his background was good. Uh, I didn't feel that uh, he would fit into the Department of Justice. So what did you do? I. We undid the paperwork. And you didn't? You unhired him? What's that? You unhired him, in effect? Yes. I think oh. that was why Mr. Mitchell made the reference he made. He knew that I, he asked me why I hadn't hired Mr. Liddy, and, uh, and I told him. Of course, you, you had a conversation with him back uh, when you were still in, in California concerning his uh, uh, his conversation with uh, with Kleindean. Didn't he tell uh, Powell Moore that Mitchell, in effect, had issued instructions? Did he tell Kleindean to help him get McCord out of jail? Something he like that. He didn't talk much on the telephone, uh, Mr. Thompson. Uh, didn't you? Didn't you? Uh, in one of your conversations with Liddy, tell him, in fact, Mitchell had not uh, instructed this. I thought you testified as to that uh, earlier. I told him to stay away from Mr. Kleindean. You didn't tell him that Mitchell had not, in fact, issued those. I'm sure I told him that too. You recall any response that he had at that time? I don't recall. Did you talk to Mitchell about whether or not he had told issued instructions for Liddy to immediately after to get I got McCord out of jail to get to get McCord out of jail? Yes, immediately after Powell Moore called and told me what had occurred. And what was Mitchell's reaction? You don't have to quote his exact words if you don't want to, but... Uh, I think you can well imagine uh, his reaction. What about you were dealing with Liddy? Were you trying to get information from Liddy? I, I assume. You testified you were also trying to get information concerning the money. What situation did you find yourself in there? How long was it before you could finally resolve after talking to, to Magruder and talking to Sloan and going back and forth as to how much money had been given to Liddy? How long was it before you could resolve in your own mind as to what actually happened? It never was resolved. Did you ever make a statement about uh, whether or not various parties were lying, had lied to Mr. Mitchell about... Uh... I told uh, Hugh Sloan when he told me 190 or 200, around 200,000 that Mr. Magruder had lied to Mr. Mitchell in my presence. He said it was only 40,000. Did you make inquiry of other people? Did you make inquiry of anyone in the White House? Did you talk to Mr. Dean, for example, no. about uh, involvement? Mention has been made, uh, for example, of uh, suspicions with regard to Mr. Colson. Did you ever ask him uh, concerning what he knew about Colson's involvement, if any? What Mr. Dean told me about Mr. Colson? He told me he thought he was clean. He thought Colson was clean? When did he tell you this? Well, I don't recall. Uh, after talking to Mr. Liddy, I, uh, I surmised certain things, purely speculation on my part, and I started asking some questions based upon that speculation. Was this in June? I doubt, I doubt that. I don't know. It would have been soon after my discussion with Mr. Liddy. Mr. Martin, it just came to my attention on the, I assume, the primary relevance of your, your claim of attorney-client privilege has to do with, with whether or not you should have divulged certain information to certain people earlier than you have. And I think in fairness to you, I might relate something that's just been brought to my attention, the Ethics Committee of the ABA Opinions Number 216 which advises that it is not unethical for an attorney to resolve doubts about possibly privileged matter in favor of non-disclosure. Does that affect your position? 
when you have a that when you have a problem that it's not unethical to resolve those doubts in favor of non-disclosure. I think that's the rule. I have no further questions, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Martin. You're welcome. Did you have something to add? No, sir. I'm glad that you uh, decided uh, to abide by Judge Sirica's ruling about the question of uh, the attorney-client relationship insofar as Liddy is concerned, and that uh, you have uh, accepted the theory, the, the, the fact that other parties could, that talked to you had waived the attorney-client privilege by testifying in their own behalf, because that saves us a little, a, a good deal of trouble, because I'm, uh, I have a high respect for the attorney-client relationship. I think that uh, the, the maintenance of the confidentiality of communications between an attorney and the client is absolutely essential. If uh, persons are charged with criminal offenses in our courts are to receive a due process of law. I've, I've been always, I've been, I, I tried a case that was trial lawyer for many years, and I've gotten a little rusty on some of my knowledge of the rules of evidence, but I was under the impression that uh, the attorney-client uh, relationship only applies to confidential communications between the, the client and the attorney, whereby the attorney receives from the client information which is necessary or appropriate to enable the attorney to uh, protect the legal rights of the client, and that therefore it only relates to uh, confidential communications relating to past transactions. Is uh, that your understanding of it? I wouldn't disagree with that yeah. statement. I also have the uh, vague recollection from my practice as a lawyer in criminal as well as in other cases that uh, the attorney-client uh, privilege only applies to confidential communications which uh, are made to the attorney uh, in the absence of other people. And for that reason, since Mr. Uh, uh, LaRue was a third party, that uh, the conversation which Mr. Liddy had with you in Mr. LaRue's uh, apartment was, did not fall within the scope of the privilege of, of attorney-client relationship. I think in this jurisdiction the rule is, is opposite to that, uh, Mr. Chairman that where the communication is in the presence of a co-employee, uh, that as far as the attorney is concerned, the privilege obtains on behalf of both persons. However, either one of the other may disclose, but that does not abrogate the privilege insofar as the attorney's disclosure. Well, I'm concerned. glad it's not necessary for me to engage in debate with you on that because I do realize that we have uh, 50 state jurisdictions and we have one federal jurisdiction and there's uh, a great deal of di a slight divergences among the different jurisdictions in respect to this matter. And uh, fortunately, we don't have to pass on it because you have uh, uh, abiding by Judge Sirica's ruling and also by the fact that other witnesses have uh, waived the attorney-client privilege. Mr. Chairman, that proposition of evidence law is not without some doubt. Yes. We maintain the position that uh, Mr. Mardian had, has suggested here and argued it before Judge Sirica. He never got to that point, so we don't have a ruling on that yes. particular phase. Well, Parson, we don't have to. It's an academic question that... Uh, we can be interested in as lawyers and uh, the solution of which is not necessary to this present of a matter. Now, uh, you stated that you uh, suspected that the CIA 
had that was involved in uh, this uh, break-in. Uh, why would did you suspect that uh, an organization of the government, which is expressly forbidden to uh, exercise police powers and which uh, is uh, barred from any function in internal security matters, would break into the Democratic uh, headquarters? There were a number of uh, indications of that involvement, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to just enumerate them, so, a few of them. Well, uh, the first involved the activities of, the, of that evening. I believe that all of the persons arrested as well as Mr. Hunt, were either employees or former employees of the CIA. The, pardon me a minute. Well, I would not say that. Not only who the attorney who appeared to me and your family members are not connected to the company that is known to represent. I think you've got to fully answer. I have received a letter from uh, the uh, acting attorney general, Joseph T. Sneed, saying that. Uh, rest to me, stating the Department of Justice has in initiated an investigation into the telephone hoax in which the Secretary of the Treasury, Schultz, was impersonated. The telephone message you received appears to have constituted a violation of federal law. At the direction of the President, the resources of the Department of Justice are being employed to apprehend the individuals or individual or individuals responsible for this cruel and irresponsible misrepresentation. Sincerely, Joseph T. Sneed, I read that, notwithstanding the fact that uh, Senator Baker has uh, made a statement to the same effect previously because uh, I'm informed, not by telephone this time, but I'm informed that uh, the uh, acting attorney general is hopeful that I would uh, read this uh, on TV, and I'm uh, delighted to do so, and I regret uh, very much... Uh, the fact that I was so uh, unsuspicious uns and tr trusting that I accepted the telephone call at face value, I might add that I was prompted to do so in part because I thought that the information which the uh, spurious uh, phone call conveyed to me was the rational thing that should be done in this uh, direction. <laughs> And it's what I've been praying that uh, the White House would do, because it is so rational. <clears throat> Return uh, just a moment. What were the uh, thing, What were the circumstances that caused you to believe the CIA was so uh, involved? Well, there were a number of them. The first was that practically every, well, everybody involved in the uh, break-in and uh, the director, or one of the directors of the break-in, were all. CIA or ex-CIA people. Uh, the presence of a lawyer uh, who appeared on the scene uh, before there were any chance to make any telephone calls and the agency for which he works pointed in that direction. Uh, Mr. Hunt officed in that same agency. Mr. Liddy told me that they had been operating with CIA assistance. Uh, a person who is presently in the employ of the CIA, when I asked his opinion, indicated to me that uh, he would stake his life on the fact that the CIA was involved. And there were some other matters that appeared, which I had a knowledge of, 
in my capacity as Assistant Attorney General. Uh, well, I, I would say that, that uh, indicated that go back goes back a long way. Uh, they had CIA identification on them. Uh, yeah. I, I believe that uh, about uh, shortly after the uh, the Watergate break-in occurred, there was some. Uh, speculation in the press to the effect that the CIA may have been involved. It's quite a bit yeah. of it. Now, I don't, um, you've been interrogated, I think, rather thoroughly by Mr. Hamilton for the committee, and I don't care to ask questions, but I do want to say something which puzzles me. Yes, sir. And that is this. I have always felt that the President of the United States not only had uh, very responsible constitutional and legal duties to perform for the country, but it also he had some responsibility to afford the country moral leadership. And uh, it appears here from all this testimony, and I think that you and I both know that shortly after this uh, tragedy happened, it was uh, stated in the news media that uh, five burglars had been caught in the Watergate in the Democratic National Headquarters, and that four of them had campaign funds, which had come from the committee to reelect the president in their pockets at the time they were apprehended in the burglary. And the thing that puzzles me, and I think puzzles the America, many of the American people, is why didn't somebody who was interested in the president and in his reelection tell the president that he hold a duty of moral leadership and that he ought to find out immediately, not after nine months, but immediately, how it happened that five burglars were caught in the headquarters of the opposition political party with four of them having his campaign funds donated to help his re-election in their pockets. Can you explain to me why there wasn't a, somebody connected with the committee to re-elect the president or somebody who had a responsible position in the White House who didn't suggest to the president why he should, should exercise that moral leadership and expose this shock in the event? I can't explain that, Mr. Chairman. I believe I'd better go and vote now. I might state that the only reason I know that this vote on is because I've received uh, my wife <laughs> advice that affect my vote to see. <laughs> The committee came back just before 5 o'clock and decided it was too late to continue. They adjourned until tomorrow. So today we heard from the third witness in two days who was so uncomfortable in his dealings with the Watergate cover-up that he tried to extricate himself as quickly as possible. If all the witnesses remember and report accurately their feelings about the cover-up, then the real question becomes how did the cover-up remain a secret as long as it did? Tomorrow we will see the questioning of Robert Marty and continue as the committee probes to determine just how much he knew and when and how he related to the other links in the chain of organization at the committee to re-elect the president. Jack Murphy of the Georgetown University Law Center here in Washington and Stephen Hess, author of five books on American politics, now a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, watched this confusing day of Watergate with us. But unlike the rest of us, I'm sure they're not the least bit confused. So beginning with you, Mr. Hess, clear it all up for us, please. Well, having listened in rather short order to Mr. Mitchell and Mr. LaRue La La and Mr. Mardian, it appears that no one quite remembers the same thing as anyone else remembered it. Mr. Mardian today had quite different remembrances of many events, different from Mr. Sloan and Mr. Stans and Mr. LaRue and Mr. Magruder and Mr. Mitchell and particularly Mr. Dean. This may be another example of what we've called in the past the Rashomon <coughs> effect. But another interpretation might be found in a political cartoon by the famous Thomas Nast, which appeared about a hundred years ago when he was 
exposing the Tweed Ring in New York City. All of the culprits were standing in a circle, and each one was pointing at the other, and the caption read, He did it. Well, the question of presidential involvement still is going to have to await the release of the tapes. But I do think that the committee continues to build a very strong case on the obstruction of justice grounds regarding the Watergate cover-up. Jack Murphy, this is your first time with us today. What are your comments on this day? Well, I was fascinated to uh, have the opportunity to watch as intently as watching in the studio permits one to do. And I thought I might uh, give you my impressions from a legal point of view of the uh, presentation made particularly by Mr. Mardian in response to the questioning, quite intense questioning, he uh, experienced at the hands of Assistant Majority Counsel Mr. Hamilton. I think Mr. Hamilton's examination was uh, very sharp, very good, employing that device uh, very effectively of contrasting what Mardian was saying with what the previous testimony of uh, earlier witnesses had been. Certainly sharpened it very, very uh, uh, clearly. I would compare it with the previous testimony, which did not give conflicts as, as sharp as these. But time and time again, it seemed to me Mr. Mardian was flatly denying that what Magruder or LaRue or Mitchell or Stans had said was correct and offering an alternative sharply distinguishable <coughs> pardon me, uh, position. Specifically, uh, on the critical point, which is still unanswered as to whether or not uh, these payments uh, for the burglary were authorized by Mr. Mitchell, it came a point uh, where uh, he said that uh, in Mitchell's presence, Mr. Magruder had said that the money for this purpose had been authorized by Mr. Mitchell, and uh, nobody at that point followed it up. We don't know whether Mr. Mitchell said, yes, I did, no, I didn't, or said nothing. This was the only flaw I would point out in Mr. Uh, Hamilton's cross-examination, or direct examination, if you like. There were a couple of places where the record was left fuzzy by the failure to follow up on uh, critical points. Two or three others <coughs> I could mention. Uh, Martin struck me as a strong witness in general, but there were several places where I thought uh, uh, more questioning was needed, more exploration. And I do hope the senators tomorrow will follow these points up, particularly, for example, his rather emotional statement, it seemed to me, that he wanted out of the Watergate and, quote, all of its ramifications. Why? Uh, mm -hmm. That seemed to me uh, odd. He, uh, he uh, offered several times the, the notion that he had uh, advised people to tell the truth. What prompted that advice? Uh, this came in line with questioning of uh, whether uh, he knew in advance uh, that such people as Magruder might uh, perjure themselves. Well, it was a voluntary statement on his part when he said he advised them to tell the truth. Usually yeah. you presume people will tell the truth. I've got to ask Steve Hess uh, one question. Uh, regular viewers of these uh, great moments and brilliance at this late hour know that a couple of nights ago you predicted that we were going to eventually hear the uh, White House tapes, and it looked like for a moment today that your, your prediction had come true. Do you stick with it at this stage of the game? Do you want to revise it? Do you think the hoax itself might even become pressure in kind of an interesting way? Perhaps it will. Certainly the, the editorial response around the country is building pressure for this. These are, uh, are read in the, in the White House. And the question, I think, to the American people has really gotten down to, to the matter that the president has the power and the evidence to clear this all up. If he doesn't do so, there is a strong presumption that there's something he wishes to hide. And I think that's the way the White House is going to have to think about the question, not in terms of separation of power or executive privilege. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Way back at the beginning of tonight's broadcast, four and a half hours ago, I did a report on the results of a survey we conducted today of 42 American newspapers. We wanted to know what they had said on their editorial pages about whether or not President Nixon should let the Urban Committee and the rest of us know what is on those White House tapes. Well, I won't go through the results in detail again other than to note that the overwhelming majority think the President should, in fact, accede to the Committee's wishes. The point that struck me about our survey was that the papers involved included those like the Nashville Tennessean, the Boise, Idaho Statesman, the Burlington, Iowa Hawkeye, and the Anniston, Alabama Star, the Los Angeles Times, the Des Moines Register Tribune, the Atlanta Constitution, the Christian Science Monitor, the Wall Street Journal, and the Dayton, Ohio Daily News, as well as those big bad establishment papers. It illustrates clearly to me at least, that this is no longer a constitutional or a legal question. It's a public relations. It's a public's right to know. It's a public confidence issue right now, pure and simple. The pressure is definitely building on the President as we await the decision he says he will announce on Monday. 
And as it does, it's becoming almost impossible to imagine how he can successfully withstand it and refuse to let us all, those of you who live in Boise, Idaho, and Anniston, Alabama, as well as in Washington, hear the truth those tapes may contain. In short, the next call to that phone booth in the caucus room may not be a hoax. For Robert McNeil and Peter Kay, I'm Jim Lara. Thank you and good night. From Washington, you've been watching gavel to gavel videotape coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. This coverage is made possible by grants for special events coverage from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Ford Foundation, and has been a production of NPACT, a division of the Greater Washington Educational Telecommunications Association. <laughs> The delivery to Mr. LaRue was made in two parts on two occasions. In December or January, after talking with Mr. Dean, I took approximately $40,000 in two envelopes to Mr. LaRue at his apartment at the Watergate. I lived two blocks away, and the delivery was made on my way home from work. Later, I was asked to return the remainder of the money. I again called Mr. LaRue, who again asked if I could deliver it to him at his apartment. On this occasion, before picking up the money, Mr. LaRue donned a pair of gloves and then said, I never saw you. At that point, I became more than a little suspicious. Frankly, after Mr. LaRue put on the gloves, I did not know what to say, so I said nothing. In the Senate of the United States, a resolution to establish a select committee of the Senate to conduct an investigation and study of the extent, if any, to which illegal, improper, or unethical activities were engaged in by any persons, acting individually or in combination with others, in the presidential election of 1972, or any campaign, canvas, or other activity related to it. From Washington, NPAC brings you gavel-to-gavel videotape coverage of today's hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here is NPAC senior correspondent Robert McNeil. Good evening. The committee returned today to the task of laboriously reconstructing the links in the chain that lead from Watergate to the White House. There were no startling revelations today and no hoax telephone calls. We heard from a young former White House aide who said H.R. Haldeman was aware that there was a campaign intelligence plan in April 1972. But Gordon Strawn, who was the link between the committee to re-elect and Haldeman in the White House, says he never knew the specific details of the plan beyond its $300,000 budget. And that left open the question of whether Haldeman knew what Liddy and company were getting into. Strawn's remarks came in an opening statement that the committee didn't have a chance to develop further. Strawn followed Robert Mardian, the former assistant attorney general and deputy campaign director, who said one of his tasks at the Justice Department was retrieving files of White House-ordered wiretaps from the FBI. Mardian had warned the president that FBI director J. Edgar Hoover could use the logs to create pressure on Mr. Nixon to let Hoover keep his job. On Monday, the committee should have a better idea of whether the President Nixon is going to turn over tapes of conversations he had with John Dean and others. At the close of today's session, MPAC correspondent Peter Kay asked Chief Counsel Sam Dash if it would be acceptable if the tapes were released to Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox. I don't think we would work through Mr. Cox. I think Mr. Cox is a Special Prosecutor who has an independent responsibility, I would assume, that Mr. Cox, in carrying out his responsibilities, would seek all of the evidence that he could in carrying out his responsibilities, and that would include these tapes. Um, uh, I think that we have an independent uh, right to have them as a coordinate branch of government, uh, which has the power of subpoena, uh, and the power of subpoena facts relevant to the resolution authorizing us to conduct this investigation. It has been clearly the position of our committee that the particular tapes that we're talking about as well as certain documentary evidence, do not fall within the uh, area of executive privilege, uh, no matter how you would define that. And I I would admit that that's a not clear area, but however you would define it, these things that we're seeking do not fall within it, and therefore we do not expect to have to um, 
uh, work through Mr. Cox, but independently through our own powers. Clark Malinoff, the Pulitzer Prize winning Washington Bureau Chief of the Des Moines Register Tribune, a national syndicated columnist, and for one year, special counsel and ombudsman to President Nixon, watched today's hearing session with us. Mr. Malinoff, what would you pinpoint as something to watch for as we see the hearings tonight? Well, I think that it's essential that one keep in mind that both Bob Mardian and Gordon Strawn, uh, the witnesses today, are lawyers and have both. Uh, the purpose of avoiding criminal prosecution and disbarment and have very cleverly tried to walk the line to avoid that uh, eventuality. And, uh, but in addition to that, uh, they, they try to uh, avoid involvement of others beyond what's already in the evidence at this stage. And, uh, it was interesting to me, uh, one of the most important things with regard to Clark McGregor's testimony, Clark McGregor's position as uh, director of the campaign. Uh, Clark McGregor was the spokesman during the crucial period last fall. He put out a l large number of false, inaccurate statements. Mardian tells us that he tried to warn Clark McGregor during that crucial period of time and that Clark McGregor rather than accepting this and listening to it, shut him off by saying, I, want, I was told that there was no one over here involved when I took the job. Uh, I don't want to know anything else. And so we get, and we get a lot more detail of that conversation. That's uh, right. Tonight. There will be a considerable detail on that. And I think it's quite significant because Clark McGregor's role has largely been one uh, that has not been tarnished up to this point. All right. Clark Molinoff will be back at the close of tonight's broadcast to discuss this and other points in more detail. He'll be joined then by David Epstein, a Washington attorney and adjunct professor of law at the Georgetown University Law Center here in Washington. The president returned to the White House from Bethesda Naval Hospital today, said he expected to go back on a regular schedule after a weekend at Camp David. He termed speculation that he would quit poppycock. And in London today, former White House domestic chief John Ehrlichman added his voice to the chorus suggesting the president should release the Watergate-related tapes recorded within the White House. Today was a relatively short one for the committee, but there are still several hours of testimony to sort through. Here is our regular preview of what happens when. In the first hour, Robert Mardian continues his testimony, saying that his oath as an attorney prevented him from passing along information Liddy told him when he was a lawyer for the committee to re-elect. And Mardian tells of retrieving sensitive surveillance logs of White House-ordered telephone taps after being warned that FBI Director Hoover could use them as a club to hold on to his job. Under questioning in the second hour, Mardian admits that Liddy was involved in the administration's handling of the Pentagon Papers case. And Mardian says the president told him that his entire ability to govern could be jeopardized if news leaks continued. In the third hour, Mardian tells of his frustration when he tried to see campaign director Clark McGregor in July 1972 to warn him that aides were involved in Watergate. McGregor wouldn't talk with him. And Mardian says that during his years at the Justice Department, the Internal Security Division never requested any wiretaps for domestic intelligence purposes. Strawn introduces himself in the fourth hour and relates how Magruder called him from Florida to say the committee had a sophisticated intelligence system. But, says Strawn, he never learned of the specifics before the break-in. And after that event, he recalls, he tried to talk with Magruder, who was then in California, but was rebuffed when Magruder said he'd already discussed the whole situation with H.R. Haldeman. And now Senator Irvin is about to begin today's hearings and allow the Mardian testimony to continue. You're the next man, I think. All right. Send to Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm sure you won't mind, and surely the witness won't mind, if I inject a brief preliminary note of levity into the proceedings this morning after our sad experience with the hoax phone call yesterday. I overheard the press corps remark that the real Alex Butterfield is in Tijuana. 
<laughs> Bound in tape. Mr. Mardian, <clears throat> you've just. I'd just, you, like, um, I'd just like to say, uh, to quote the scriptures again, it's, it's, stated, it's stated in the book of uh, Proverbs that a merry heart, such as that the son of the baker possesses, doeth the good like a medicine. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad medicine. <laughs> Mr. Morgan, you've gone over your testimony, as other witnesses have, in great length, and there has been an exhaustive examination by counsel for the committee and members of the committee. I am today going to limit my questions fairly severely and try to impose on myself about a 10-minute rule without suggesting to committee members that we invoke any such rule. I intend to do that just for the sake of trying to move through the testimony. It is clear, Mr. Morgan, that there are certain essential conflicts in your testimony and that of Mr. Dean. There are other apparent conflicts in between your testimony and that of Mr. Stans. Let's talk about the Dean testimony for a moment. Do you have any idea when you last talked to Mr. Dean and about what? And more particularly, do you have any recollection of having discussed your testimony or his testimony that would be given before this committee? I don't know that I've talked to John Dean since I left Washington on November the 10th. It's possible I saw him during the inaugural ceremonies, but I have not discussed with him my testimony nor he his testimony with me. Have you read the opening statement that Mr. Dean filed with and read to the committee? I, I believe that I read, uh, I don't think I read the entire transcript, but I may have. It's been some time. Are there any other points in the Dean testimony or the Magruder testimony or the Stans testimony that you feel do not portray an event in the same way that you recall it? You've identified some, but based on your information about those witness yes. testimony, are there any other important, significant events on which you have a different or contrary view? I would have to go over his testimony and his opening statement. But there are none that come to mind at the moment as being particularly significant or outstanding. Not that I can think of. There may be some significant ones. Rather than ask you to go over that testimony now, the opening statement of Mr. Dean, of course, was over 240 pages. And the Magruder testimony was rather extensive, as was the Stan's testimony. Would you be agreeable, Mr. Meridian, to reviewing those three pieces of testimony and the testimony of Mr. Mitchell, that would make four, and note for this record in a letter later any other important and significant uh, discrepancies discrepancies in that they don't accord with your recollection of events about which you have knowledge? Yes, if I'm furnished with transcripts, I don't have them. I don't believe. Uh, no, I don't have Would them. you be agreeable to returning, if necessary, to expound further on any such points? Yes, said? sir. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that a copy of the testimony of Mr. Dean, Mr. Magruder, Mr. Stans, and Mr. Mitchell be supplied to the witness and that he may be permitted to supply to the committee as a late filed exhibit any such uh, uh, notations as he pleases with the understanding that the committee may ask him to return to comment yeah, on those. Mr. Rue also, I think, Mr. Pardon? Mr. Rue also. And Mr. LaRue, the five. <coughs> Without objection on the part of any member of the committee, the, the staff will comply with the request of the vice chairman. Now, I'm not placing any time limitation on that, Mr. Mardian, but Obviously, we want to move as fast as we reasonably can. So 
If you could supply that information as promptly as you can, we'd be grateful. And you need not complete it before you send any particular portions of it. You can send it as you do complete it. And uh, the staff will work out with you the details on how that should be done. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Now, while you were at the Justice Department, Mr. Mardian, did you have any dealings with Mr. Liddy? Yes. Are you aware of the so-called plumber's operation at the White House in which Mr. Liddy was apparently involved? I wasn't aware of the plumber's operation until after the uh, Watergate break-in, and I recall uh, a reporter from the — from Time magazine, I believe, who — asked me uh, if I was aware of the plumbers, and I said I didn't, I wasn't aware of them. Uh, I hadn't heard the word. He said, you must have. They had a sign on the door called the plumbers, and I said, well, I didn't go by that door. I, uh, but you are not aware of the term the plumbers or of the function of that group within the White House while you were at Justice or prior to the events in which they were engaged? No, sir. Did you ever talk to Mr. Liddy about anything that you now identify as being part of the plumber's operation? Explain the nature of your dealings with Liddy and Justice. Uh, no, sir. Uh, my first meeting with Mr. Liddy, and I don't think I was aware that he was a Mr. Liddy at the time, was when I uh, arbitrated a treaty between the Justice Department, the FBI, and the Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms Division, and uh, the staffs uh, of the two agencies, uh, the Bureau and the agency, came to my office and because of the conflict in jurisdiction over the bombing statute that had been enacted, where Congress gave joint investigative jurisdiction to the Bureau and the Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms Division, that had resulted in a uh, sort of a jurisdictional dispute. Uh, Mr. Sullivan was a friend of mine. Mr. Rosides was a friend of mine. And uh, they made me aware of the conflict. I suggested they come to my office, or they suggested it. I don't know. But we sat down over a period of a day or two and worked out a six-month agreement, uh, which we called a treaty, whereby uh, they would try to operate under uh, to divide up the types of cases each would investigate. Mr. Liddy was a part of that group, as I recall. And did you have dealings with Mr. Liddy in that connection? I don't think so. My dealings were mainly with Mr. Rosides, Secretary Rosides, and uh, Mr. Sullivan, uh, who was then the Associate Director of the FBI. Were you at that time Assistant Attorney General for Internal Security Affairs? Yes, sir. Did you ever have any conversations with Mr. Gray or with his predecessor, Mr. Hoover, about uh, any matter relevant to this inquiry? To this inquiry? Yes, sir. No, sir. <clears throat> I note that Mr. Dean states that I believe in an executive session, I'm not sure it was uh, discussed fully in the public record, but on June 16th, 1973, I believe, Mr. Dean said that you uh, Mr. Parkinson, O'Brien, and Chapin Strong went over certain FBI reports and that uh, you were critical of the FBI or the so-called Gray investigation. Uh, I have no recollection of ever meeting with Mr. Strawn. Uh, I told the committee staff that I was aware that Mr. Dean did have FBI reports. Uh, the only uh, document that I'm aware of, uh, it was either shown to me or read to me, and I believe it was read to me by Mr. Dean, and it was an FBI uh, teletype uh, from Mr. Gray to, I believe, all of the FBI offices uh, in connection with the investigation of Watergate. Did you ever talk to Mr. Hoover? While yes. you were Assistant Attorney General for Internal yes. Security? Yes, sir. Did you ever talk to him about the plumbers group or internal security functions being carried on by the White House? No, sir. Did you ever talk to him about the White House staff and their relationship to the FBI or the Department of Justice? No, sir. Not to mine. Did he ever talk to you? No, sir.
If Mr. Hoover had been aware of the plumbers group, I think uh, we would have heard about it. Are you aware that at one time there was a good bit of talk about Mr. Hoover retiring or resigning as director? Yes. Do you have any personal knowledge or conversation with Mr. Hoover about that situation? No, sir. Do you have any idea why the White House did take over some of what I would think of as internal security operations instead of leaving it in your department or with the FBI? It would be pure speculation. You have no basis of knowledge, basis for knowledge, basis of knowledge. It would be pure speculation on my part, Senator. Would you care to speculate? If you prefer not to, I'm a, it's all right. But if you would care to, I'd be happy to have it as long as that speculation is based on your perception of the attitude, the relationships, or any facts known to you. If, if you think that would be helpful to the record, we'd be happy to have it. I can only say that uh, they apparently lack confidence in our ability to do the job. Our ability, meaning the Justice Department's ability? Yes, sir. Meaning the Internal Security Division, the Federal Bureau of Investigation? Well, if it fell within the gambit of the Internal Security Division, yes, sir. Well, do you have any reason to think there was a lack of confidence that led the White House to take independent action? Well, that's the basis of my speculation. I can't think of any other reason for creating a, such a group. Did anybody ever tell you that or intimate that, or did you infer that from any other facts or circumstances at the time? I'm only inferring that from what the revelations that have come out now. We had a FBI, a good FBI. We had... Uh, a good Justice Department. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, well, I just drew the conclusion that if they felt they had to do what they were doing, they had, they had a lack of confidence in us. Did you sense any resentment in your department, or did you resent the uh, transfer, apparent transfer, of these functions in part to White House staff? Or do you have any now? I had no knowledge of any transfer of any functions from the Justice Department to the White House. Mr. Marty, in my 10 minutes has expired. I have other questions, and I'll return to that later on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Talmadge. Mr. Marty and I also will attempt to be brief in order to expedite the hearings as rapidly as possible. There are a few questions that I have for clarification. Did you ask Mr. LaRue if he had known about the break-in ahead of time? I can't recall any specific time I said, Fred, did you know about it ahead of time until after these hearings started? Did he tell you he did? I asked him, I believe uh, he called me and uh, told me that he was going to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and uh, I, I asked him on that occasion, I said, Fred, did you know about it ahead of time? And he said yes. Did you ask him if John knew? Uh, pardon me, I don't think the question that I asked him about wasn't specifically about the break-in itself. Did he know about the activities? And he said yes. Did you ask him if John knew? Yes, sir. What was his response? I have... I may be mistaken as to what he said at the time. I said, my next question, as I recall it at that time, was did John know about it ahead of time? He said, yes. And you were referring to John Mitchell? Yes. I then said, what does John say? He said, John says no. Now, subsequently, after my appearance before, I believe, the grand jury, I talked to Fred. He called me and asked me about what had transpired with reference to him. And I said, they asked me if I had talked to you. They asked me about everybody I had talked to. And as I believe, the only person I had talked to was Fred LaRue. I related what I just told you, and Fred said, my God, you didn't say that, did you? And I said, yes. 
And he said, Bob, I don't think I said that. Now, I could be mistaken, uh, but that I'm giving you my best recollection. Now, you were all close confidants of the high White House officials and the president himself. You personally held a high position in the Department of Justice with the responsibility of upholding the laws of the country. Why did you involve yourself in a cover-up of the Watergate? Mr. Mitchell testified the reason he did it was because he was afraid the president would lower the boom, others because they assumed the White House itself had approved this operation. What was your reason, Mr. Marty? Senator, I, I don't know what you mean by cover-up. If you mean by cover-up my not being forthcoming, and disclosing everything I knew, I felt that my oath as an attorney prevented me from doing that. Now, let me ask you another question. I believe you and Mr. Magruder and Mr. Mitchell were all together on June the 19th, as I recall, and there was something said about $40,000. Magruder, I believe, made the statement and asked Mr. Mitchell if he didn't approve the $250,000 budget for the espionage activities. Did Mr. Mitchell answer in the affirmative? Pardon me, you say June the 19th? Or sometime thereabout, or at any date that you can recall. I'm not so much interested in the date as I am the subject matter of the conversation and the response. The date was, I believe, subsequent to that was probably the latter part of that week. I think it was the 23rd or 4th. I asked Mr. Magruder in the presence of Mr. Mitchell how much money he had given to Mr. Liddy. He said he had given Mr. Liddy or had authorized Mr. Sloan to give Mr. Liddy $40,000. I must have registered a surprise and said $40,000. And Mr. Mitchell, uh, did much the same, and he turned to Mr. Mitchell and he said, well, that's not much out of the total budget of $250,000. Mr. Mitchell's answer was, but the campaign hasn't even started yet. Now, that's the best of my recollection of that conversation. You understood that declaration on the part of Mr. Mitchell to mean that he had approved the $250,000 operation, did you not, these espionage activities? If you want my, I don't know that the thought crossed my mind that Mr. Mitchell authorized the 250,000. Based on the conversation I heard, uh, I would assume that Mr. Mitchell, that not having denied uh, that statement, uh, acquiesced in it. His, his response wasn't, I didn't authorize 250. His response was, the campaign hasn't started yet. Let me ask you something. Senator Baker touched on the periphery, but I don't think he covered it in detail. Did you make a trip in July of 1971 by courier plane to see the President of the United States in San Clemente, San Clemente California? Yes, sir. At the President's request? Yes, sir. What was the reason for that trip? Prior to my making that trip, Mr. William Sullivan, Associate Director of the FBI, came to see me, told me he wanted to talk to me about a very sensitive matter. He told me that, uh, and he, I guess, had expressed this to me for some period of time, he and Mr. Hoover uh, were not getting along very well. He anticipated his, his removal as Associate Director, and in that, at that time, uh, he was, in effect, the operating head of the FBI other than Mr. Hoover, he told me that there were some very sensitive national security surveillance logs that were not, I, I believe he used the word in channel, I don't know that he did, but they were not kept in the ordinary course of business. They were kept in his safe, in his office. He felt that the highly sensitive nature of these 
tapes were such that they should not be kept there, especially if he were to be removed from office. He was concerned about what might be done with these tapes, uh, and I am not positive of this. Uh, I don't know what Mr. Sullivan's recollection is. Uh, my recollection is that Mr. Hoover might use these tapes uh, for the purpose of preserving his position as director of the FBI. And he felt that the White House should be aware of this. I told him that I would convey this information to the Attorney General. And what was the President's direction? I didn't talk to the President at that time. I merely told the Attorney General of my conversation. Didn't you go out to see the President himself? It was subsequent to that. I had not heard from the Attorney General. I had in several inquiries from Mr. Sullivan, and I said I had done what I said I would do. Subsequent to that time, and I don't know the date, I got a call, I believe it was on a Sunday, and the call was from the Western White House. I think it was Mr. Ehrlichman, it may have, missed, may have been Mr. Haldeman. Uh, they told me that the President would like to talk to me, that, and whether it would be convenient for me to take the courier plane, the mail plane goes back and forth from Andrews to uh, El Toro Marine Base, I believe on a regular daily basis, it goes one day and comes the other. Would I be able to take the courier plane that day uh, so that I would be available to see the President the following morning? I said I would. I went to Andrews and I took that courier plane. And what did the President tell you to do with it? Please. <coughs> Pardon me. You want the conversation with the president? I want to find out what the president directed you to do with these reports that Sullivan had. He directed me to obtain the reports from Mr. Sullivan and deliver them to Mr. Ehrlichman. And did you do so? Yes, sir. And what did those tapes concern? The tapes concerned electronic surveillance authorized by the President, I was told at the request of the Director of the National Security Council. And what's happened to them? Are they still in the White House? I understand from news reports that they're in the possession of the Bureau. The reason at that time was to keep Mr. Hoover from having access to these records? I, I think I've related what I was told, and uh, you'll have to draw your own conclusion from that, Senator. That was what Sullivan told you and what you reported to the President? Yes, sir. Now, you've testified that you tried to commit, uh, to, to quit your committee assignment, that is, the committee to re-elect the President at least three times, but were induced to stay on. How you, were you induced to stay on? By persuasion. By whom? By Mr. Mitchell and others. Why did you want to leave? After the disclosures that were made to be my, by Mr. Liddy, uh, I just felt I did not, uh, could not adequately uh, represent the committee. I, as I said, I've never practiced criminal law, and uh, I've never had disclosures of that type ever made to me. You felt like you'd had enough. Is that the reason? I was placed in a very difficult position. I can understand that. Now, you also testified that you felt that it was blackmail for Mr. Bittman to ask for $25,000 more. Why did you feel that it was blackmail? I only meant that, Senator, and I, there's two connotations you put on it. That happened to be my immediate reaction. It seemed like an excessive fee to represent a person who uh, 
uh, was charged with a burglary. How many uh, of these people did Mr. Bittman represent? I believe one person. And what was the total amount paid to him? I don't know. I didn't know the 25000 had been paid to him until these... I think it was several different sums. Folks, 100000 is my record. $157,000 I'm informed. I agree with you that that was grossly excessive fee for representing one burglar. Council, <laughs> Council suggests that I answer my question that I didn't even know he had obtained the $25,000 until these proceedings commenced. Yes, sir. These thank, hearings. thank you very much, Mr. Martin. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Marty, and I suppose there were three issues involved in this sad affair. One, the planning of the break-in and the bugging, the cover-up, and whether or not the President of the United States was involved in any of this. As I understand from your testimony, you were, in your own words, the attorney for the committee here for a few weeks following the break-in until you disengaged from those duties and went to political duties. To the extent that I could disengage. Yes. Uh, and during that time, of course, you had a number of conferences with a great many people who have become, uh, shall we say, leading characters in Watergate and also, of course, have been witnesses before the committee and there are still others to follow. My question is, is this, do you know of your own knowledge who authorized the Watergate break-in and bugging? No, I do not. Other than Mr. Liddy, did anybody during this time, or any other time for that matter, give you any piece of information at all about who authorized the uh, planning of the bugging and break-in of Watergate? Other than Mr. Liddy? Other than Mr. Liddy. No, I heard a lot of speculation, Senator, but I... Uh, nothing Did that anyone could put their finger on. Mr. Mitchell never <clears throat> revealed anything about this? No, sir. Or Mr. Magruder? No, sir. Or Mr. LaRue? No, sir. Or Mr. Haldeman? No, I didn't talk to Mr. Holder. Or Mr. Ehrlichman? Didn't talk to Mr. Ehrlichman. Or Mr. Colson? I didn't talk to Mr. Colson. Mr. Dean? Talked to Mr. Dean. Did he reveal anything about who might have uh, authorized the planning and break-in of Watergate? No, Mr. Dean used to conjecture with me as to where it was and where it led. Let us go back to the meeting with Liddy, because that obviously is a very key and important meeting. Uh, you really are the only witness so far who has given us any information on what Mr. Liddy has said, who was a key figure uh, in Watergate, because he's refused to testify either before the committee or to anyone else for that matter. And I'd like to go back to that Liddy meeting and ask you about two of the pieces of testimony that you gave the committee. One, as I recall it yesterday, Mr. Liddy told you that Watergate was an ongoing project that had the full authority of the president. Was that your testimony? No, I don't believe I said the Watergate, sir. Uh, I said that the operations of the group in which he was working uh, had been an ongoing operation of which Watergate was one. Uh, now, what did he mean by the group with which he was working? Did he tell you who that group was? Well, it came about uh, with reference to a question that I asked uh, concerning the, as I recall, the, the bungling effort. Uh, you may recall some of the newspaper accounts. and. Uh, it was then that he said that uh, he was working with pros, men of uh, considerable experience, that uh, this was just one of their jobs. They had done many, and 
they had all been successful. Uh, I presume from that that they were the same group, in other words, the ones that were caught, and along with Mr. Hunt. Did he mention any names? No, sir. Not even the name of Mr. Hunt? Well, yes. Other, you, I thought you meant other than the... What did he say about Hunt? Uh, that uh, he had high regard for Mr. Hunt. Uh, as I think I've testified that Mr. Hunt was... Uh, this was the type of business he'd been engaged in all his life. He was the chief planner, as I recall, for the Bay of Pigs invasion. But, uh, These are things he told you at that meeting? Yes, sir. What about uh, McCaw? Did he say anything about him? No, I don't. Uh, other than the fact that uh, uh, he had violated his instructions in hiring Mr. McCord that his instructions were not to hire anyone uh, connected with the committee. Who gave him those instructions? I believe he said Mr. Magruder. It seemed rather incongruous to me for him to have said that because he was an employee of the committee and Mr. Hunt was an employee of the committee, was uh, apparently an employee of the White House. Uh, that is what he said. Your recollection is that he said that Mr. Magruder told him not to hire Mr. McCord? That's my best recollection. Well, not Mr. McCord, not to hire anyone that had any connection with uh, uh, the committee or the White House. And uh, I recall that because it seemed a little incongruous with he and Mr. Hunt and Bowl. Could you amplify any further about these instructions by Magruder? Uh, what instructions was he talking about from Mr. Magruder? I don't recall any other uh, instructions uh, other than his statement that uh, he and Mr. Hunt had not wanted to go into the Watergate and that he had done so only at the insistence of Mr. Magruder. That was his statement. Why did he say he didn't want to do go into Watergate? I think that was in response to my question, that it seemed like a very foolish adventure that uh, uh, didn't make any sense to break into the Democratic National Committee headquarters. Now, did you discuss both break-ins? There were two, of course, one that went undetected and the second one that was detected. Only to the extent that, as I recall, what, his, what he told me was that they had placed the bug in the wrong office. That's my best recollection. And from that, then the instructions of Magruder were to correct that error. Is that your testimony? I don't recall his having said that, uh, but th that's what he stated the purpose of the entry was. Now, now back again to the instructions from <coughs> Magruder. Uh, in all this discussion with Mr. Liddy, you were talking about the Watergate. Isn't that correct? And you would assume that that's what instructions meant. Is that correct? Yes, sir. You weren't discussing any other venture? Not at that point. Not at, at this time that we're talking about. This discussion of the other adventures came up later. Now, let, let's go back to this uh, authority of, of the president. Will, will you discuss that more? Because that's extremely important. Here is Liddy's testimony, the only testimony we have. I, uh, I might say I, I haven't been asked to speculate. I didn't put any credence in that when he told me any more than I did in his statement that he shredded $100 bills. I've tried to relate as factually as I can what he told me. Mm -hmm. Did you inquire of him, Mr. Marty, and now uh, Liddy, uh, what, what do you mean about authority from the president? Uh, did you go into that at all with him and interrogate him on that? No, Senator. I, uh, I told the staff, uh, I, I guess I could have been a better interrogator had I not been in shock. And I, I think I said, and as counsel points out, I cannot recall his using the word president. Mm -hmm. I did testify that it was the words he used were clearly meant to imply that, and that's the way I understood it. 
that you don't actually recall whether he mentioned the name or not, or the title. No, sir. There is another uh, part of that testimony that I think is extremely important, too, that you testified to yesterday, and that was that the budget that Mr. Liddy had it was approved by John Mitchell, director of the campaign to reelect the president, and the White House. Would you go into that further? Because that's a very important piece of testimony, too. That's all I can tell you, Senator. Uh, again, uh... did he say he had discussed the budget with John Mitchell? I use the term budget. Uh, he may have said uh, the financing of the operation. I, 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 I use of the word budget uh, uh, may have been uh, wrong. Uh, the general. I've tried to recall as best I can the conversation. I, re I remember that one better than most because uh, so of the, shocking. the disclosures that were made. I know it's hard to remember a year back, but those were two very important pieces of information. He may not story. have said budget. He may have said it was financed with the approval of Mr. Mitchell in the White House. Uh, he may not have said budget. I just... Uh, but again, on that score, did you ask him at all about... Uh, well, when did John Mitchell approve this? No, sir. Did he approve it personally? I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm asking questions that you might have asked him, and I'm just uh, asking if you asked them. Senator, at the time uh, he was telling me these things, I wasn't, I wasn't believing much of it. Uh, I was taking it as a, a defensive statements uh, justifying his conduct. I see. And so you, you didn't probe that at all? I don't think I did. And what about uh, the business about the White House approving either the budget or the money or the operation? Uh, did you ask who in the White House uh, approved it? No, sir. After he uh, implied to me if he didn't say the president, I didn't think there was uh, any further up, any higher to go than that. Uh, and was it also during this meeting that uh, he said that uh, if it's necessary, assassinate me. Is that right? I had forgotten this until Mr. LaRue testified to it. But he did say, uh, as I recall now, that uh, that uh, he would never talk. He would take the Fifth Amendment. And that we, if we didn't have confidence in that, that he would make himself a, He did say that he uh, was morally opposed to suicide, uh, but that if we would designate a particular street corner for him to stand on, he would make himself available to be shot, killed, or assassinated. Uh, Mr. LaRue used the term assassinated, and I used it maybe because of that, but that was what he said. What was your reaction to that? Uh, much the same reaction to everything else he told me that day. That his credibility would be in question with you. It was a very bizarre story. I had never heard one like it before in my life. And it's all I can, it's the only way I can characterize it. Just one final series of questions, which I've been asking many of the witnesses. Have you ever had any meeting or conversation with President Nixon? on this Watergate affair this year or last year? No, sir. Never a single one? Never. Have you ever heard anybody say, anybody in the committee to reelect the president or outside of the committee to reelect the president in the White House or, or elsewhere, that they knew anything about, any bit or piece of information about whether the president knew about Watergate or knew about the cover-up? No, sir. Never in any of your conversations with Mitchell or any of these other people? No, sir. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Senator, he knows the way. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mardian. 
In the early days of our proceedings, Mr. McCord testified that he had received special information from your internal security division. Is that correct, sir? I wouldn't describe it as special, Senator. He, as I understand it, did receive information from the interdivisional information unit of the Justice Department. What was the nature of the information? The I don't I wasn't at the briefings. Uh, I feel confident it was confined to information relating to the potential for civil disorder at the Republican National Convention. Was this information available to the public? It was available under the guidelines to any entity that might be the subject of uh, violent civil disorder and the appropriate people that should know uh, uh, of, the, of the potential so that they might assess it. Did your internal security division uh, ever conduct investigations of congressional or senatorial candidates? No, sir. We were not an operational division. Did you ever conduct investigations of members of Congress? No, sir. We, uh, as I say, uh, there's been some misunderstanding uh, in some of the testimony. Uh, the, well, I'm giving the, you the opportunity. The divisions do sir. not have an operational function, sir. Now, where did you get the information that you imparted to Mr. McCord if you weren't the operational arm? IDIU obtains, I would guess, and I've t so testified, over 80 percent of its information from newspapers, young people. It started out as a summer group in, the in 1967. There were uh, young people, uh, college students. Uh, it was uh, under the auspices, or it was initiated by Ramsey Clark in response to the uh, Kerner Commission report. I would say that and I've testified, 80 percent of it was public information that they put together. Other information came from the Federal Bureau of Investigation and uh, other agencies, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, if they were aware of something, uh, if uh, local police uh, would supply information, if it related to anything which the federal government might become involved in, in other words, jurisdictional. As a member of the and an important member of the Justice Department. Were you ever aware that any division within the department had ever conducted investigations of members of Congress? Not to my knowledge. Are you certain that in your conversations with Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Mitchell never discussed his knowledge of the pre-Watergate meetings with you? Never, sir. Did Mr. Mitchell ever suggest to you that he had discussed the Watergate problem with the President of the United States? Never. Did he ever suggest to you that he had lied to the President of the United States? Never. You're considered very close to Mr. Mitchell. I believe your profile maintains that he is your sponsor, and you've never discussed anything this important? I didn't realize I had a profile that said he was my sponsor. Well, maybe that's the wrong word to use here. But is your testimony there that at no time you discuss Watergate together? Mr. Mitchell and I? Yes. Oh, yes. I talked about Watergate with him quite often. I thought you were referring to discussing that whether he discussed and in your discussions, did he ever tell you that he discussed this matter with the President of the United States? No, he never disclosed to me any discussion uh, that I can recall with the President of the United States uh, on any subject. There may have been, uh, but uh, none comes to mind. In the early days of our proceedings, it was suggested that the major reason for the Watergate break-in was national security. And Mr. McCord and others suggested that 
information was possibly available in the headquarters uh, which would indicate that members of the Democratic Party in concert with foreign powers were out to destroy the country or to do damage. In all of your service in the United States Justice Department of Justice, uh, do you know of any incidents where members of the Democratic Party uh, constituted a national security problem to the United States of America? May I uh, answer your question and then respond to it, sir? Please do, sir. I know of no information that was ever uh, brought to my attention that anybody in the Democratic Party uh, was sponsored by any foreign power or that they posed any threat at all uh, in the form of violence or otherwise to the to the uh, Republican Party or the security of the United States. Now, if I may respond to your prefatory statement, you indicated, and I am surprised this question hasn't been asked yet, you indicated that Mr. McCord came to these conclusions based upon information he obtained from the Justice Department. His testimony was he didn't obtain any information until the latter part of May. And yet, he also testified that he was involved with these people in a break-in sometime in the early part of May, or uh, I believe it was on May the 3rd? May 30th. And yet, his own testimony is he didn't obtain any information uh, well, there was a break in May the 30th. So he had it before then. Well, he was uh, involved, as I understand it, with these people before that time. And uh, there certainly could not have been any information conveyed to him. The information uh, apparently conveyed to the people from Florida was that. Uh, information was available in the Democratic National Committee to indicate that members of the party were constituted a national security problem. And I, I, I didn't hear that testimony, and I'm sure he never got any such information from the J Department of Justice. Well, we've been waiting for some response from the department. Uh, we have submitted a request as to this national security problem. I don't suppose we've ever received it, but uh, it's your testimony as former head of the Internal Security Division, that members of the party did not constitute a national security Absolutely problem. not. And I have never heard any responsible official uh, in the Department of Justice suggest that. We've heard much about the White House horror stories from Mr. Mitchell, and I believe you related to some. Are there any other horror stories other than the Watergate, Dita Byrd, Ellsberg break-in? No, as I said, if I had interrogated Mr. Liddy further, I might have found out some more, but... Uh, I'm asking you this because uh, Mr. Mitchell suggested that this was just a tip of an iceberg. Mr. Mitchell may be privy to more knowledge than I am, sir. Miss Vicki Shern secretary to Jeb Stewart Magruder suggested that Mr. Liddy, Mr. Magruder, Mr. Mardian, Mr. LaRue had a series of meetings in May of 1972. Do you recall a series of meetings with Mr. Magruder, Mr. LaRue, and Mr. Liddy? No, sir, and whoever made that statement uh, has got me mixed up with somebody else. If I had a series of meetings with Mr. Liddy, I would have recalled them. What about Mr. Magruder or Mr. LaRue? Well, I saw them quite often. I didn't have a series of meetings with Mr. Magruder and Mr. LaRue in May, to my knowledge, uh, but uh, I, I just came to the committee in May. Did you discuss uh, electronic surveillance or intelligence gathering at these N meetings? Never. Uh, you say at these meetings. I don't admit to being present at any such meetings. One final question, sir. Many of us are impressed by your legal background. Your biographical sketch indicates that you had the highest grades ever 
for a first-year student in law school. You did very well as a corporate lawyer. And apparently, your experience in the Justice Department uh, singled you out as almost Mr. Law and Order. And now I quote from your statement. If I make no other point in this prefatory statement, I want it in the record that as of the morning of June 17, 1972, I was relieved of my political responsibilities to the extent possible and charged with the responsibility of acting as counsel to the committee, at least as far as Watergate was concerned. Then you have a very interesting statement on the following page. Commencing the morning of June 17, when you became a lawyer, Information was imparted to me bit by bit, much of it contradictory, which drew me inexorably into an intolerable and at times unbearable situation of personal conscience, a situation in which I was precluded from acting according to the dictates of my personal desires or interests, a situation in which ultimately my only hope was the selfish one of not becoming implicated in the conduct of others who I felt my duty to serve. Are you trying to suggest that as a lawyer, the advice and counsel that you provided your clients was not according to the <clears throat> dictates of your personal desires or interests? No, sir, and I don't think I don't want to be condemnatious. I don't think that's a fair reading. It may be uh, to me. It says you were precluded from acting according to the dictates of your personal conscience. Yes, sir. My conscience is one thing, and the ethics of my profession demanded at that time something else. Uh, at the time I obtained the information. Does the ethics of your profession require you to tell your clients to lie? I don't think that that statement indicates that, sir. What I was trying to indicate was that Mr. Liddy imparted information to me on June the 21st, which had it been imparted to me less than two months before, I would have had him arrested. I was a former assistant attorney general of the United States. My boss was a former attorney general of the United States. My best friend was the attorney general of the United States. And he was imparting information to me that indicated not only that crime, but a series of other crimes perpetrated by people in the White House that I had worked for. Now, that's all I was trying to say by being drawn inexorably into a situation of personal conscience. Even if you felt that these activities were, had the potential of hurting the President of the United States, you decided that the ethics of your profession required you to keep a lid on? Senator, I, I made, I gave a man my word under my oath that he could confide in me. I was, I thought I was just investigating one crime. He imparted to me knowledge of other felonies. And as I read my oath, I was duty-bound not to disclose that confidence. And had I gone to the authorities that day and told them what Mr. Liddy had told me, I think I probably would have been subject to disciplinary action, severe disciplinary action. So I say I, I've never practiced criminal law. I don't know uh, how people react to these situations. They carry these things in their mind. They can't disclose it. Uh, this was unbearable to me. If the ethics of your profession prevented you from disclosing the information imparted to you by Mr. Liddy, why did you discuss this with Mr. Mitchell? I made that a precondition to my taking this, his information in confidence. Did you discuss this with Mr. Magruder? No, sir. Or I with never discussed else? it with anyone else but Mr. Mitchell. And was Mr. Mitchell precluded by some 
ethics to keep that to himself? Mr. Mitchell will have to speak for himself on that. I, I don't wish to pass judgment. Were you given the formal title of counsel to the committee on June the 17th? I don't believe it's formal. I, I appear, I believe, on the pleadings as uh, counsel to the committee. At that time, it was your belief that you were personal counsel to Mr. Liddy? No, sir, and I so explained it to him. I was counsel for the committee, and he was an employee of the committee. I told him that as the employee of the committee, he could speak to me in confidence, although I, he could not retain me as his personal attorney, and that I would hold his confidence inviolate. And even if this information had a potential of injuring your major client, the committee, you kept it to yourself? I did not keep it to myself. I told it to the head of the committee, and that was the reason I insisted on that condition. But it is your testimony that if this had been received two months ago, you would have arrested him. I wouldn't have been in a position of being his attorney two months ago. I would have been assistant attorney general two months ago. And you would have arrested him? Well, I would. I would have taken whatever procedures were necessary to see that he was brought to justice. I thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In a moment, Senator Lowell Weicker will probe Mardian's duties at the Justice Department, including a role in the Pentagon Papers case. For now, we're going to take a break. Public television's coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington... NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. As we go back to the hearing, Senator Weicker is about to question Robert Mardian. Mr. Mardian, yesterday in your testimony, you indicated that when you went to the Miami Convention, You suggested to, I think, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. McGregor and maybe others, that you wanted to have a memorandum or that you would be glad to write a memorandum setting forth your knowledge of this matter and that you were subsequently ordered not to write such a memorandum. Now, if, there, if there's a different paraphrase of this, you tell me what it is. Oh, I think you're referring to a conversation I had with Mr. Mitchell prior to that time. Prior to the Miami Convention? Yes, I suggested that memorandum to Mr. Mitchell. And then subsequently, am I correct, you were ordered not, not to prepare such a memorandum? Yes, sir. Who ordered you? Mr. Mitchell. Well, doesn't that seem a little bit strange to go ahead and, and indicate that you would like to set down in writing your findings and and then uh, have the individual that you suggested to uh, turn you down I didn't think it I didn't think the decision was a wise one on his part and in retrospect I think he would agree uh, with me on that well never mind what he thinks I'm talking about what you think you obviously thought the situation serious enough so that you wanted to put everything down in written form, is that correct? I thought that a memorandum should be prepared for his signature for the files to explain uh, the situation as it then existed. Now, as I recall, you also talked to Mr. McGregor at the Miami Convention, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you indicated to Mr. McGregor that matters of a serious nature had come to your attention and you felt he ought to hear about them. It came uh, in the context, Senator, of his having made a series of statements regarding the lack of involvement of any member presently employed, as I recall, by the committee to reelect. 
I suggested to him that there were some serious, there was a serious exposure uh, with respect to certain employees of the committee. He should be made aware of it uh, and uh, hopefully uh, to prevent him from making further statements that might put him in a bad light subsequently. And he turned you down? He told me, as I best recall, he, he was in a hurry. He wanted to leave before I got in the room that uh, he had been assured before he took the job that no one employed in the committee at that time had been involved. He accepted that, and he didn't want to hear any more about it or words to that effect. And yet at that particular moment in time, you were indicating to him that such assurances that had been given to him just weren't fact. I think the fair import of what I told him should have indicated that to him, yes, sir. At any subsequent time, did you again try to make contact with Mr. McGregor, or did you, was that it? Sir, I had tried uh, on numerous occasions prior to that time, and uh, I think that was the last attempt. That was the last attempt you made to communicate with him your misgivings. By that time, I was pretty much out of Watergate as such. This was uh, around August the uh, 20, 20th, 21st, whenever it was, the first opportunity I could see him down there. Well, Mr. Margin, there are three areas that I'd like to handle, and I'll, I'll try to restrict my questioning on the first go-around, but specifically they do relate to the commonly call the Pentagon Papers and to the Kissinger Taps and to your handling of the Internal Security Division, these three areas. Now, I'd like to cover some of the same ground that uh, Senator Talmadge covered to try to get a, a more complete story on your flight to San Clemente and your um, receipt um, of what I refer to, uh, what has been referred to as the uh, Kissinger Taps. As I understand it, in late September of 1971, you were contacted by Mr. William Sullivan, is that correct, on, on, the, on the matter that he had these tapes and you wanted to hand them over? To late, late September? Of 71. I think it was far earlier than that. It must have been June. June of 1971? I, that's my best recollection. Was it June or July? Was it was it due to the fact that that he felt he was on his way out and he had these tapes and he wanted to uh, 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 transmit them to some responsible individual? I, I tried to relate as best I can what he told me that they were not in the ordinary channels of the bureau; they were in his office safe. That uh, he. His opinion was that he was going to be terminated pretty soon. Uh, he was concerned about what would happen to them if they fell into the possession of his successor. Now, at that time, did he also indicate to you that uh, what was he referring to? Was he referring to the logs? He was referring to logs of national security uh, surveillances. That were in his possession? Yes, sir. Did he at that time indicate also uh, to you as to who possessed the summaries of the logs? I don't recall the specific conversation, uh, Senator. Uh, I, uh, because of the number of them, I wasn't sure it one time, whether he delivered me the summaries or the logs, and as it now develops, uh, talking to Mr. Sullivan, they were logs and summaries and correspondence. In order to, uh, to all right. Upon his initial communication with you, did you then go to the Attorney General? Yes. To ask for his recommendation on this matter? I didn't ask for recommendation, I don't think. I merely relayed uh, to the Attorney General what Mr. Sullivan had told me. And did the Attorney General give you a response as to how to handle Mr. Sullivan's offer? No, sir.
Why do you think Mr. Sullivan came to you with this offer? Mr. Sullivan was a friend of mine, and I think he probably had, I'm sure he had quicker access to me than anyone else uh, in the department. And do you feel it's because of his dislike of the director that he didn't turn to his immediate superior, the director of the FBI? Based upon what he told me, he was concerned about the motives of the director. And again, what were those motives as he described them to you? My best recollection is that he thought that the director might use, uh, as I've said, uh, these logs um, to maintain his position uh, as director. I don't know what Mr. Sullivan's recollection of it is, but uh, that's my recollection. didn't indicate to you as to why he felt that the director could use these logs to maintain his position? I've given it to you the best I can, Senator. I, I All right, let's uh, proceed. Let's proceed then with uh, uh, the subsequent events. You did not then go back to Mr. Sullivan prior to flying out to California to meet with the President to get any portion of the materials that he held? No, sir. In your, in your meeting at San Clemente, you met with the President on this matter specifically? Yes, sir. And what did you describe to the President as the situation? I believe I simply told him uh, in response to his question what Mr. Sullivan told me. And did you tell the President that You'd received no instructions from the Attorney General, or was that discussed in any way? No, sir. First, I told the Attorney General, and the next thing I didn't hear from the Attorney General on it, uh, the next thing I knew, and it was some time later, the Attorney General at that time, as I recall, was at the American Bar Association Convention in, in England, in London. And what did the President order done? He instructed me to obtain the materials from Mr. Sullivan and deliver them to Mr. Ehrlichman. Did you know at that time, at the time of those instructions, that the material to be handed over to you by Mr. Sullivan included more than just material held by Mr. Sullivan? I don't Quite Let me be very specific. Let me be, uh, I think both you and I know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, uh, you have the advantage, because I don't. <laughs> Were the materials to be collected by Mr. Sullivan, or some of the materials to be collected, in the hands of Mr. Haldeman? No, sir. In the hands of Mr. Ehrlichman? No, sir. Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, for example, had none of the summaries and none of the correspondence based on these taps? The, we're getting into areas of procedure at the Department of Justice, but no, I presume not, I can... Let, uh, let me be very specific, Mr. Martin. Was not the object of turning this task over to Mr. Sullivan to assure that all materials connected with these taps were collected by one man, Mr. Sullivan, to be turned over to you, to be turned over to Mr. Ehrlichman? No, sir. Uh, I was given the uh, I was given the uh, obligation of checking with Dr. Kissinger and with Mr. Haldeman to ensure that they had copies of their summaries, but they were never collected or delivered to me. Were they collected by Mr. Sullivan? No, sir. So the only thing. The only task that was assigned to Mr. Sullivan was to hand over to you what he personally had, that, nothing else. That's right. You indicated there was correspondence based on these lies. Was Mr. Sullivan right himself? No, I, uh, I, don't, re I, didn't, I don't recall any correspondence, and uh, I didn't know there was correspondence in these two parcels. 
Mr. Martian, I think if we go over the testimony that you've given to me here this morning, you indicated there were logs, there were summaries, and possibly correspondence based on those logs. Mr. Sullivan told me that there were logs, summaries, and correspondence. In his, in his files? In his possession, yes. And that nothing turned over to you came from any other source except from his own personal files? The bureau files. Bureau files. Is that correct? Yes, if you uh, tell me what you're driving at, Senator, maybe I could help you. I wish I had Mr. Sullivan here, and I'm sure the committee will have Mr. Sullivan here. <coughs> so that he could, uh, in a first-hand way, and I think we'll leave it in that fashion, describe as to what his orders were. Let's move on to the... Uh, is there anything further? I don't want to leave this. I don't, I, I, I don't want you to speculate. I don't want hearsay information. I only want your first-hand testimony. If you are telling this committee, you returned to Mr. Sullivan and ordered him to turn over those materials in his possession relative to the Kissinger taps. I didn't order him. I told him what my instructions were, and he... Uh, On the authority of the president, is that correct? Uh, I believe I told him that's where my instructions came from. I may not have. I don't know. I may have said the Attorney General. I, I'm not sure. Uh, and so my, recol my recollection is that I told him that I talked to the President and that those were my instructions. And so that at that particular moment in time, he had nothing further to do but empty out his drawers and give you the materials therein. Is that right? You received that. You received those materials right then. No, sir. You did not? No, when, sir. Well, when did you receive them? I don't recall. It was some time later. Well, why the delay, Mr. Morgan? Well, uh, he didn't have them with him. Uh, my conversation with him took place in my office. Well, by some time later, in other words, you're only indicating a matter of hours, or you're indicating a matter of days or weeks? It may have been a day. It may have been two days. I don't know. Uh, it may have been a week. I'm not, uh... Well, obviously, this was a matter of some urgency. If, in fact, you were put aboard a courier plane to fly out to California and given orders personally by the President, this isn't something that's uh, just left hanging. It's obviously a matter of considerable urgency to the President, isn't it? The urgency, I believe, was, uh, if, if there was any, was that the President wanted to talk to me. And if he was in San Clemente and I was in Washington and a plane was uh, leaving, uh, I don't think uh, he would have thought anything of having me uh, get on the plane and go out there. So there wasn't anything particularly urgent about uh, picking up these materials from uh, Mr. Sullivan? I, I, I did not obtain any expressions of urgency. Uh, the only urgency uh, was on the part of Mr. Sullivan. Did you think uh, it rather strange that these should go the route of you to Mr. Ehrlichman rather than to have these materials handed over to the director of the FBI? purpose was uh, to take them out of the custody of his office because of uh, the concern he expressed with respect to the director of the FBI. All right, then, Mr. Marty. And the concern, then, wasn't just Mr. Sullivan's concern. It was also the concern of yourself and the concern of the president. Is that correct? I can't say that I was concerned. I, uh, I didn't know. I, I didn't want to assess uh, the dispute between Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Hoover. But the dispute was assessed by the President when, in fact, the order was to turn the tapes over to you and then to give them to Mr. Ehrlichman. I believe, I believe Mr. Sullivan made an assessment, and I would say the President made a judgment. Made a judgment based on Mr. Sullivan's assessment? Yes, sir. Can you try and recollect again as to the period of time that elapsed between your request of Mr. Sullivan and when you received the materials from him as ordered by the President? I can't, uh, Senator. Now, you made some reference to the fact that you contacted certain individuals to try to get materials relative to the same set of tapes. I, or am I unclear on that? 
there was an index of summaries. In other words, a list of all of the summaries that had been sent to Dr. Kissinger and the President. They're the only ones that received summaries? I'm not sure. When I was questioned about this, I think the Attorney General received some of them, but not all of them. Right. The President wanted to make sure that each of these people had in their possession the summaries that had been sent to them by the FBI. Did you have any – do you have any recollection of Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman receiving summaries? Not Mr. Ehrlichman. Mr. Haldeman held them for the President. And I requested – I gave Mr. – I believe I gave Mr. Haldeman a list of the documents which he was supposed to have received for him to check against what he had in his possession. I believe I went to see Dr. – I know I went to see Dr. Kissinger, and General Haig was present, and they checked their files at that time. So this was not really a minor matter. This was a roundup of trying to pull together all aspects of what we call the Kissinger tapes. Would that not be a fair – It wasn't to round up Dr. Kissinger's tapes, as I recall, but to find out if he had all of his summaries. That's all. I didn't collect anything. I simply gave Dr. Kissinger or General Haig a copy of the summaries, a list of the summaries by dates that they were to have received. And I believe General Haig, while Dr. Kissinger and I were in his office, went out and checked to see if they had intact everything they were supposed to have. And that was the end of my discussion with them. When was it, then, that the matter was closed out as between yourself and Mr. Sullivan? When he delivered them – when he delivered what he had to my office. And then you delivered that to Mr. Ehrlichman? Yes, sir. All right. Now, if we can move just for a minute over to the area of the Pentagon Papers. I wonder if you might not consider very carefully the statement you made earlier relative to your contacts with Mr. Liddy. Now, I'm talking not about your contacts with Mr. Liddy at the Committee to Re-elect the President, but your contacts with Mr. Liddy in your capacity as the Assistant Attorney General, head of the Internal Security Division. You cited one instance where on some – was it treaty or agreement or negotiation you had contact with Mr. Liddy? Yes, sir. Would you please try and recollect as to whether or not you had any meetings with Mr. Liddy relative to the Pentagon Papers investigation? I believe Mr. Liddy came to my office with Mr. Young on one occasion. There may have been more, but that's all I can recall. They were acting as liaison with the State Department, the Defense Department, the Justice Department. The White House was very concerned about the Pentagon Papers case. I am not, and I don't mean to impute in any way, knowledge by you of any illegal activities of Mr. Liddy. I'm talking about what you considered, what anybody else would consider at that moment in time, perfectly legitimate activities by Mr. Liddy. I'm not trying to bring forth knowledge now in our possession and impute that to you at that moment in time. But I want to be quite precise on the fact as to your meetings with Mr. Liddy and as to the number of those meetings and what they concerned. Now, you indicate now that there might have been one meeting. Are you sure there might not have been more than one meeting in his capacity as liaison on the Pentagon Papers case? I can't. He may have been over there more than once. But I know that he was making the rounds of state, defense, and justice. At that time, we were working 
It was uh, we were under the gun. The time was short. We were had deadlines in filing pleadings. I believe we went from the district court uh, to the circuit court to the district court to the circuit court to the Supreme Court in something less than three weeks. And in my office on it were. Uh, the heads of the National Security Agency, Admiral Geiler, uh, and I worked with uh, and, and other similar people. I was working with Bill McCumber from State, Fred Buzzhart from Defense, and we had all kinds of people going through that office. Now, if Mr. Liddy was there during that turmoil, uh, uh, the Justice Department was the headquarters for the operation. I don't mean to be unfair to you. It is my knowledge that there were many staff meetings just of the nature that you described in your office and that Mr. Liddy was present at those meetings. Well, if they, I, I'm not trying to be evasive or uh, I just don't recall. Uh, I recall him. The, uh, I don't recall him at any of those staff meetings, frankly. Uh, the occasion that uh, uh, he came uh, to my office was with Fred Young to get a report on how we were doing in the Pentagon Papers case. That's as, as I recall it. Your, I, I believe uh, your reference is to David Young, is that correct? Yes, sir. David Young. He was on Dr. Kissinger's right. staff. You say you were under the gun. Can you drop back in time and indicate as to whether or not uh, you received any instructions personally from the President on the matter of the Pentagon Papers case? I, I can't. I should recall if there was a communication between the president uh, and me, but uh, I was made aware of the extreme concern of the president. I recall the meeting in San Clemente. Uh, most of that meeting concerned uh, his expressions to me about the fact that his very ability to govern was threatened. The peace of the world was threatened. He talked about SALT. He said SALT, the Strategic Arm Limitation Treaty, was the most important thing that uh, faced this nation if we were to preserve the peace of the world, and that information from the National Security Council relating to the American position at SALT had been in the possession of the Russians before a particular meeting. And it was in, in that context he expressed a very grave concern uh, about not only SALT, but about his ability to govern if there, he could not maintain the confidentiality of the White House. Is this the same San Clemente meeting where the roundup of the Kissinger tapes is discussed? That's the only one. Now, insofar as the pursuit of the Pentagon Papers case, uh, was this something that there was continual uh, communication between the White House and your office on? No. They, we finally worked out a staff arrangement between state, defense, and justice. Uh, we were the, of course, prosecuting the case, but the our two constituent clients were the State Department and the Defense Department. Do you know whether or not memos were regularly sent over your signature on the Pentagon Papers case to both Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Krogh? I sent a daily memo to the Attorney General. Uh, it was prepared for my signature, and I signed it. And if copies went to them, uh, I would not think that unusual. But no reports, uh, either from the you or in the way of FBI memos, were sent over your signature to Mr. Crow? Not to my knowledge. I used to sign a lot of papers, but I don't recall sending FBI memos over, and if one was requested, I think I probably would have complied. Maybe not uh, 
uh, with the revelations of today, I might have sent him to the Attorney General and asked him to send him to the White House, but. Mr. Marty, and, um, or Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, I don't want to take up further time in the committee. It is my intention to uh, uh, question Mr. Marty on other matters relative to the in Internal Security Division under his uh, leadership. At this time, I'll uh, pass to other members of the committee. Well, Senator, I would suggest uh, that it be just as good at this time as any other time. Oh, we got Jim in I, I believe Senator Montoya <coughs> Prepared to question. I'm perfectly willing to wait, Mr. Chairman. Senator, well, Senator Montoya. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mardian, going back to a period right after June 17th in California. I believe you testified that you had, uh, on three occasions, talked to Mr. Magruder about Watergate and the possible involvement here in Washington with respect to the personnel of CRP. Now, one of the uh, conferences that you had with Mr. Magruder was on the way to the airport where Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Magruder, and Mr. LaRue were going to attend a conference. That is correct, isn't it? I'm awfully sorry, Senator. Uh, I didn't follow the, your prefatory statement. Uh, I was referring to the uh, briefings or conversations that you had with Mr. Magruder during your trip from one hotel to the airport hotel where Mr. Mitchell and some of you were going to attend some meetings. Yes, sir. And it was <clears throat> on that trip that Mr. Magruder started telling you about uh, the Watergate and some of the ramifications. Is that correct? No, sir. Uh, at, uh, at what meeting did Mr. Magruder first uh, broach the subject and possible involvement to you? The first information he gave me was in, as I, and I'm not sure it was a banquet room, but it was a room next to the meeting room where the political meeting was being held. I believe that uh, you stated in your interview with the committee, the secret interview, that uh, <laughs> one of these conferences took place uh, with Mr. Magruder while you were in transit to the airport hotel. Uh, the only thing, as I recall, he said to me was that he had a slight PR problem. And uh, you didn't go into it any deeper? I tried to. He, what indica he? he indicated, uh, I think by gesture, that he could not discuss the matter further uh, in the presence of the National Committeeman from California, who was in the car with us. That's what you stated yesterday? Yes. Now, then you went into the hotel? Yes, sir. And there, you indicated you had a briefing from Mr. Magruder. Yes, sir. Now, what kind of a briefing did you receive from him? I think I've related. Do uh, you want me to repeat what I said yesterday? It was quite well, a long briefing, and I'd have to look at my notes. Well, let me just ask you some questions. Yes, sir. Did he relate to you in that briefing about the budget that had been approved for Mr. Liddy? No, sir, I don't think so. Did he discuss the employment of Mr. Liddy? Uh, to the extent that... Uh, with respect to Watergate? Not with respect to Watergate. Did he uh, discuss with you the intelligence assignment of Mr. Liddy? No, he didn't describe it as an intelligence uh, assignment at that time. How did he describe it? As I recall, it was... Uh, he was in charge of dirty tricks and black advance. Uh, he either told me dirty tricks at that time and black advance later, or both of them. Now, did you, uh, as an inquiring lawyer, ask him to amplify that particular phrase or phrases? I don't know at that time. Uh, I may have. I... Well, uh, did he discuss any more details? 
Well, to the best of my recollection, he indicated that uh, he should have suspected that Mr. Liddy would do something like that. All right, then uh, you left the hotel and uh, went back to the Beverly Hills Hotel. Yes, sir. And on this trip, do I understand that you uh, were accompanied by Mr. Mitchell, Mr. LaRue? Uh, that's about all. Mr. Magruder. And Mr. Magruder. Yes, sir. And uh, did you, on your way to the Beverly Hills Hotel, discuss any phase of the break-in? As I've said, I'm not sure. I, uh, we may have. Uh, we hadn't had an opportunity, to my knowledge, to talk. I hadn't had an opportunity to talk to Mr. Mitchell since I had the briefing. Mr. Mitchell was in perpetual motion from the time we arrived there at 11 or a little before until we left, which I presume was sometime after 2 o'clock. Well, but, wasn't it the natural thing for you to do to discuss with Mr. Mitchell just exactly what you had been discussing with Mr. Magruder? Yes, I said that uh, uh, it would be very natural, except we, had, we were in a car with a strange driver. Did the car have uh, a window that could be closed uh, from the front? Not to my knowledge. All right, then you went to the Beverly Hills Hotel, and uh, I understand that immediately you did have a briefing on the whole matter. Yes, yeah, my recollection. And uh, it was there that uh, you started discussing the public relations question which Mr. Magruder had first broached to you and uh, tried to uh, bring about uh, some kind of a press statement. No, the Mr. Magruder's uh, reference to a slight PR problem was a very facetious statement. He was referring to Watergate and the break-in and the burglary and the arrest. Well, what did you discuss at the meeting at the Beverly Hills Hotel when Mr. Mitchell was present? We did discuss there a PR response to the problem, but that's not uh, uh, what Mr. Magruder was referring to. All right. In what context did you have those discussions? What specifics came out? What specifics? I can't recall the specifics of the discussion. Uh, well, you must have because you were trying, you subsequently tried to advise uh, Mr. Mitchell and the others as to the contents of the press statement. You must have had all the facts by that time. I had uh, all the facts that Mr. Liddy had given me, yes, sir. Magruder. All right. I mean, Mr. Magruder had obtained for Mr. Liddy. You mean to tell me that you did not have any facts and Still, you were trying to advise Mr. Mitchell as to the contents of a press statement? Well, I had quite a few, uh, we had quite a few facts at that time. Well, what was, uh, why do you call it a briefing then if there was no briefing? Why did you call the meeting at the Beverly Hills Hotel a briefing? if no facts came out at that meeting? I think I related all the facts that came out. Mr. Magruder briefed me on his telephone conversation with Mr. Liddy earlier that morning. And as a matter of fact, you had some telephone conversations with Mr. Liddy, did you not? Not at that time. When? Was it Sunday? No, I had one with Mr. Liddy, I believe, well, in that afternoon. But the only subject... Mr. Liddy, as I said, would not talk on the phone. The only thing he wanted uh, to convey to me was an urgent desire for me to return to Washington. Uh, then uh, you testified yesterday that you received a draft of a press statement that you did not agree with. Yes, sir. And, uh, and that you had made some changes. Yes, sir. Now, what changes did, what was the original draft and what changes did you make? I don't recall... What was the tenor? The tenor of the statement was to the effect that uh, the break-in was unauthorized, uh, that uh, Mr. Uh, McCord was the head of McCord Associates, that he had other clients, and that uh, the uh, committee did not... Uh, uh, condone that type of conduct, and it certainly had no place in American politics or words of that effect. Well, with what part of that statement did you disagree? 
I disagreed with that portion of it that indicated that McCord Associates might have been in the employ of another client. Uh, when I was aware of the fact that Mr. McCord was devoting his full time uh, to the affairs of the committee to re-elect the president, and I didn't feel that Mr. Mitchell uh, should sign his or to have that statement issued under his name uh, when we had facts to the contrary. You had facts from Mr. McCord and you had other facts uh, from uh, the conversations that you had with Mr. Liddy. Is we had no facts from Mr. McCord at that time. I mean, I mean not McCord, Magruder. I'm sorry. From Mr. Magruder. I, what Mr. Magruder told me uh, was of such a nature that I didn't feel that Mr. Mitchell should sign that press release in the form it was in. So in view of the factual situation that had been developed up to that time and what you knew Mr. Mitchell was aware of, is it your opinion that this was a dishonest uh, press statement? Or let's put it another way, do you feel that it was an accurate? It certainly was an overstatement based upon the facts that were available, I felt, to Mr. Mitchell. Now, you indicated also that you were appointed counsel on that particular day for the CRP uh, by Mr. Mitchell. I think he told me he wanted me to take the legal responsibility for the repercussions that were sure to come from Watergate, yes. Was it for the CRP or for, uh, for uh, the Watergate, for the Watergate episode? I think it was limited to the Watergate, the, on behalf of the CRP for the Watergate episode, sir. Well, you knew at that time that Mr. Liddy was the counsel, and uh, were you going to take over his job? He was not counsel at that time. Well, he was counsel and then uh, also counsel to the Finance Committee, was he not? He was counsel for the F Finance Committee, I believe, at that time, yes, sir. Now, you had been engaged in the Department of Justice in a capacity as Assistant Attorney General when the Ellsberg investigation was uh, launched. Yes, sir. Is that correct? And you knew after your conference with Mr. Liddy that uh, he was involved in the Ellsberg break-in with Mr. Hunt, so he told you. Is yes. that correct? Yes, sir. And in spite of your involvement as a responsible official in the Department of Justice, you uh, agreed to take over as counsel for Mr. Liddy in a connecting link of the dirty tricks conspiracies that he had launched. I did not undertake to represent Mr. Liddy. I told him I could not re re represent him in his personal capacity. Well, didn't you indicate that, uh, and you so argued before Judge Sirica that, Sirica, that uh, you had uh, talked to Mr. Liddy uh, in a confidential capacity as attorney and client? Yes, sir. Well, uh, doesn't that indicate that uh, you had uh, assumed employment by Mr. Liddy or a relationship which was inconsistent with your previous role at the Department of Justice with respect to the Ellsberg case? Senator, the biggest surprise I ever received in my life, as I think I told you, was the disclosure that he made to me after I told him he could talk to me in confidence. Then, uh, wasn't your uh, appointment as counsel and your acceptance of this assignment inconsistent with the disavowals that were going out that the uh, CRP nor any of its personnel had any complicity in the Watergate affair. Wasn't that inconsistent? Uh, Senator, I, don't, I doubt seriously if uh, an attorney for a client uh, can disavow what his client says uh, when he has received information and the only basis for uh, knowing that the statement is not true is information he obtained in a fiduciary capacity. Well, the point I'm trying to make, Mr. Mardian, is that you knew more about the involvement of these people than what you have told this committee, did you not? I knew more. I've, yes. I've tried to tell this committee as candidly and as frankly as I can everything I know. Well, did you know of any involvement as a result of your conferences with Mr. Liddy, 
of any involvement on the part of any personnel at the White House? No, other than what I've stated. With respect to Mr. Strawn, with respect to Mr. Ehrlichman or Mr. Haldeman? Mr. Strawn, Mr. Ehrlichman, and Mr. Haldeman were not mentioned, sir. Now, you inquired of Mr. Liddy as to the possibility that someone in the burglary group had had it in mind that they would be arrested to embarrass uh, the uh, committee to re-elect the president. You testified to that yesterday. I raised that as a possibility. Yes. Now, was this the source of some of the planted stories that were circulated in the press, not as fact but as possibilities with respect to uh, double agents? No, I, I think I learned that in the press. The press was calling it such a bungled job. Uh, uh, the descriptions of it at the time were almost comical. Now, going to uh, Ms. Dita Beard, I believe Mr. Liddy told you that he was involved in that escapade, if you can call it that. Yes, sir. And that uh, Mr. Hunt also had a prominent part there. Yes, sir. I, he said the group, and I presume that included Mr. Hunt. Well, there's been previous testimony here that uh, Mr. Hunt was uh, assigned to visit Denver and uh, talk to Mrs. Beard. Where, did Mr. Liddy tell you this? I don't recall that. Mr. LaRue recalls it. We both have... He recalls a lot of, he recalls some things I don't recall, and I recall some things I guess he doesn't recall. My recollection of what he said was, we were the ones responsible for getting Dita Beard out of town. Mm -hmm. And he also told you that he was a member of the plumbers group. The, the word plumbers never came up, and I don't... Uh... Well, in what context did he tell you that he was uh, connected with this group? He told me that their group was, had been operating for some considerable period of time, and he did not characterize the group as plumbers. Then uh, you knew about Mr. Liddy's involvement after you talked to Mr. Liddy. You knew about Mr. Hunt's involvement. You knew that Mr. Liddy had been working for the government and subsequently with the CRP. You also knew that Mr. Hunt was also working for the White House about that time. Uh, did you not? Yes, sir. And uh, you knew you were the assistant uh, attorney general and knew that the Department of Justice was investigating the ITT matter, and the White House was also interested, so the press statements indicated, in uh, trying to unravel the possible government involvement in the ITT affair. Now, did you, after you heard from Mr. Liddy, after he reported all these uh, details to you, tell anyone in authority about uh, such involvement on the part of Mr. Liddy and Mr. Hunt? In ITT? Yes. No, in the Dita Beard affair. I reported as best I could everything he told me to Mr. Mitchell. Did you report it to anyone in authority at the Department of Justice? No, sir. Don't you feel, didn't you feel that it was your duty to do so? Sir, I was not in the Department of Justice at that time. But you had been there as an official. I was no, I was a private person. I was representing the committee, and I think I explained as fully as I can uh, my relationship at the time I talked to Mr. Liddy. Now, with respect to uh, the budget discussions with Mr. Mitchell about the $250,000 budget plan, uh, you uh, indicated that uh, this discussion took place in the presence of Mr. Magruder. Were there any other discussions about this particular budget in the presence of Mr. Mitchell or uh, Mr. LaRue or Mr. Dean or others? I don't recall, sir. Could it have been possible, then, that such discussions had taken place? It's possible, yes, sir. Uh, when did you first learn of the $250,000 Liddy budget? So I believe I've testified. I'm not positive. Uh, 
to the best of my recollection, and my recollection even changes while I'm here, I think it was in the confrontation uh, that I had with Mr. Magruder in Mr. Mitchell's office. Uh, it could have been in California. It could have been uh, between that time and that meeting. But uh, as of right now, I would say my best recollection is it was immediately after we came back, and it had to do with uh, Mr. Magruder's statement to me that he had dispersed $40,000 to Mr. Liddy. And my response uh, and Mr. Mitchell's response elicited, elicited the statement, but it's only 40000 of two the, of the 250000 budget. What day was that, would you say? Could have been the 23rd. Could have, I believe it would, 23rd. Then, uh, going back to the meeting of uh, June 20th at Mr. LaRue's apartment, it was there that uh, 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 you had the debriefing of Mr. Liddy with respect to his involvement in this affair. I have stated my best recollection is that the meeting was on the 21st. It could possibly have been on the 20th, but well, my... everyone has testified that it did occur on the 20th. And uh, we're assuming that that was the date. Well, I'm assuming it was the 21st, Senator. All right. Now, assuming that it was the 20th, as three other persons have testified, did you, uh, what time did this uh, debriefing occur? I said I cannot recall. Uh, based upon my records, I, would, I, I speculated that it was in the morning. All right. Then uh, did you, on the same day, uh, Proceed to brief Mr. Mitchell. Yes. And who accompanied you on this briefing? Mr. LaRue. Who else? That's all. And uh, at what time in the afternoon did you brief Mr. Mitchell? I don't recall, sir. I think I've testified that uh, I don't recall exactly when I met with Mr. Liddy. My best recollection is that I would have told Mr. Mitchell as soon as I could have obtained access to him. <coughs> Did you know that Mr. Mitchell, shortly after this meeting, had called the President of the United States? But what? We don't know. I believe, Senator, that Mr. Mitchell's records show a meeting on the 21st of some duration in the afternoon, uh, which would have coincided with my recollection. And if he made a call to the president after that, I'm not aware of it. Now, the uh, committee counsel asked you in your appearance before the special committee what your reaction was to the stories Mr. Mitchell was telling about this time that no one in the committee was involved in this. And you stated to the committee counsel as follows or in this tenor, that your personal reaction was anguish and torment to the statements being made at that time by Mr. Mitchell. Now, what did you mean by that? I don't know that I use those adjectives. I may, it may very, it would describe my feelings, sir. Well, can you amplify? I think those adjectives describe my feelings. What statements uh, gave you the torment? What statements that Mr. Mitchell was making? Senator, lawyers are not supposed to make judgments, pass judgments. They're supposed to represent their clients and wait until a court makes that judgment. Uh, I, as most lawyers, am human. I felt uh, I knew that uh, what was going out was not as I had surmised, uh, and that was difficult for me. Well, the, <clears throat> the reason I've been asking you to amplify these statements because they might, uh, your possible answers might shed some light in trying to resolve the uh, contradictory nature of testimony that has been adduced with respect to certain substantive facts here by the same people who were at meetings with you, Mr. Mardian, 
and uh, the committee is faced with the choice of selecting your testimony as against the testimony of Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Dean, Mr. Magruder, and Mr. LaRue uh, with respect to some of these matters of substance. And uh, without amplification, we cannot reach a judgment, so we're in an Im at an impasse with respect to this testimony, unless we want to resort to uh, the weight of testimony theory. Now, I've asked you as uh, sincerely as I could uh, questions which uh, might amplify uh, your uh, conclusions with respect to some of these matters, and I'm sorry that you have not given us more detail. But I wish to thank you for your patience in listening to my questions. Thank you, Thank sir. you, Mr. Chairman. I believe that they might as well. I understand they'll have two votes in the Senate at uh, noon, and so I presume that uh, we can't finish with this witness before that time. The committee will stand in recess at 2 o'clock. Senators recess for a lunch break. We're going to pause in our videotape playback of the hearings. Public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after a break for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. Picking up the testimony again, Senator Irvin is about to question Robert Mardian. Uh, Mr. Mardian, you were asked uh, by Senator Gurney, uh, rather you testified in response to a question by Senator Gurney, that you didn't uh, believe something that uh, Liddy said in the conversation you had with him, the first conversation you had, as I understand it. And I yes, don't, sir. I, well, I was sort of uncertain on my own mind what it was you said you didn't believe, he told you. I, I believe it was with, in response to whether I believe the President of the United States had authorized him to break into the Watergate. Did uh, Liddy ever claim that to you? I believe I testified that he did not yes. use the president's name, but yes. he meant to clearly imply that to me. Well, what did he say that gave rise to that implication? As near as you can recall it. Senator, I've tried desperately as I can with committee staff uh, to recount the conversation, uh, and it was with some degree of caution that I tried to testify. I was testifying as to my recollection uh, of what impression he made on me or attempted to convey to me, and that was what he, that was the implication or the impression. But, was, but you, you do remember it was not an express, uh, express charge that uh, the President of the United States had authorized him for this. As I words, said, it I was implication rather than you, you drew from something he said rather than an express statement on his part. He may have said the president. Uh, I, I can't recall it. I, uh, that was what he clearly intended to imply to me, sir. Yes. And you didn't believe that. But you don't know what Liddy believed, do you? No, sir. Yes. The, uh, I, I understood you to testify that uh, you didn't have a chance to inform Mr. McGregor of uh, what you... Uh, knew about this, these matters uh, until uh, the Republican Convention. Yes, sir. Now, when did the Republican Convention meet? August 20th. August. Now, I, I, I'm informed, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm informed that your diary indicates that you met with Mr. McGregor on the following occasions, July the 3rd, 1972, at 1.45 p.m., 2.30 p.m., uh, political co uh, coordination with McGregor, 3rd and 4th conference room, 5 p.m., McGregor, July the 12th, 1972, 4 p.m., McGregor, 
July the 13th, 1972, tentative meeting with McGregor, whatever that could be. July the 24th, 1972, 8.45 a.m., 4 p.m., 5 p.m., McGregor in each instance. Can you explain uh, uh, this to the committee? Yes, I think uh, Mr. McGregor's records would show that nearly all of those were canceled, sir. I may have met with him uh, on July the 3rd, uh, I believe, but that wasn't... Uh, Yes, uh, that was not alone. Uh, as I recall, it was he had everybody in, uh, a lot of people in to talk to right after he came over to the committee. Uh, I think his records would be the best evidence. I tried to make appointments, made appointments, and uh, uh, more often than not, uh, they were canceled. In other words, uh, your diary records appointments which were made, but which were not necessarily kept. Is that what you yes, tell us? My occasion in uh, talking to Mr. McGregor on the occasion I did was one of insistence because of, as I recall, a press release that he had issued. You agree with me that of all uh, inhabitants of the universe, the one best qualified to testify about, uh, or rather to tell the, to te best qualified to testify in respect to whether the president did or did not uh, know anything about the Watergate affair is the president himself? I believe that's a fair statement, sir. Senator, Chairman, do you have any other questions? No oh, further questions, Mr. Chairman. Senator Wyckoff. Now, um, Mr. Marty, and I'd like to read to you, if I might, and have your comment on the opening statement of Mr. Dean, where he states, the Watergate matter was an inevitable outgrowth of a climate of excessive concern over the political impact of demonstrators, excessive concern over leaks, and insatiable appetite for political intelligence, all coupled with a do-it-yourself White House staff, regardless of the law. Would you care to comment on that in terms of your own experience, both at the Internal Security Division at the Committee to Re-elect the President? I, I can't uh, really speak for John Dean. I No, I'm just asking you to speak for yourself. Uh, do you consider that to be uh, factual, or would you phrase it another way? Would you mind reading? There were several sure. items. Sure. The, the Watergate matter was an inevitable outgrowth of a climate of excessive concern over the political impact of demonstrators, excessive concern over leaks, and insatiable appetite for political intelligence, all coupled with a do-it-yourself White House staff, regardless of the law. Pardon me, please. I would say this, that uh, there was uh, an extreme concern uh, in the government uh, with respect to leaks, certainly, out of the White House. Uh, there was a grave concern uh, over the demonstrations and apparently uh, there was a do-it-yourself program going on at the White House uh, 
as disclosed by these hearings. Well, you're right. We certainly know that uh, a political intelligence operation was going on insofar as uh, uh, the committee to re-elect the president. That's true, is it not? Apparently. Well, I mean, not apparently. I mean, you, apparently, uh, is, I'd, I'd ask you to be a little more specific than that. I mean, you investigated this political intelligence gathering operation, did you not? The political intelligence gathering as such? Well, I mean, is that, uh, would, would we place the Watergate break-in into that category? Yes, if you put it in that category, I was aware of the Watergate break-in. And that uh, certainly was a political intelligence uh, gathering operation, was it not? Uh, yes, sir. And insofar as uh, the leaks are concerned, you had personal concern or personal uh, experience uh, with the uh, matter of the uh, Pentagon Papers, did you not? Yes, sir. And the um, Kissinger tapes? Yes, sir. So that brings us uh, really down, I suppose, to the um, the area of demonstrators, and um, and this is what I'd like to uh, relate to uh, this afternoon for a few minutes. Uh, you were sent over to head up the Internal Security Division of the Justice Department. Uh, might I add who chose you? Might I ask who chose you for that position? I presume the Attorney General of the United States. And uh, in choosing you for that position, did he uh, uh, lay any emphasis on you in so far as uh, uh, putting a halt to the demonstrations and making this a prime concern of the Internal Security Division? No, sir. Uh, the problem of political demonstrations was handled uh, uh, not in my office. Uh, there was a team that had been in existence not prior to this administration that involved a group uh, of uh, people from the mayor's office, from the district police department, uh, the justice department, uh, it, uh, the U.S. attorney's representatives were there, uh, the uh, National Guard representative comprised this unit, and they had a they had a control room, one in the mayor's office. They had one in the Department of Justice. It was set up, and it was not under internal security, but it was, as I recall, uh, the control room at Justice was under the jurisdiction of the Deputy Attorney General. Uh, the one, a similar control room in the mayor's uh, uh, office was under the jurisdiction of the mayor and his people. But they had representatives from all of these agencies. But, of course, your particular division related to the United States, not just to the District of Columbia. Is that correct? Uh, my division, uh, in, in the, with reference to civil disorder, uh, was for the purpose of providing information uh, in the event uh, a demand was made as, as constitutionally provided by a governor of a state, under Article IV of the Constitution, uh, the United States government guarantees to each state a sovereign form of government and uh, guarantees uh, against uh, the overthrow of any state government by civil in insurrection. Now, I don't recall the numbers to date, but I think in the history of the United States, uh, some 18 demands for assistance have come from governors. The Attorney General of the United States has the responsibility of advising the President as to whether or not uh, the state of insurrection is such that the federal government, under its obligation under the Fourth, Amendment, for, under the fourth Article of the Constitution, uh, should respond. And that requires an independent judgment on the part of the President of the United States. And uh, uh, the President of the United States has exercised that judgment in those 18 occasions, and I think uh, in half the cases he's turned the governors down. But in order to make that judgment, the President has to have that type of information. And to that extent, as it re relates to the potential for civil disorder, the 
Internal Security Division is the repository of that information. I'm not so sure we're on the same track here, uh, Mr. Mordian. Uh, your division was just not an intelligence gathering division. Uh, it also became a, the principal litigating division of the Justice Department. I, I put it in the reverse. Principally, our job is a prosecutive function. Right. Now, why do you believe that the personnel in Division 5, you know, Division 5 of the, of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, does that ring a bell? I used to get five and six mixed up. Crimes, I think, is, is six, and five is domestic intelligence. Is that right? Yeah. The five is domestic intelligence uh, under the direction of Mr. William Sullivan. Division five under, under William Sullivan. Is that correct? Not when I was in the department. Who was the head of Division five? Uh, Charles uh, Brennan, and then later Edward Miller. Division 5, did you work with Division 5 of the FBI? I worked with uh, most all the divisions. Well, now, Division 5, or the personnel at Division 5, including Mr. Sullivan, who apparently is under the misapprehension that uh, he was the head of Division 5, and Mr. Brennan was his assistant. That was before I went to the department. Uh, indicated that they considered your arrival at the Internal Security Division to be a breath of fresh air. Uh, a breath of fresh air in that their division was almost defunct in so far as any activity was concerned prior to your arrival. Did you go ahead and develop uh, uh, a close working relationship between Division 5 and the Internal Security Division? I don't know that it was a close working relationship. I hope I had a close working relationship uh, with all of the divisions of the Bureau. Did you and Mr. Sullivan come, become particularly close friends? I consider Mr. Sullivan a friend of mine, yes, sir. Do you feel that, uh, did you know him prior to going over to the Internal Security Division? No, sir. Do you but feel Mr. That there Pardon me. Mr. Sullivan wasn't in Division 5 when I went to the Internal Security Division. Uh, Where was Mr. Sullivan? He was then the Associate Director of the FBI. Just to get back to an earlier a question earlier this morning, uh, in what capacity was it in the capacity as Associate Director of the FBI that he was given the job of uh, the Kissinger tapes? I don't know. I didn't know about those tapes until uh, uh, he came to see me. All right, let's get back to the relationship between the Internal Security Division and Division 5. Were they both housed in the same building? Yes, sir. Did you utilize the investigatory capabilities of Division 5 to a great extent while you headed up the Internal Security Division? Only with respect to uh, ongoing litigation, as I would any other division. Now, and that, pardon me, uh, I don't uh, think that any of the divisions of the Bureau would appreciate saying they were used uh, in, the in the prosecutorial function. Uh, they send you investigative information. The attorney who is, has the responsibility for that particular case uh, communicates with the division uh, that is handling the investigation, and if the prosecutor feels they are not developing evidence sufficient to, uh, sufficient to make a case, he would then uh, write a memo indicating that they have no evidence to establish one of the elements of the crime, and if and to that extent they would have to develop further evidence if it was available. Were you aware when you arrived at the Internal Security Division that Division 5's activities had dwindled down to, uh, 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 I would say, insignificance? In other words, that they had little to do? Uh, I, I didn't know that, but my arrival at the Internal Security Division coincided with the enactment in 1970 
of the uh, bombing statute, which was in the uh, organized crime bill, as I recall it, and uh, that reposed greater additional responsibilities uh, in two divisions, divisions five and six, uh, with respect to giving the federal government jurisdiction in bombing cases. And uh, I would say that the escalation of bombings that occurred uh, from, say, 69 to 71, uh, and I don't want to exaggerate, I think they went from some I think they were increased by 500 percent, uh, and I think that's a minimal figure of cases that uh, were within the jurisdiction of those two divisions. Do you have any knowledge that relates to Division 5 and specifically the reason why they had dwindled down to nothingness was because personnel over previous administrations had been principally assigned to either civil rights cases or to organized crime cases. I doubt that Division 5 went into organized crime. They have a, they have a jurisdictional problem in the Bureau like they do in other areas No, but what I mean to say is that personnel were drained from Division 5 to go into the areas of organized crime and, and civil rights. I was unaware of that, Senator. Mr. Morgan, do you uh, does the following does the following motto mean anything to you? It's been reported to me by persons that were familiar with the Internal Security Division uh, that uh, there was a saying prevalent in the Internal Security Division that the Constitution was not meant to be a suicide pact. Have you ever heard that? That is. Uh decision by the United States Supreme Court in U.S. versus Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And is this what guided, in other words, is this what guided your um, stewardship of the Internal Security Division? Certainly not. Why do you say certainly not? What is your, what is your definition, if you will, of, of that phrase? I never heard the phrase used as a motto all the time I was in the Internal Security Division. It was in a brief we filed, uh, as I recall, and I only recall it because it's cited in the Kennedy case, which is a U.S. Supreme Court decision. Did you feel or the, did the administration feel that crimes committed in the cause of political dissent were prosecuted less vigorously than, than normal, than crimes committed for money or for some other gain? Did I feel that way? Yes. I don't think I felt that way, and I don't think I so expressed myself. I think those crimes are more difficult to prosecute, more difficult to get convictions on, but I don't think I ever made uh, such an expression. Do you have any idea of how many people were at the Internal Security Division when you were sent over there? I would have to guess. You mean in terms of lawyers or? In terms of lawyers. Professional personnel. I would guess uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50. Do you have any idea how many were there when you left? I guess again, 80. Well, the figures that I have, and of course these are subject to confirmation, is that uh, there are somewhere around 90 when you arrive and. Roughly 190 lawyers. No, I'm talking about professional personnel. I think that included uh, all the personnel. And 158, 158 when you left. That's. Uh, I wouldn't disagree if those are the figures you got from the division. Can you? We give also. Me a, we can also. You give me a reason. Can you give me a reason for this additional personnel? Yes, we had transferred to us over 6,000 selective service cases. That's one of the big reasons. We were also given uh, the responsibility. Uh, we had a floating, we had a floating uh, unit in the Department of Justice composed of lawyers uh, from the criminal division, from
from the Civil Rights Division and from the Internal Security Division uh, dealing with radical activities. If it involved a, for instance, a Ku Klux Klan problem, then they had an expert from the Civil Rights Division. If they had a, uh, just a general criminal bombing, they had somebody from the criminal division. And if they had a radical terrorist bombing, they had somebody from the Internal Security Division. Uh, when I went to justice, there, they seemed to have no head, and it, that unit seemed to float around. And uh, uh, they put it in my division uh, under my responsibility. It would be fair to say, though, that your division acquired a beefed-up litigating capability, wouldn't it? Yes, I, uh, I would say that. Uh, and I think that the statistics on bombing and terrorist activities in the United States uh, in numbers would uh, indicate that uh, the number of lawyers did not rise as fast as the number of uh, activities that needed prosecution rose. How many bombers and terrorists did you convict? I don't have the statistics. Must have some idea. Apparently, this this. Uh problem of major proportions, uh, you as the head of the division must take some pride in, uh, in your work. Could you indicate to me exactly uh, how many were uh, convicted? I didn't, keep, uh, I didn't keep those statistics myself. I'm sure that the department's statistics are available. Uh, the conviction rate on bombings uh, did increase uh, very substantially. What do you, and also in the area of terrorism? Well, I put those types of bombings. Those are the only ones we had jurisdiction over. Terrorist bombings. If you had to, uh, you had to set a list of priorities as uh, between um, uh, organized crime, civil rights, political dissent. Where would you place these? Uh, in so far as the division, when you were its head. Was you, were you very active in the area of organized crime? Was not within my jurisdiction. Uh, civil rights? Was not within my jurisdiction. Well, what was within your jurisdiction? The statutes uh, that were allotted to the Internal Security Division. And can you, can you define that in layman's language as to what that included? Well, it... One of the functions, for instance, of the Internal Security Division, uh, which is little known, is the uh, Registration Act, Foreign Agents Registration Act. Foreign Agents Registration Act has nothing to do with foreign agents of the type you think of. That means anybody that is a representative of a foreign power that is working in this country seeking to influence legislation. Uh, it's uh, more of a lobbying statute, and they have to register with us and file reports with us every six months, and uh, that is a rather uh, time-consuming job, and it takes people to do it. Uh, espionage, sabotage, sedition, those statutes, selective service, uh, the bombing statute, uh, those types of, those statutes that relate to internal security, uh, uh, the Subversive Activities Control Board uh, came within my purview, but I don't think I filed any cases while I was Assistant Attorney General, and I could be mistaken on that. Pentagon Papers case, that came within the purview of the Internal Security Division? Espionage. That came under 793. And the May Day demonstrations? May Day demonstrations did not come within my purview. That Mr. Was Chairman, Senator Weicker. Uh, I'd like to uh, raise this question for a ruling by the chair. I did not, I did, Mr. Chairman, I'm making a point um, in connection with the, this line of examination. I didn't raise the point earlier because I thought that there might be some peripheral relationship between this line of inquiry and something that might follow. But if I understand uh, it correctly, any question is proper to be propounded by uh, the senators, which is within the Resolution 60 adopted by the United States Senate. 
and to engage into an inquiry about the procedures of certain divisions of the Department of Justice and the kind of knowledge acquired by a former Assistant Attorney General in connection with the activities of the Department that has no remote relationship to any issue involved in Resolution 60 seems to me to be on the scope of the inquiry as I read Resolution 60. Well, uh, uh, while the Chair hates to uh, uh, make a ruling which might be disapproved of any member of the Committee, the Chair is bound to confess that it agrees with your interpretation of the circumstances. I would only say, Mr. Chairman, that uh, clearly it's been established that Mr. Mardian did not hesitate to go ahead and um, uh, issue orders uh, to uh, former associates over at the Internal Security Division to deliver materials to the Committee to re-elect the President. That's already been established by Mr. McCord's testimony. Yes, but that's not the questions you're asking him. And I would also... You're asking would... about uh, the organization or reorganization of uh, several divisions of the Department of Justice while he was uh, a, uh, Assistant Attorney General in charge of internal security. And uh, it's been held by the Supreme Court on a number of occasions that a Congressional Committee has no authority to make any inquiry except inquiries which are within the scope of what of the matters it's authorized to investigate. Now, it would be, it would be germane to the testimony to show that uh, uh, the Department of Justice was given uh, cooperating uh, with uh, one of the persons involved in some of the activities in the, the uh, committee is authorized to investigate, but uh, I, I, I'm compelled to agree with the counsel that uh, this has gone outside of the scope of that. Although, although, Mr. Chairman, uh, his division was responsible for the prosecution of the uh, Ellsberg matter, and Mr. Martin himself was uh, involved in the handing over of the Kissinger tapes, what I mean to say is that I think the political activity of this uh, division uh, was quite extensive, both under his leadership and when he departed to uh, join the committee to reelect the president. Well, I think that the t a testimony about the Burgers Ellsberg matter is only admissible under to show a plan, to show the plan harmonizing with the break-in of the Watergate, that is, and to raise an inference that the same people, that the identity of the parties that were responsible. And I think it's complicated if you want to ask him about, the, about uh, what anything he knows about the Ellsberg thing, but this other is going uh, rather uh, far outside the scope of uh, our authority, I think. I return again. I return again to the statement that has been made and is a matter of evidence before this committee that the Watergate matter was an inevitable outgrowth of a climate of excessive concern over the political impact of demonstrators, excessive concern over leaks, and insatiable appetite for political intelligence, all coupled with a do-it-yourself White House staff regardless of the law. And I think, Mr. Chairman, that it's been made out or pointed out very clearly that uh, by this witness and by others, uh, as to the insatiable appetite for political intelligence, it's been pointed out very clearly as to the excessive concern over leaks. It's now my intention to go ahead and uh, in this line of questioning, and I will certainly uh, be subject to uh, the chairman's ruling, uh, to fill in the third piece of the puzzle, uh, specifically uh, the excessive concern of the political impact of demonstrators and that this was one of the reasons why we ended up in the matter of Watergate. If I could be heard just for a moment, I, I think that I have a fair understanding of the point of view expressed by Senator Weicker and with the chairman as well and counsel for the witness. I know that the role of a peacemaker is traditionally to get zapped, so I am reluctant to intervene in this respect, but I wonder if we can't accommodate the purposes that Senator Weicker wishes and still stay within the purview of the inquiry of this committee. Uh, I confess I did not hear the original question put to the witness. I was speaking to minority counsel at the time, but I understand the burden of Senator Weicker's concern. I wonder if we could start over and see if we can't reach, uh, reach a middle ground on the situation. Well, I, I certainly shall sympathize uh, with the position at, uh, stated by Senator Weicker. 
One of the things that's puzzled me is why some people in the White House didn't trust the Department of Justice to prosecute and uh, the FBI to investigate the Ellsberg affair. Uh, I'm puzzled by that, and I think that's germane to uh, our investigation because it's right along with what uh, very, very closely related to, to matters that we certainly have expressed authority to investigate. I cannot understand that. Uh, I recognize it's the duty of the president to the Constitution says he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed, but uh, I don't think that it uh, justifies, for example, taking over trying to get uh, records of uh, the, a psychiatrist's opinion of uh, the mental or emotional state of uh, Ellsberg. As a matter of fact, I don't know who commissioned that uh, activity. The evidence has doesn't quite show it, but whoever did it, if he was a lawyer, he ought to surrender his law license if he didn't know that there was no legitimate way that he could get that uh, or the record of the psychiatrist without either bribing the psychiatrist to violate the Hippocratic Oath or by theft of some species. And uh, I have a very good sympathy with the, Mr. With the Chairman, fact. Mr. Chairman, my objection in no yeah. way relates to any questions yes. looking into oh. the burglary of the Ellsberg psychiatrist, oh. but the Pentagon Papers, he, the questions might as well deal with Mr. Mardian's duties as General Counsel of Health, Education, and Welfare. Now, yes, may, I, may, I, may I point out to Counsel oh. that upon questioning of Mr. Mardian this morning, when he first denied Mr. Liddy's presence in the Internal Security Division, upon questioning it was established that Mr. Liddy indeed had been there on more than just the matter he testified to in response to an earlier question. I think this very much goes to Mr. Mardian's knowledge of Mr. Liddy and the fact that the two had worked together on other matters, specifically the Pentagon Papers case. No, no objection to that kind of inquiry. Well, since I suppose you proceed and see if, uh, if the questions, if it can be brought within uh, the orbit of the S-60. S-60 is rather broad. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, <laughs> Mr. Chairman I, uh, I, I will conclude. I'm going to conclude my questioning in a few minutes anyway. But I would just say that the, 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 the thrust of this line of questioning is very directly related to the, uh, the, the mandate of our committee, which is the utilization of the Internal Security Division to stifle political dissent in this country. And it, it is, these questions are asked uh, in that context. May that I is comment on that, please, Senator? And that is the mandate of this committee. May I comment, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please do, Mr. Warren. I think that uh, your statement that the Internal Security Division of the Department of Justice uh, is for the purpose of stifling dissent in this country does an injustice to the Department of Justice and to a lot of fine people who work there. And I feel it incumbent upon me as a former assistant attorney general of that department to say that. And I, I do not mean that in a contumacious way. I feel it my obligation to say so. Uh, the people in that department that I know uh, are some of the finest people I know. And I think that to suggest that they were involved in that type of activity is not fair to them. My comments are made to your leadership of that department, Mr. Martin, and solely to that. Could you indicate to this committee exactly what role you played in relationship with Mr. Liddy, Mr. Young, and Mr. Crow on the matter of the Pentagon Papers while you were the head of the Internal Security Division of the Justice Department. 
The only relationship that I recall with any of the gentlemen you mentioned, uh, I re recall none with Mr. Krogh, uh, specifically. Mr. Young, I understood, was the representative from the National Security Council. Mr. Liddy was representative from the White House. I understood that they were compiling information for the benefit of the President of the United States and for the Director of the National Security Council as to the progress of the investigation into the leak of the Pentagon Papers. And uh, I don't recall m meeting with Mr. Liddy on that subject or Mr. Young on more than one occasion. There certainly wasn't any political purpose involved in any such relationship. Who did you communicate with in the Internal Security Division? Relative to the handing over of information to James McCord. I'd like to straighten uh, some of the testimony out in that regard. My recollection is, and I could be wrong because I don't think it's significant, that I had no face-to-face -face conversation that I can recall with Mr. McCord. I believe it was in the latter part of May, as Mr. McCord has suggested, that I re received a memo, a hand-delivered memorandum, from Mr. Robert Odell. It was a memorandum from Mr. McCord to Mr. Mitchell. And I don't recall what it said. The purport was whether or not information relating to the potential for civil disorder at the Republican National Convention would be available to the committee to avoid another Chicago. Mr. Odell brought that memorandum to me, as I recall, and it was okay. It had an okay by Mr. Mitchell on it. Mr. Odell asked me if I could call the Justice Department and make available to the security officer for the committee civil disorder information as it related to the Republican National Convention. I personally called the Justice Department. I called Mr. John Martin, I believe. And I told him he would be hearing from Mr. McCord. I identified who Mr. McCord was. And I requested of him that he make available to Mr. McCord any information relating to the potential for civil disorder that the department could furnish him under department guidelines. That is the sum and extent of the situation as I recall it. And knowing Mr. Martin, I doubt seriously if he would have given him any information other than that which the guidelines provided. I had one other conversation with Mr. McCord, and that related to the employment of a driver who had been promised employment at the committee. In reliance upon that promise, he quit his job when he came over to uh, be employed. They told him they didn't need him. I called Mr. McCord and I asked him if he'd promised this young man employment. And he said, yes, but sort of tentative. Uh, they didn't need him. And I said, well, it was not so tentative that he didn't quit his job. And I asked him to hire him whether they needed him or not. Leaving aside, leaving aside cases of bombing, did the Internal Security Division expend any effort on groups which we would broadly term as being peace groups, anti-war groups, etc.? As to peace groups, anti-war groups, I would say no, unless it related to a potential for civil disorder. In other words, unless they were planning a mass rally of 50,000 people in Washington, then uh, not the Internal Security Division, but the Department of Justice, I mean the FBI and other agencies uh, such as the police department would count the buses and planes coming in to try and assess how many people they were going to have to handle. 
to that extent, uh, yes, because they were not because they were anti-war people, but because because uh, they amounted to uh, masses of people that were going to have to be controlled as far as traffic and the possibility or the potential for civil disorder when you get that many people in the district. Do you know of any investigations or wiretaps as they related to either political figures or members of the press that were ordered by the Internal Security Division other than, other than the Kissinger taps? The Internal Security Division, to my knowledge, never ordered a single wiretap. All right, let me repeat the question to you. Requested a wiretap. The Internal Security Division, to my knowledge, never requested a single wiretap in my tenure. You then make it a matter of record that the division, during your tenure, never requested a wiretap of the Division 5 of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. To my knowledge, sir. All those requests had to come from persons designated by the President of the United States, and they could only be made to one person, and that's the director of the FBI. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Morty and I have just a few questions, and I would first like you to clarify an apparent conflict in the record from your testimony yesterday so the record will be straight. At page 4794, you said, Mr. Magruder said to Mr. Mitchell that he had authorized $250,000, and this seemed but a very small part of that sum. That is how the $250,000 budget came up. Let me say in reading that to you there, it's what I take it to be a, a typographical error. The first three words are, Mr. Magruder lied to Mr. Mitchell. I think that should read, Mr. Magruder said to Mr. Mitchell. Said. Said, yes. Um, <laughs> however, at page 4797, uh, this is the testimony the question was, and did you subsequently confirm that the budget that had been allocated to Mr. Liddy was actually $250,000? And your answer was this, to this day, that matter has never been confirmed to me. And it appears there is some conflict here, and I would like for you to clear that up. Read that again, please. The, the last quote, Mr. Yes. Warren. The question was, and did you subsequently confirm that the budget that had been allocated to Mr. Liddy was actually $250,000. Mr. Mordian, to this day, that matter has never been confirmed to me. I think I was referring to a question relating to 199000 and that's how I understood it. So I would, I must have misunderstood the question or they took the figure well, I, down. Well, I'll be right. happy to read the rest of the quote. I was never apprised of the fact that there had been any agreement on the amount of dis disbursement. I think Mr. Sloan's testimony was that it was $199,000. Yes, that's what I would have been referring to. So well, I, I think the question is, did you ever have confirmation from uh, either Mr. Mitchell or Mr. Magruder that the budget that had been approved for Mr. Liddy's dirty trick operations and black advance operations was $250,000. Yes, I think I testified that I, I'm not sure in what context it arose, whether it arose in California, whether it arose immediately thereafter. My best recollection was that it arose in connection with the confrontation between that I had with Mr. Magruder in Mr. Mitchell's presence uh, when I asked about, when I asked him how much money he had given Mr. Liddy, and he replied forty thousand dollars, and I said in surprise forty thousand dollars, and it was echoed by Mr. Mitchell forty thousand dollars. He then said, but it was only he said that's a small part or something of that of the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars you authorized. Mr. Mitchell's reply, as I recall, was yes, but the campaign hasn't started yet. 
So there was no denial by Mr. Mitchell in your presence that he had authorized a $250,000 budget. That's what I think I testified to. I, I, I think I testified. I don't recall Mr. Mitchell saying, yes, I approved $250,000, but simply that when that question came up, he did not deny it. Now, on page 4827, you testified that after Mr. Mitchell informed you that he could not fire Mr. Magruder and Mr. Porter, you advised him to prepare a memorandum for the file to protect himself. And you then said that he instructed you to have one prepared and that Mr. O'Brien was going to be the actual author of this memorandum. Yes, sir. Now, what facts did you intend to put in into this memorandum? To put in all the facts that Mr. Mitchell was aware of at the time uh, that the discussion took place. Could you fix that time for us? I, I'm sorry. It would have been immediately before uh, July 1st, probably. Maybe I would guess that's in the time frame. About July 1st? Yes. Okay. And you also testified, uh, Mr. Mardian, at page 4827 of the transcript that after Clark McGregor had made certain flat statements, I believe was the term you used, regarding non-involvement of campaign personnel, you complained to him that certain of his statements were untrue and unsuccessfully tr attempted to brief him about the tremendous exposure of certain people in the campaign. Now, in this briefing that you tried to give Mr. McGregor, what facts were you going to tell him? I was going to tell him of the involvement of uh, Mr. I thought he ought to know about the involvement of Mr. Uh, Magruder and Mr. Porter uh, with reference to their activities. When you say the involvement of Mr. Magruder, you mean the uh, involvement as uh, I, I, accounted to you by Mr. Liddy? No, I was not going to relate uh, what Mr. Liddy told me, but uh, I felt that any admission on the part of these men, and I felt this admission was going to come forward, uh, at least as far as dirty tricks and other unethical activities were concerned, that they had to come out, even if they didn't admit to the Watergate adventure, who were still employed, and the committee to reelect the president would reflect adversely on the president of the United States and his campaign for reelection. Well, are you are you saying you are not going to tell Mr. McGregor that? It was your feeling that Mr. Magruder had been involved in the Watergate affair? I wasn't going to accuse Mr. Magruder. I think I was going to tell him my suspicions, and I felt he ought to know those suspicions before uh, he made any further statements. Well, what suspicions? Well, it was obvious that they had been engaged in a dirty tricks and black advance operation, and my suspicion that he had uh, uh, been involved in the Watergate break-in. Well, now, Mr. Martian, would not have revealing these facts to Mr. McGregor and revealing these facts to Mr. O'Brien, who was going to write this memo for the file, and revealing these facts to whoever might read the file, had been a violation of the duty you have asserted that you had to keep inviolate the confidences that had been placed in you by Mr. Liddy? I wasn't going to violate Mr. Liddy's confidence. I felt that uh, Mr. Magruder occupied the position of Mr. Mitchell. Uh, I think he ought to know my suspicions. And I said I was not going to accuse anyone. I just thought he ought to know my suspicions. I was the uh, uh, counsel for the committee, and I think the client ought to know what the attorney thinks. And uh, I thought it would be helpful in guiding him as to the nature of statements he made in the future. Your suspicions, however, were based, were they not, on what Mr. Liddy had told you? Almost primarily. I, I can't uh, go into all of it. Uh, when the dispute arose between the 40,000 and the 199,000, if I knew nothing more than that, uh, 
uh, I would have been suspicious. I made the statement on several occasions uh, to suggest you would give Mr. Liddy $200,000 uh, and then be surprised that he used it for an illegal purpose in cash would be like suggesting that you gave a young child a loaded pistol and sent him into a crowded room and then were surprised that somebody was killed. And uh, I expressed myself uh, in that regard, and I, uh, I could have made, I would have expressed myself in that regard and did without knowledge of what Mr. Liddy had told me. Well, now, you just said, Mr. Martin, that you were going to put in this memo to the file all the facts that you knew uh, as of the 1st of July. Now, those would include, would they not, the facts that Mr. Liddy had told you? I thought Mr. Mitchell ought to put in the memorandum all of the facts that he knew at that time. In including what Mr. Liddy uh, had I, we told didn't you? Go in, we didn't go into that. I said I think he, in order to protect himself, his justification for uh, his conduct, uh, re put in memorandum form uh, what he knew. And Mr. O'Brien was going to be the author, is that correct? What's that? You said Mr. O'Brien was designated as the author. I'm going to ask Mr. O'Brien to draw it, yes. Well, if you had revealed these facts to Mr. O'Brien, would that not have been violating the confidence? I had not revealed them to Mr. O'Brien. But you were planning to do so. It was you that advised Mr. Mitchell to put uh, this what, information into memorandum. What, what Mr. Mitchell could put in the memorandum was up to Mr. Mitchell and not up to Mr. Mardian. I didn't think, I don't think Mr. Mitchell was bound. I thought you said that Mr. Mitchell instructed you to prepare this uh, memorandum and you were going to use Mr. O'Brien as the no, author. No, I think Mr. Mr. O'Brien instructed Mr. O'Brien to prepare the memorandum and I presumed that he would talk to Mr. Mitchell and prepare the memorandum. It was almost immediately thereafter Mr. Mitchell told me that the memorandum wasn't to be prepared. Mr. Martin, did you confront Mr. Magruder with Mr. Liddy's assertion that he, Mr. Magruder, had ordered the break-in? I don't think I... I doubt if I said Mr. Liddy told me uh, that uh, you ordered the break-in. I may have said it. I doubt it. Well, you testified at page 4794 that uh, one or two days after your conversation with Mr. Liddy, uh, you asked Mr. Magruder whether he directed Mr. Liddy to go in there, and he denied it. Now, at that time, you did not say to Mr. Magruder that Mr. Liddy has told me? No, sir, I don't think so. I'm sure I didn't. You did not say that. Mr. Magruder didn't say to you, well, Mr. Martin, where did you get that information or what makes you ask that question? I think it would have been a very logical question for me to ask him if he had anything to do with it. Why? Why would it have been logical? He hired him. He paid him. He was the source of Mr. Liddy's money. But he had been on the outs with Mr. Liddy. Wasn't that a known fact around the committee? That's right. Why would it have been any more logical for Mr. Magruder to be asked that question than Mr. Mitchell or Mr. LaRue or someone else? It was rather in Congress that the two of them were still working together. Okay. Mr. Morgan, if I might, I'd like to read you just a few lines that you testified to yesterday regarding uh, Mr. Magruder's uh, perjury. You said, I think he, that is Magruder, probably was aware of the fact that I, after talking to Mr. Liddy, knew of his involvement, and I would be less than honest if I did not say that if Mr. Magruder went up there, that is to the grand jury, went up there and testified that he was not involved, he would be perjuring himself. If you want my personal opinion, I thought he was going to go up there and take the Fifth Amendment. Uh, question. Well, did you know after he testified what he testified to? Uh, Mr. Mardian, no, I did not. I knew he was not indicted, so he must not have taken the Fifth, and he must not have testified as to the truth. Question. So then you had some indication that Mr. Magruder had committed perjury. Uh, Mr. Martian, are you talking about the grand jury? Uh, question, yes. Mr. Martian, 
Yes, I think I knew an awful lot, and I suspected an awful lot. Now, Mr. Morney, and I'd like to ask you if you are familiar with the ABA Code of Professional Responsibility. I hope my question didn't produce that effect. <laughs> Are you familiar with the ABA Code of Professional Responsibility? Yes, sir. Well, I, when I say yes, sir, I'm aware of the code. I'm not aware of all of its provisions any more than any other lawyer, I don't think. I'd like to read to you, please, um, Rule DR7-101, paren B, paren. A lawyer who receives information clearly establish, establishing that, one, his client has, in the course of the representation, perpetrated a fraud upon a person or tribunal, shall promptly call upon his client to rectify the same, and if his client refuses or is unable to do so, he shall reveal the fraud to the affected person or tribunal. Two, a person other than his client has perpetrated a fraud upon a tribunal shall promptly reveal the fraud to the tribunal. Now, I would ask you whether you believe that this rule would require you either to attempt to rectify Mr. Magruder's testimony or to report him to the court. I don't know the citation of cases. I don't by any stretch of the imagination want to limit the scope of your inquiry or of the witness's answer, and apparently the witness is willing to answer. He had begun before I interrupted, but I, I'm a little at a loss to see how the citing of a canon of ethics or other matter that would relate, if at all, to the conduct of this man in his professional capacity has something to do with the scope of this inquiry. Now, if the contrary is made to appear, I'll be glad to listen to the uh, arguments, but it seems to me that's a little far afield from the scope of this witness's information and knowledge relevant to the mandate of SRS 60. Well, I, I believe that uh, evidence, if evidence is offered by counsel for the purpose of impeaching the witness, it would be admissible for that purpose. Uh, I, I would suggest that we uh, reduce uh, the examination as much as possible because uh, 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 counsel can ask leading questions, bring out his points, I think, more quickly than uh, generally. Well, it seems to me, Mr. Chairman, to pursue it just for one moment further, that it might be appropriate to ask the witness if he thought it his duty to do so and so. But to go further and try to cite canons of ethics, or matters that might or might not be relevant to uh, charges of mis professional misconduct is uh, beyond the scope of the proper inquiry of the committee. Mr. Chairman, as Senator Baker said, to go one step further, I agree with his observation, but in view of the fact that the question relating to the canon of ethics has been asked, I would prefer that my client be given the opportunity to answer it. And, Mr. Chairman, I fully with, uh, understand and I withdraw my remarks in that connection. This is final passage and you've got the vote right now. You've got to, you've got to adjourn. I have not this researched the question or the cases cited in support of the cases, but one thing that I have been taught, uh, and uh, I could be wrong, and that is that it is not the lawyer's duty to judge. The lawyer's duty is to permit the courts to judge. Now, where I've had conflicting evidence as to what went on, I still don't know the truth. I told you what I suspected. For me to go to a tribunal and to state my subjective judgment to him, to the detriment of a person who has confided in me, I think would be highly improper.
And uh, that is my view, that was my belief, that is still my belief. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have no further questions. All right, fine. Thank you. We're going to have to recess for a vote at this point. I, I, I do want to say before I leave, however, that the remarks I made about the scope of the inquiry in no way were meant to be critical of counsel. Mr. Hamilton is an exceptional lawyer. He is an energetic uh, interrogator of witnesses, and I think that uh, the record should clearly show that it was only in an abundance of precaution that I wanted to call attention of the witness to the importance of the question being put, but it is neither a criticism of the witness nor of counsel, and the committee will stand in recess until the conclusion of this vote. With the issue of legal ethics to mull over, the senators are taking time for another floor vote. Public television's coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings will continue after this pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. As we go back to the hearing, Senator Weicker has one more round of questions for Robert Martian. And then Gordon Strawn, former aide to H.R. Haldeman, will take the witness stand. I just have just a few very brief questions in winding up this line of questioning with you, Mr. Martin. First of all, did you get along with the director of the FBI, Mr. Hoover? Did I get along with him? That's right. Was yours a good relationship? I uh, believe that uh, I only had one uh, lengthy conversation with him. All of our other uh, meetings were largely social. Did you ever say to anyone Let me, let me rephrase my question. At any time, did you use your attorneys in an investigative function? My attorneys in an investigative function? In an investigative function. On one occasion, I asked an attorney in my division to uh, inquire as to uh, a matter that was then subject of inquiry by the United States Senate. What was that? It involved a it involved a question that had come up during the Kleindienst confirmation hearings uh, when a member of the White House staff had obtained a picture that purported to identify two people together uh, the picture was to be introduced into evidence by a United States Senator. I had taken exception to the use of the photograph because I didn't feel it was relevant to the hearings. Uh, there, it had not been established that simply because the two people in the picture uh, were together that they were friends. Uh, before the United States Senator uh, introduced this picture, it was a group picture, I suggested that we take the precaution uh, of ascertaining whether they were in fact friends. And I asked an attorney in my division during the Senate hearings to go to the place where the picture was taken and to inquire of the people there openly, not covertly, whether in fact these two people were friends as uh, was going to be suggested by the introduction of the picture. I ascertained from that the interviews he made that they were not, 
and I requested the picture not be used by the United States Senator, or I was going to, and unfortunately they'd already used the picture. And this is the only time that you can recall that you used an attorney in the Internal Security Division in an investigative function. Well, I don't know that it was exactly an investigative function. Uh, this was a matter pending before the United States Senate involving the Department of Justice. And uh, I thought I'd best use an attorney. I didn't know who else to use. But this is the only incident that even would come close to that, to the fill, only to one fulfilling I, that definition. Only one I can recall, Senator. All right. Mr. Martin, can you recall saying when you first came, when you first came over to the Internal Security Division? Can you recall making the statement to a member of the Federal Bureau of Investigation that, quote, the way to solve this is to set up a list of leaders and we target them for prosecution and we go after them with blanket coverage 24 hours a day until we get them? I recall no such statement, Senator. If you could be did more you, specific, it did you in, did you make that statement, or do you recall rather making that statement to the then assistant director of the FBI in charge of Division Five, Mr. Brennan, with respect to a particular uh, investigation? With, with with respect with respect to demonstrators? No, sir. Peter, I have no further questions. Senator Noy, no questions, sir. Senator Montoya. Uh, Mr. I would, uh, yes, sir. Mr. Oh, I'd yes, just like Mr. to make one other statement here, just so that I don't leave a wrong impression as far as Mr. Marty is concerned. Uh, in my interview with um, Mr. Brennan, he also made the statement, never once did he ask me to do anything illegal or improper. I want that to be on the record, too, in so far as Mr. Marty is concerned. Thank you very much, Senator. Mr. Marty, we thank you for your testimony. It's been... Uh, in the most cooperative vein, we're grateful for it. We've already requested, and you've already assented to return if that appears necessary, and to supply certain late filed exhibits. The committee wants to express its appreciation to you for your cooperation. And I would like to express my appreciation to the committee for its uh, courtesy and its cooperation. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin. Council will call the next witness, please. Mr. Gordon Strawn, will you please come to the witness table?